and woke up early to to watch the live stream. Uh, so hearing Chris after you know th at that point it, I'd been on it for a couple of months of finally pitching it out and seeing the reactions of people freaking out and crashing the website. Morning testies. Stuff was definitely you know we're all in the, kind of the first indicator watching of, Star Citizen. What this could and be. That breakfast that jet really will get there. Into something that people really wanted to see. Uh, but for me, one of the big ones was really actually it was the the 2015 like the the PCAP shoot. Uh, just to be able to work with the, that that cast, uh, the crew was amazing. Everything mm. about it was just like this real engaging. I mean, it was a three three month shoot. Right? Yeah, I think it was three. I, I yeah, that's one that stands out for me huge as well. That was I mean really the cast really that was there and the how you dealt with them on a daily basis and the passion that they had into the script and it was it was so cool. Yeah, and the, and it was these sort of fun weird things of you know their the. Uh, there was a song that can, that came about during the production that I won't spoil anything. I don't know if it's actually been released, but uh, that became sort of the theme song of the entire shoot, which was amazing. So. Um, Zylo's, Zylo's blowing up my phone saying we need to uh, hurry it up. <laughs> so I, I don't know what that means so much, but I'm just letting you know. Uh, all right, bring it back to me. All right. So thank you so much, uh, 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 Todd and Dave. Uh, Dave. Uh, it's time to move on to our next Journey to 4.0 presentation, uh, The New Underground, where uh, we explore uh, what you think you know about underground facilities and then explode them in a whole new way. So check that out. What's up, chat? Hello, I'm Ian Leyland. I'm the art director for Star Citizen, uh, and today we're going to talk about underground facilities. Now, this was a presentation that we gave Chris internally a little while back, and what we're going to he cover looks, is yes, today's um, come. <laughs> how we're going to take one of the uh, locations up, we have in the game right now, but actually really design What's it up, uh, from the ground up to be the location architect. I don't think too much has happened wanted. yet. I don't think you missed okay, much. Okay, let's get started. Let's yeah, there's, a lot of, uh, there's going to be five hours of talking, now, but uh, let's be honest, we're just here to see the new stuff. Yeah, it's just a Cisco new presentation demo. And bunker? the time no. we have had wasn't enough to kind of take the location where we wanted it to be. Now, it kind of fits the current purpose. Sen. It's fairly small in scale. It gives a, a multi-room layout opportunity for FPS combat. But we always knew we wanted it to be able to scale you know, small, medium, large to accommodate maybe 60 minutes of gameplay uh, time per location. How you doing, Jumper? Welcome. So how do we go about designing minutes past a location minutes. Yeah, they're the not going to put up. the good stuff in right so away. So what we do is we split the right. they're gonna save, uh, into the core areas. It's going to be one or two ship teasers halfway, and I think towards the last the hour there'll be some big drop. They want to make people stick around till the end. Zone one. So this is the presence on the landscape. So what we're looking at here is a an example key art shot of what a medium-sized underground facility could look like. So dominant features that we're seeing here is a, is a, a kind of a key spire. This is instantly where your player, uh, you should be able to navigate towards. Mm. This could be like a, a corporate wing or an, exec, an executive landing pad on Welcome the top. Welcome back from vacation. And then moving down, you go? it's very important to be able to get and the landing pads or the landing hangars quite close to the facility because we wanted that experience as the player lands. They're not far off from the location. They're actually quite close and you should be able to see um, a little FPS area where the player lands. Also, what we're seeing here is some visual justification at what might actually be going on. So you're seeing, you know, um, processing now tanks and supplies actually on the landscape there. Now, what I was saying before about it being a, um, a kind of a, a much braver visual presence on a landscape. So we designed the silhouette primarily. So you'd be able to recognize these um, as a location to aim for. Also what we're seeing here is we thought it'd be cool to actually have surface entrances as well. So we're actually thinking about primary, secondary, and tertiary ways for the player to get into um, these locations depending on the mission scenario. So like I said before, you've got like executive pads at the top, you've got the main hangars in the middle and surface entrances down there below. Now moving on to the inside, so after the players landed uh, through the hangars, 
to be brought up into the main corporate reception. Now these are going to be quite interesting because we'll be able to rebrand these depending on the manufacturer or the location. That's where we'll uh, get a lot of the variety. But this is the, the corporate presence before the play will go down into the bowels of the facility. And what we're seeing here is, you know, just an example of what a bearing reception uh, could feel like. Now moving into zone two, with it being an underground facility, the physical act of going underground, that's cool, right? So we wanted zone two to be about the logistics of the play going up and down, and how we can make that cool visually, but also interesting from a player experience. So this is the, the transit, the elevator network. So we played around with a few different ideas into this. And one of the things that we thought could be quite is interesting is, what is the is elevator itself could be a mini play space. So what we're looking at here is control room idea quite early, uh, what sort of scale vehicles there could be. Now, ultimately we didn't go with this idea. It, was, um, it didn't really fit the art style that we wanted, um, but it had some pretty interesting ideas. So what we landed on here is uh, something that we felt quite comfortable with internally. Now it's worth noting, we're designing these as a, an archetype first in um, a utilitarian art style. Uh, in the future, we'll uh, expand out and do other art style variants. So what we're seeing here is the control room overlooking the main uh, warehouse floor. And then this elevator is should be big and clear enough for the player to understand like that's where logistics will go up and down. And for the elevator itself, we wanted it to be its own play space. So on the top level, that's where containers will be shipped up and down. But maybe underneath it, there could be little uh, nooks and crannies if we wanted to stealth into the location no, we'd be able to give opportunities for the player there and down you, below this is what the you listen to the see. Um, so now they're really starting to get into the bowels of, of the facility so echoing of that control room down uh, below when you're in one of these locations i mean uh, they look good they're, they really have a lot of attention to detail but when you listen to the devs actually speak about it you get to appreciate the amount of effort that they put, I wouldn't never, you walk into any level in any game, you walk past a building, you walk into a store or a shop, an interior, like you don't give it much thought, but after backing this game and listening to the devs talk for like an hour on how they decided this box should look, <laughs> it gives you some perspective to the amount of time and effort they put into it. And I do, I'm, I, I try to be more aware, like when I, I do look at games now, I pay attention to the materials, to the textures, to the shadows, to the lighting. There's a lot of small things that uh, you learn by backing this game that uh, you overlook when you play other games. And I, you, I still do it, but I mean, you look at this, and you when you visit this kind of scene in the game or within the game, the pipes, the color of the pipe, the the, the bolts holding the pipe together, all those tiny things like this guy spent a thousand hours on. Kind of personnel walkways, almost as a secondary element. So in this image, you kind of see in where you know big trucks could kind of go but we've also got like little nooks and crannies for the player to kind of explore uh, and go into now as it being a location dedicated towards the moving of uh, logistics we wanted to explore and have fun with vehicles right so here we're seeing the mule kind of coming and going on one of these walkways you know maybe there's elevators so on the right what we're seeing is an uh, so yeah, don't forget, Gene, that they've also they've uh, spent a lot of time making the software to procedure generate a lot of the stuff, the, all the interiors of the new space stations, all procedural. But at some point, they'd sit down and design those small things. So in this image, for example, I mean, the railing, the screens, uh, very possible a lot of it is procedural at this point. Uh, but what's taking a long time is the lighting, the textures. You know, the exact color of that paint, I'm sure it was about three weeks to decide on the final color they're going to use. Those kind of small things we tend to miss, but uh, so far Star Citizen visually is holding up. I mean, as time passes, games look better and better and better, but so far I, mean, the, I think the engine's holding up pretty well. I know a lot of people comparing it to Unreal, Unreal's doing spectacular, but uh, I've yet to see an engine that can operate on this scope, with this uh, scope of game. Uh, it looks good. It does look good. And they have the this, this skillful and talented artists to keep it looking good, in my opinion. Tons of opportunity for uh, not only uh, cool visuals, but also ways in which you can uh, reveal uh, extra traversal opportunities. So as that cargo deck goes down, you'd see other ways to kind of 
traverse through into the facility. Okay, so what we're looking at here is um, kind of an example corridor. Now, corridors in our game are quite uh, important to us, but they don't necessarily have to be boring. Now, what we're seeing here is an establishment of a radial motif. Now, with this being subterranean, uh, we wanted to always um, imply that there's a weight kind of pushing down. So this radial motif is the best load bearing. So uh, as a design language, instantly was feeling quite right. Learned new word. So in this traversal corridor, what we're seeing radial motif. is a few different things. Clearly, there's a clear route for logistics. That's cool. Guys. Uh, but also on top of that, you've got these side routes. What you notice, the radial motif. Go, <laughs> I'm going to use that so in a lot of sentences now. Cool for um, FPS combat, you know, for opportunities there. And then leading in, underneath, you're kind of seeing a tertiary route. Now, um, part of this could be this maybe is stealth no, Who cares about function? Is, um, Give me a radial motif. Off, so the player has to go down below. So even within something as a concept of a, a corridor, we want to design many different avenues for the player to traverse. Okay, so what we're looking at here is the underbelly of that concept we just showed. So up above, dedicated towards logistics, maybe containers going through, shipping containers going through. But underneath here, maybe this is just more towards the, the processing of it. Maybe hydraulic cylinders mm. for these elevators coming and going. Hierarchically, it's a different mood. So up above, it's cleaner, it's noisier, but down below, darker, more steamy. And again, that right, T-Love. Uh, one thing which I tell people always when... Uh, they have these events in Star Citizen is that let me take an example of a recent game I played look at uh, Cyberpunk if you had to ask me can I name anyone involved in Cyberpunk I'll say no I don't know I know the company that made it I know CD Projekt Red I couldn't tell you the names of anyone involved that makes any of the weapon design the city design the lighting artists one thing Star Citizen has done well is they've given credit and airtime to individuals like this guy right over here. And he's explaining, and you can see by his passion how he's talking about it, how much time and effort he's put into doing what he's doing. Uh, and, and so many of the concept artists and devs in other games go unrecognized. We never know them. I'll never know them. You'll never know them. But in Star Citizen, they take the time, say, this is the guy that worked on this ship. Or this is the guy that worked on making these rocks look good. And this is the guy that made rivers possible. And they give the devs the credit and also the airtime if they want it, uh, which is a unique feature, I believe. Well, is it? You know, I think some other games may do it now, but it, it does go a long way in giving credit to people who spent thousands of hours to do something. So what we're seeing here is uh, a side view to kind of explain how that process. So on the left, we've come in from the corridor. So on the top, we're seeing the primary route through and we're seeing the bottom route coming in as well. So Look, and it's not that these devs want airtime or want notoriety, but it does help them uh, in their portfolio, in future job prospects. You know, I worked in Star Citizen, and here is an hour of me talking about what I did and how I arrived at this design decision. Uh, it's great for their reputation building. Also, some of them may want the ego stroke, and they say it's great just to get out there and talk and uh, let people know that there's a person behind every single design choice made in this now, image art over here with the radial, oh, I forgot the word, what is it, radial what? <laughs> now as the players traversing through, we wanted to chat to that Right Gene, so seeing how passionate the devs are, it makes of, you appreciate. Uh, an industrial space, maybe it's processing. We didn't want to go too specific, uh, just so the, uh, in the early development process, we wanted to explore motifs that could work. So here we're seeing an example a processing room but there's a few key things that's kind of cool so right from the bottom level there's a network of levels which uh, will be dedicated towards processing you know pipes machinery all of that sort of good stuff and then as we get higher real up, motif thank you <laughs> I forgot already kind of technical uh, control wing suspended right so I mean we've never seen this room in game <laughs> but I guarantee you now when I do come across that room in the game I remember this guy and I'll go, yeah, this is what he made, and this is the design decision that we led to this, and this is why all these pipes are at the bottom, to show how busy the place is, and this is why there's a radial motif to uh, ex uh, to make you feel as if there's weight bearing down on the structure. None of that would have uh, would have been over my head if I haven't heard him say that. And it does add a lot to the game itself. It makes you appreciate every single design you see. In my opinion, most people probably don't care, but... Fun with uh, 
ways in which we could kind of create these quite interesting set pieces. So it's not all just industry uh, in the underbelly of these underground facilities. There's also going to be technical areas, uh, areas dedicated towards the uh, control of the location. Tiny so what we're seeing yeah. here is uh, maybe design, it's the, probably. the main map room. So this is where the control, the networking of everything. Uh, and also on here, you've got the overseeing executive suite. So it's not just technicians here, but also uh, executive. It's very reminiscent of like the uh, and also it's a bit scene of fun. in Avatar if with the player does get access to these executive wings, then we're seeing another type of art style in here as well. So we've seen industrial, we've seen technical. And now we'll be seeing, you know, more like the, um, the corporate uh, foyer we saw up above. So meeting rooms, office spaces, that sort of thing. And what we're seeing here is maybe there's the data processing of the location. So as a quick idea, we thought these data racks are actually submerged uh, for cooling in uh, a base of water. That's cool. We thought also it'd be cool if there's a cause and effect. So if the player solves a puzzle to go from it being below water to above water. So again, ways in which we can kind of spark ideas or conversations with design about uh, interesting opportunities. And then lastly, zone four. Now, it wouldn't be, it'd be a missed opportunity if we didn't go into some... Yeah, exactly, PPR uh, gaming. There's, uh, the I don't know if you just came in now, but just saying how usually in, you play a game, I do, I, I just blow through levels, I blow through scenes, uh, internal structures, external structures. It's nice, you look at it and you keep on walking by. How do we actually take... But Hearing them speak about it and hearing the amount of effort and thought that went into laying everything down, it does add a lot of uh, depth to everything you see. It's about how we'd see excavation equipment or, you know, with the roads kind of peter out. And as part of the roads, you know, maybe we can uh, do some pretty cool uh, layouts for the player to drive through. Something that's a, a little bit more invested than just a, a straight line. Now, as part of that transition period between heavy industrial to exposed cave, the equipment needed um, to create further... So if you're wondering how Star Citizen Citizen Con is going to be five hours long, this is it. <laughs> I mean, this guy can talk for the full five hours about uh, all the underground structures, I'm pretty sure about it. But uh, if you're just arriving now, what we're looking at for mostly is uh, Squadron 42. We want to see some footage and want to know what's happening in Squadron 42. Uh, we want to see more of Pyro. Everyone's, uh, we love our current system, but we want to expand outwards and see more of it. And uh, for me, I love the ships. I want to see new ships. I want to see uh, what I'm buying today. <laughs> and that's going to be towards the middle or the end, very likely. Like underground rivers, underground lakes. Maybe it's lava. Maybe it's acidic. And also, if we're describing uh, these locations as maybe some are more abandoned, we could start to showcase how nature slowly started to take over. This also would introduce some pretty cool opportunities. Hmm. So also another process we do during concept development is I like to start taking some of these ideas we're developing and get them in the engine as soon as possible. And what this affords us is we can sit down with Todd and we can really evaluate how well an idea is working in terms of space, size, composition, gameplay opportunities right from the early uh, visual development process. And what we're looking at here is very loose concept meshes brought into the engine, quickly lit, just for that uh, exploration process. Hmm. 40 bucks got ripped That's off. That's an overview Your $25 of what we're pushing for <laughs> for the new uh, underground facilities. I'm quite excited about it and hopefully you are soon. And we look forward to showing you more in the future. Yeah, Mike, everyone wants to see the cool new ships in Pyro. And the sandworm. Should have opened up with the sandworm.
Okay, there's a floating uh, test logo hologram. Awesome. Hmm. I do like that. I'm going to change my hat to that logo. <laughs> well, it's red though. Wrong color. I guess I haven't paid them enough money. I do like the square logo. It is cool. What do you guys say? Square logo or round logo? Yeah, PPR Gaming, uh, you should have bought uh, the uh, the Bengal NFT. <laughs> yeah, I know shit, Marcos. Uh, I was in my 30s when I started backing this game. Well into my 40s now. That was the new Underground, starring our very own Star Citizen Art Director, Mr. Ian Leland. Uh, Ian, why why are we redoing the uh, the Underground facilities? Um, well, kind of as we said in the in the segment, we always wanted it to be a much bigger, more special location in the game. So is this like uh, at a bar and he's going to pick him up? Like, hey, can I buy you a drink? You know, and want to head over to my place a bit later and discuss last ten years. What's your favorite memory? lighting concepts? Maybe Ooh, favorite memory. <laughs> um, it's kind of hard to pick one. Um, okay, but what maybe a good one to start. What they should have done here is hired. The a booth girl, or rather a bar girl, you know, wearing something sexy, sitting there, serving them drinks that, that to attract the, the male... G I, I know sexist, what, but yeah, you definitely want a better looking bartender. Sorry, Jared. I mean, Jared's good, but he's not the most attractive of bartenders, you know? <laughs> At least he shaved, <laughs> but not going to cut it. We, we kind of pushed the engine to what it could do at the time, and, you know, we are super happy with it. Yeah. So there's new underground. Hey, uh, it's yeah, not so just going to be I recognize you now. Giant, empty, awesome looking. Good to see you again. You know, playground with nothing to do. Correct. What are, what are we going to be doing in these things? I, I mean, all of our mission verbs count. Uh, it, it's basically there. Um, it's we want them to be a sandbox element. You know that that players can go and explore. But you know whether it's sabotage or infiltrate or investigate or you know. Uh, deliver boxes to like it, it, all these elements go into all the design elements uh, you know when we're thinking about this when we're <laughs> testing out rooms like all the interaction <laughs> yeah that's what's missing also it. there's no background uh, music mike barron's got it so basically when the team's doing it uh, we're building it but also the, the star wars cantina the theme the different design elements into the room at the same time and all those different theme rooms that you were talking about, you know, open up all kinds of storytelling possibilities with the different companies and the di who knows what it, misadventures. Yeah, are, I, you know, I, I, I like Beard. I mean, Bearded you know, Jared looks 20 years older, but I'm two. just used to Bearded Jared at this point. The Stanton system and yes. the Pyro system and wherever else afterwards. I'm not saying because I like. My I mean, mom. once you go full beard, it's difficult um, to drop the beard. Right, I mean, so Todd Pappy's uh, always that kind of uh, light goatee going there, so he's fine. This one, I'm this one. Nope, but I'm to go one. from like full this Santa Claus like. beard to what he's got now. Uh, going on uh, today. Uh, everybody uh, that's a member of the Star Citizen community, you've got a registered account on the website. Is getting a free digital goodies pack. It's available for all backers. It's got Francis, the the party animal plushie, which I believe is is, is a <laughs> guys. We've got a plushie. Family. In with the a game, fun hat, isn't it? <laughs> There's nobody here to answer me. Uh, a Faustin jumpsuit, the Shuban edition, uh, which is really cool. Uh, we don't have a lot of onesies in, in the clothing line, uh, clothing-wise for the precision universe. Yeah. And a grenade launcher because oh oh, well, they've got five hours to fill, so there's going to be a lot of fluff. There's going to be a lot of chatter. That's going to be fun. But look, they're also giving the devs uh, opportunity to chat, and the, the devs have been working on, uh, hard on these. Projects want to reach out to the community. They want to chat with people. They want to let people know what they've been working on. So uh, we're gonna have to wait for the good stuff. But uh, there's gonna be a lot of filler. Everything you need to know about that up on the Robert Space Industries. Right one. And yes, I saw the chat going. I did comb my hair. Master Vase remembers the old days. You know, while Brian was being messaged about one thing, I got messaged by my mom, who didn't like that I hadn't combed my hair. Hi, mom. <laughs> All right, what's next, everybody? Uh, up next is, uh, well, it's one of the segments that I'm looking forward to most. Uh, it's our sleeper segment of, 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 of the day, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, the need for multiple speeds with uh, Rich Towler and Yogi and uh, Jed and Johnny and Dave from the flight experience, flight comp. Okay, so they're going to talk about speeds. Now, this is actually a good topic because uh, a long time ago, if you guys remember, 
there was a patch where they doubled the speed on everything. You, your ship used to go 500 meters per second. They bumped it to 1,000 meters per second. And everything went from kind of, I guess it was sluggish, to jousting speeds. And personally, I feel that some things do need to be slowed down. Let's see what they say about that, Yogi Klaat. So that's what he looks like. I'm here oh. with Rich Tauler, David Colton, Jet Talbot, and Johnny Young. And today we're going to talk to you about the upcoming Yogi Clot always posts on Spectrum uh, at quad low stuff so I never knew he looks like this this is good this is why they do this kind of stuff eventually find the way to the persistent universe explain why you change the speeds now this is good to know we want to define uh, ship roles for the game because every role in itself and every ship can offer unique gameplay opportunities for individuals. There's, yeah, Night Spies, I mean, if you want to go full Newtonian, yeah, there's no limit to it, but there's got to be a limit to it because of gameplay. It's going to be fun or it's got to be accurate, one or the other. So there's got to be limits in space. Mike, you'll be spending too much money today, I guarantee it. different types of work and different types of jobs. Star Citizen is supposed to be a big, expansive game with giving the players lots of chances to have a variety of different experiences. It's not just about combat. It's not just about an economy. This guy's sweating up. He's nervous. Star Citizen scam confirmed. He's sweating. About about he's sweating. Ships that can act and function in different ways to support all of those different goals. That looks in awesome. The, the engine configuration changes on the uh, and make the gameplay for the them. Mold? We started very heavily that? leaning toward combat, mostly because Defender. combat is a mechanic that is very widely applicable throughout the game. Blade. And the principles behind it apply to various other roles in the game. We've been working um, away in the S42 branch, um, and this has really allowed us to isolate these ships. So we're kind of broken it down into archetypes, and it's really allowed us to, to, to kind of break down what these ships do. you know. And also it's to make sure that when we are defining these roles and balancing these roles, that we're putting the ships in the right place because we don't want the ships to be like, you play this ship, it means you dominate this part of the game. That there's always got to be plus and minuses so the balance is right so there's still some crossover between the ships so just picking one type of ship just isn't you know isn't just a win we have already defined several ship roles and they're usually known as light medium and heavy fighters light fighters for us are fighters which are very dominant in the area of one versus one uh, pvp combat but they come with the downside because obviously the light which means the materials chosen on the ship are probably not the strongest. So it's more about the attack. It's more about trying to position and getting there. Yes, uh, Siang Ryal. This is a, uh, no, no. <laughs> long time no see. How are you? Yeah, there's more game loops coming. Speaking of Eve, I've heard that possibly the goons might be wanting to make a comeback or some part of them will. But uh, gameplay loops are coming. Guna. A lot of the medium fighters sometimes come with a turret as well. So I think with Pyro, we'll see a couple turret, more. Which is aimed to kind of counter the lack of maneuverability that their ships have. And then additionally to that, we have racing ships, which are basically just really fast at changing the velocity uh, vectors. And um, interceptors, which we basically just want to go yeah, very fast. I think fast racing was area, too fast. You've got to slow racing down to uh, make boosting and turning more of a challenge right now everything's just uh i feel there's so much more they can do with the boosting and sliding i don't want to say go more towards elite dangerous type boosting but uh there's definitely some balancing they need there so you use them to take out bigger ships um but they're not explosions always killing small fighters and then from smaller ships coming to larger ships like yeah so if you have any questions about star citizen uh feel free to ask <laughs> hey chat in case you don't know in case you don't know so here is the uh, co-founder of uh, test over long distances but uh, real life has caught up with him in a couple of in these past couple of years and he's uh, had to do things like uh, go to school they should be used and it's really about delivering on those kind of gameplay promises that we've been talking about you know, over the past you know, kind of several years. If every ship is the same, it's not fun. But if we have dedicated ships with dedicated pros and cons, then we can create very exciting combat environments. And the biggest challenge we see in order to get that gameplay we want is the current speed that we have in combat. Okay, so this is something I have a horribly 
unpopular uh, opinion with I feel combat speeds are way too no, fast my thing is speed, when I'm in combat with another ship because this is kind of World so War 2 in space kind of I want to get up close to a ship I want to be close enough that I can see the components or the weapons on a ship right now the way we're fighting the way I fight anyway is there's a pip in the distance and then you shoot at that pip and then you hit it like you see that there's a tiny pip you hit it and <coughs> excuse me ship blows up and that's it your angular requirements if i had my way i'd like to slow things way down so you have to close in a lot more let's see what they say this is a very obvious math reason why high speed combat is kind of the opposite of what we want to achieve meaning meaningful and effective position and maneuvering thank you that's what i said to be closer and to be more turn oriented yes so rotations should matter more thank you. than just flat speed exactly Having what i said very high speeds that are pretty much the same between all ship classes negates a lot of the opportunity for smaller ships to flex different types of gameplay. Another big issue with the speeds in combat is it's very hard to keep players engaged in the combat because players can move so far so quickly in such a short space of time it's quite hard to keep a track on your opponent. So you might think oh why don't we just make the ship slower and call it a day. Yes well, why don't you? we can't do that. The main reason we can't just make everything slower is the size of the Star Citizen world. We've got huge planets where we need to go from the planet's surface up into space. We need to transverse between different True. systems. So essentially we can't have just low speeds all of the time. There's a massive universe out there to explore. There's planets to explore. And the feelings we want to capture with the speed, we still want an element of danger that you can still go too fast. Okay, so just what I was saying. I, mean, I feel things are too fast. I know this is not a popular opinion. The top combat pilots in the game are going to be crying about it if they reduce the speeds down because they're used to the way things are right now. Uh, but they can't slow things down because Star Citizen is a big place and flying from point A to point B on some planet requires speed. So let's see what the solution is. The advantages of flying fast in terms of defense is just better. So since the last year, the focus of the Eco Feature team shifted very heavily towards Squadron 42 and nailing down the flight and space combat experience for it. And I'm very proud robot to say boy spinning that we finally bucks found today. I hope it's enough robot boy. solution that we're going to show today. Master modes. Okay, this is new. So the main idea is to simply not have combat and long range travel uh, at the same time. So we're splitting these gameplay experiences. Uh -huh. This will be done by a thing which is called master modes. A master mode is a thing that is globally applied to your ship. Um, and we have two of them. We have SCM, which is now relabeled as uh, standard control mode. Oh, those are big changes. And QCM or QM for quantum mode. The oh. idea is that between these two Is this sound like a really dangerous style travel? Combat, and also get all of the maneuvering, like high speed maneuvering, and traversal mechanics that we had before, but in these distinct modes that are integrated with lore and integrated with the ship, the ship functions, such that there's costs and payoffs for, for being in each of the two modes. So let's start with standard control mode. Um, 3,000 bucks if there's a, so a carrier ship, which... this is the mode that we tend to be the functional maybe. mode of the ship, whether it's combat or mining or any of these kind of core kind of things the ship does. We want the player to do these things in this mode. Look how beautiful that what is. This does is is After it all these years the in the game, it still looks good. The ship, but it also enables the shield to be turned on. And obviously the intent behind this is this is where you do your combat. It's where the guns are on, the missiles can be armed and fired, and all the kind of operational things the ship does operates within this mode. The speeds that you can reach in SCM are somewhat limited, somewhere between two and 300 meters per second, tuning, uh, tuning pending. Um, but this is basically the hard cap, which you cannot ex not really exceed. You can slightly exceed this by using a boost, but you cannot maintain any velocity beyond that SEM limit for a longer period of time. This so is a little dangerous flight model. kind of energy management system. So you can go a little bit faster with a little bit more accelerations when you need to, but you know that you ha it is a limited resource uh, and you should use it carefully. Specifically, the boost space is interesting for, for space combat because that boost spa space is not, is not spheric as it was before. You can boost the fastest if, you, uh, if you're going forward on a straight line and you have a lot of debuffs when you're trying to boost backwards. That alone gets us a lot of interesting maneuvering space and variation in the day-to-day -day dogfight maneuvering, so to speak. Importantly, you don't have your quantum drive available in this mode. The idea is that quantum is restrained to the quantum traversal mode. The second mode is quantum control mode, or Q 
QCM or QM. This is a major change. What this mode does major. is it unlocks your maximum velocity that your ship can reach. So when you were limited before to 200 to 300 meters per second, now you can go to 1200, 1400 meters per second, whatever your ship allows you. During the development but no um, shields. of the Ember Quantum mode, we realized we needed something that was a little bit more kind of about traveling large distances, but not the distances that you need to, you know, speed up your quantum drive and travel across the universe. So we've created this feature called Quantum Boost, which is available in the Quantum Eduardo Boost. Eduardo official live is twitch.tv slash star citizen. So at any point you want to kind of so this is ma this is major. This is huge. Uh, limiting speeds. So I say 300, and you can boost about for a little bit, but then. And it's purely on a straight line. Just to give you like a. This is totally elite dangerous flight model. What's it called in elite dangerous? Where you're traveling fast, super something. To do very long range jumps between with between planets. So. Uh, quantum mode allows you to go very I can very already fast, hear the combat like pilots crying about this <laughs> really fast over a planet it also allows you to do quantum boost to quickly go between points of interest which are rather close to you and it allows you to go to travel long distances between uh, between planets and, and large scale stellar objects but it comes at a cost your capacitor systems are non-functional because they interfere with the quantum bubble that is allowing you to go fast. You won't have shields. Your shields will, will collapse right away when you, when, you, uh, when you swap into quantum mode. Your weapons will stop working because anything that's firing outwards of your ship will disintegrate the quantum bubble. Okay, so you can't run from a fight. You're in a fight right now, you can boost out, you can jump away right away, but if you try get into... Systems. Are turned off if instantly. you're in a fight and you try to escape you a fight, modes, your shield drop, your weapons drop, you're sitting duck. So they're change, forcing you to engage. So lose your and they're making it this, running away very difficult this, now. But you also won't be going fast. So there's a, I see a, a lot of combat logging coming. <laughs> when you need to switch modes. So it's going to be a very kind of conscious choice of what mode you should be in. At any particular exactly, point. Mike. So Darren, this is really dangerous. Uh, someone that's close by, you're not quite sure what their intention is. I kind of, I have to try it out, but I think I like it. I like the idea you can switch into quantum mode and escape. And this is going to kind of bring in an element of danger and an element of risk. Because Frame uh, shift drive. going Thank you, two Knight. different modes is Knight like spies. a systemic thing within the ship's items, um, we actually have the opportunity now to define ship roles that can block people from escaping, either using devices that suppress the quantum bubble or devices that can effectively interfere with your ability to transfer between the modes. For example, specific ships like interceptors can be tuned such that they have a higher standard control mode speed, so they're able to catch up with people. Or, for example, make the swap between the modes faster and more efficiently so that they could catch up with you, go into standard control mode and attack you more effectively as per the properties of their ship versus another ship which might not be as good at doing something like that. Mm. It's something that's fundamentally changed the gameplay experience for us. And yeah, so, so now, um, depending know, on the ship, jumping between day, your you know, normal, I don't know if they're going to call it uh, combat speeds to the other one, will depend on your type of ship. The, the interceptors can do it faster, the normal fighters will not. Is, it's, this definitely it's does nice change a lot of the, the uh, in combat in possibilities. Are, Suddenly, hmm. fights are a lot closer. I think I like it. I'm going to try it out, but uh, we'll see. have been retuned a little bit and their afterburner strength has been retuned a little bit to make it so that you can orbit around ships and have a lot more interesting maneuvering. Um, and because the ranges are closer, maneuvers that would be performed by your ship have a much more significant impact. That's exactly what I said before this. I said, I want to get in closer. This, this kind of distance, so similarly, okay, that's kind of like close, ships, but that's the kind of distance uh, I want to be in. I want to see the ship I'm shooting at. Offensive capabilities with this change, because suddenly you can't orbit a capital ship at high range and high speeds. Um, you have to get a lot closer, which will make the turrets much more effective at shooting you. Turrets become hammerheads are coming into fashion again. And working as a group to attack capital ships is more so, important than it has been before. Right. So, if anyone has been manning a turret and a hammerhead, really and you had like a P fifty two, or even like a Gladius come in and just zoom around, you can't hit it. It's too fast. Uh, this will make point to point travel anti fighter be ships for really. Well, a lot better now, so I think I like it. We'll see. It's changed the entire combat experience. Before, you'd find that you were fighting at a huge distance. 
now you're finding that you're in really tight, close combat with the other players. I think the biggest part of this is going to be when we have the larger ships interacting with the smaller ships. Once we can have battles with big capital ships and smaller ships, we'll have brought something to the Star Citizen world that I don't think has been has come out before, uh, and I think it'll make a massive improvement to the game. Having made these changes uh, to implement master modes and rebalancing all of the ship speeds, uh, we'll finally be able to define ship roles in the way that we've always wanted and to bring a lot more variety to the gameplay that we haven't had before. So it's been a really long journey here, obviously, because you've been- I'm liking journey, everything uh, I hear, you know, but again, many, many skeptical many until we try it. Time ...to try and really create an experience we want. But, you know, the reality is from us, it came down to, mm. you know, it always is a decision, which is creating choice for the players. It's about giving players the option and their choice. Yeah, Eduardo, sounds choices. like you won't be able to ram at uh, so a thousand meters a second anymore. The player choice in the game. So they're choosing to do combat. They're choosing to travel from A to B in quantum. They're choosing to QT boost somewhere. This Just speed, like the speed they're flying here, I mean, I don't know if this is a demo like of that really speed, but that, that feels right to me. We try many times to control that as, you know, as designers to try and get a specific experience at some point. But we always How end nice up coming back to the fact, let's just give the players the choice and let Star Citizen is always cinematic. And we'll design the After all these around. years still. We finally have it. So we're, we're now nailing down the space combat experience. <laughs> Quantum for Star Drive, Citizen, right? Specifically yeah. for Squadron 42. Do that, uh, the Star Wars move, right? Where you master mode jump to light speed works. into a fleet. We know that it works with our uh, flight retunings and it's very exciting. It will yet take a while to ship this to the PU because the amount of ships you fly in Squadron 42 is rather limited. Whereas in Star Citizen, we have about, I don't know, more than 100. So if you get jump, who can one saying, if you get jump, you try to run. You Hard will now not only lose your shields, your gun will also not be able to shoot to back. It's not going to work. Well, that's the idea, who can You're not supposed to run. If you're going to engage, you're committed. They don't want you running. But there'll still be a possibility. Uh, just because your shields drop doesn't mean you blow up immediately. If you're heavily shielded, like a larger ship, you still get away. Alcatraz saying, uh, now we nailed it down. It's always changing Alcatraz. Every time there's a new ship or a new system or a new game loop, they'll adjust, uh, which is a good thing. Because if they were just made one, if they stuck to one thing and never changed it, everyone could bitch and complain that why aren't you changing this thing? So I'm not against them changing things. At least they can try it. We'll see how this works out. I like it. I like the idea, but uh, we're going to test it out. Shout out to Orwin. It's been a long time. Hey, Orwin. <laughs> My one is, my cargo hold is always full of Chris Roberts. Really? Show the camera. There you go. <laughs> ah. Right. Uh, that's Vanduul Against Humanity, a, a okay, game they, created by one of the, our own star citizen, uh, one of the original star citizens, uh, Mr. Kenshi. If they're doing a boss uh, so scene, they the have to be drunk. The... I don't know what the time is right now in the UK, John. but uh, John? they should be wasted. It'll make the show so much better and funnier. Tell me about this segment. Especially Space Viking. Is this, is this BS or do we actually have it? Uh, I, I think we think we've got it. Um, the team's been super hard at work for quite a long period of time on this. Uh, we've gone through, I don't know how many versions of this. Uh, Eduardo, uh, I don't know what the, interesting names to call all the uh, spam bot is picking up. Maybe using too many explanations or too many um, mm, yeah, emojis. But uh, your text coming up now. We just don't like the name Eduardo, so it is. <laughs> yeah, EMP ship's a good point. Your EMP ship will now, once you tackle something, it remains tackled, it's not running away. It can't outrun you. Because if they have to drop their shields, that EMP will just take out their engines. So yeah, EMP ships are now in vogue. Good thinking. 6 p.m. in the UK, yeah, they should be drinking. start doing this for Squadron. Naturally yeah, Eduardo, we don't like emojis. Or we'll just use less. <laughs> it to all work together. Um, we only do so Spanish we names in here. Let's see. Montoya, and Squadron Eduardo. Has a smaller subset of ships than the PU has. Um, it's a lot easier to do a system like this, get the broad strokes in, and then really dial it in for six or seven ships mm. versus the hundreds in the PU. Um, so it's a, it's a scale thing that stops it going in the PU straight away. And then the other thing is, lots of it ties in together with other systems. Um, so it's not just flight mechanics, it's UI, 
HUD, radar star map, quantum uh, changes, and you have to get all of that together in one. We can't really piecemeal it. You, you just won't get a great experience. I like the pistol on the desk oh, there. It's a nice here's model. Here's another bit later. We want to drop it in one big uh, deployment. Are, are we going to drip feed ships and like this ship's done and then this ship's done, or, or do you you think more together all at once? We yeah, have what Brian said. <laughs> the whole event's five we hours, have to do Eduardo. Like a broad tuning across the board for everything. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, day one for when this goes into. I'm not EU. sure I'll do the entire five uh, hours, but then, uh, I haven't had breakfast yet. Really, where we want them. It's 9:50 a.m. my time on West Coast. Constantly change. Yeah. Uh, there will be ones that change over time. <laughs> oh, you change the camera. You There'll, there'll be ones that keep going, uh, yeah. and obviously community feedback's a, a, a great thing. Um, it's very hard to get things right out the gate. There's only so much internal testing you can do. We, we need that feedback at, at that point. And I do want to say to uh, uh, folks who are watching, wherever you're watching, uh, the six to seven ships in Squadron was not a confirmation that there are only six or seven ships in Squadron. Uh, we'll confirm that stuff much closer. Just if, if you're already halfway through your Reddit post, just Delete a couple you heard of you times. guys, there's only six or seven ships in Squadron 42. <laughs> All right, you ready to move on to the next thing? Absolutely. All right, Let's so, do it. so we've been bouncing back and forth between, you, you, know, you know, really hot visuals with the planets of Pyro. Uh, and then, Alcatraz, and then the last season con I went to was the, the really Texas one. The what was that, 2018? When was that? With the flight experience. I think it was 18. Up next is another really solid visuals uh, thing. Uh, Lorville. Lorville. Look, beat me a camera one. Yeah, Larval's been redone, Larval. apparently. Star Citizen's first landing zone. Uh, mm. We've learned a lot since it was first uh, put in. Uh, we've, got, we've, re we've built Microtech, New Babbage. We've built Orizin on Crusader. We even went back and redid uh, Area 18 on Arc Corp. But Lauraville currently stands as the oldest standing landing zone in Star Citizen. And with our new team at Turbulent and ready to kick butt and I was going to say kick names and take butt and I almost messed that up and then I messed it up trying to explain that I didn't mess it up. Uh, they're getting ready, they're already underway uh, building a brand new Lauraville Redux. So we'll send it on over to Eric Gagnon and uh, Maxime Guidon. So why is Star Citizen taking so long is the question. Well, they're about to redo the entire of Lauraville <laughs> again. Uh, and look, it's they're not wrong. It was the first landing zone, and so much has changed Ian since then. The it's Ian again. And today uh, we're going to talk about an internal initiative called Lawville 2.0. Now with Lawville and I'm not opposed to it, Lawville but Cityscape, I don't have a problem with the current the Lawville either. Landing zone we'd have ever had to do. It I mean, it looks great. I like a, this Lawville. A, a landing zone on They've already made changes to it. The player fly there with minimal restrictions, although it did have that really big uh, no-fly zone. But when we did subsequent landing zones, we built up a bit more of a knowledge base and experience base about how we can effectively introduce cityscapes. So Area 18, New Babbage, Orison, we all developed more techniques and we always wanted to go back <laughs> internally. What have we learned? Back into Lowville. To start us off, I'll throw it over to Eric, our principal concept artist. Today we learned that Star Citizen is gonna take another four years Hi, before it comes out. <laughs> Principal concept artist for Star Citizen and Turbular in Montreal, and I'm here for to talking about the Lorville 2.0. Holy, holy crap! It's Jordan Peterson. <laughs> Jordan Peterson works for Star Citizen. Incels rejoice. Let's see what he has to say. When I started to work, so guys, uh, when someone has a pronoun, I don't, I don't like the pronouns. <laughs> Sketches, <laughs> black and white sketches Why? <laughs> of a different approach of, of that city. We create a. Well, side I, I'm panel totally gonna dub over his voice. Hang on. Building. Mainly, the reason we need to uh, to work on that is for uh, <laughs> mainly a gameplay issue, because we would like to make a, a gameplay in the interior buildings, and we need to create a, a bigger city to let the player uh, have a fun experience to flying through that. Okay, they're taking yeah, the, so the Area 18 type process, model so you can fly between the buildings uh, and Laurel. It's approval. doable. I need to know very well uh, the footprint of that I, city. I take it you back. The they do need to redo it then. Yes, so I agree. We, we have nothing in that city they build uh, in a gray zone. So everything is built. Right, you can't change the reality of substantial mental capacity to understand it that transgendered people 
right. kind of a <laughs> proportion in terms of lengths and distances uh, to respect. So this is why I used a 3D uh, basis to, to, to working on that. So I need to make sure that the ratio of smoke? everything fits well. Yeah, so I take it back. Maybe it should be redone. As possible. But so how much time will it take? Goal, is not to dig right away on the details but it's to stay on the big picture and to see if the the, the skyline makes sense so this is a good challenge to play with that and i think i did a, a nice job on that because at the end what the feeling we have it's like a real city so I use well, Coruscant my, is uh, Area 18, but uh, I mean, taking what they learned from making the other uh, cityscape planet, uh, that looks, yeah, that does look way better. I mean, they simply take what they've done, like Area 18, uh, change some colors, plop it down in there, and okay, that that looks spectacular. I take it back. They they should change it. I mean, I don't think it's going to take long for them to do. I think they've already done it. This is concept, but uh, from concept to plopping into the game, they've got all the technology, they know everything what they have to do, all they're going to do is just drop in the buildings and they're good. So yeah, awesome. I mean, Lorville is where I spawn every time we do a fresh patch, is the place where I come in. Well, okay, now we are at Lorville 2.0 and we're ready to moving on on that. Thanks, Eric. There's some beautiful image there and we had a lot of fun. In Thank you, Jordan Peterson. In, uh, that cityscape. <laughs> now, we're not just in concept development. We've actually just passed our white box milestone mm. internally. So we're going to jump over to Max and he's going to show you where we're at. Bonjour. Mon nom est Maxime Guindon. Je suis chef environnement artiste sur le projet Star Citizen. Mon mandat en ce moment est Lorville 2.0. Uh, premièrement, je voudrais dire bonjour à la communauté francophone de Star Citizen, à toute la communauté en fait. Euh, ce que vous faites, ce que vous partagez, m'inspire énormément dans mon travail. Did he just diss on the English-speaking community? <laughs> time to start an engine, and uh, we, uh, we we've had to evaluate what, what was possible to do and to extend or to make it much bigger than the initial uh, Lorville mm. city up to something that matches the ambition. For instance, we are keeping uh, the L19 area, we are keeping the CBD, we, keep, we are keeping um, the spaceport and we're building upon uh, this and just extending the, the, the city. We've done several tests with the, um, the transit system, the rails, and uh, we try to extend it out a bit. We're keeping the same number of gates but we're moving, uh, moving them out. And so throughout these tests, we've built the city uh, as just placeholder, uh, white box, very primitive. Yeah, that looks nice. This, this layout, this fast iteration of the whole city um, done, and then that we could see it and get feedback on it. So it will feel more like a believable city um, we hope it to be fun to fly around and uh, like to actually uh, do some races in it. We're building uh, arches, uh, bridges and uh, like underpasses and it makes it. So they figured it's out that people like to race around, around any objects they can. So now building layers, uh, structures uh, which will allow people kind like of make their own kind of race tracks. It seems to be where they're going with it now. I, I'm not opposed to that. That's and okay. That but I mean, building, uh, building the, the, the just give us a proper race track already. Now the gray box. We have like uh, um, Montreal's uh, tools teams now that are working on like Houdini tools. And they are, we, we we're chatting with them, see what we could uh, could use from the library of tools. There will be several areas of like a higher level. Of yeah, Edward, I don't know if they're going to go that direction where you can just drop down on any street on and there's NPCs walking around like we'll cyberpunk yes. style. I think and there'll definitely be areas where that does happen, but uh, they're limited uh, by the technology, obviously, and what they can uh, do. Uh, but we already know that there's going to be spaces. traffic. You'll see ships that's flying around, uh, but the landing and anywhere at any spot, will be ready I don't know if that's going to be happening anytime soon. We started as a team of, of two artists. So yes, Alcatraz, you'll be able to basically order, come down or five and, uh, uh, in Arcorp, basically. Find a building, sit down on it, and you're good to go. 
each artist has the slightly different skill sets and we complete each other. They bring ideas. I let them bring ideas to the table on how to uh, advance uh, what we're doing, make it kick ass. So that's really important. So I, I hope you like what you see and we can't wait to show you more. I'm happy about the opportunity of working on, on this mandate because it's, it's, it's going to make such a, a huge difference. Thanks, Max. Uh, that's looking great. And hopefully you guys can kind of see even in a white box in format, we're seeing really good scale reads and understanding about how we can make the cityscape of Louisville probably one of our best yet. And um, we'll be showing more soon. Thanks for letting us showcase that for you today. Enjoy the rest of the show. Yeah, it's black and yellow. This is definitely home base for some time to come. Landing pads in the buildings. I mean, it's not groundbreaking. It kind of looks already. If you had just shown me this, that's saying work in progress, I would say this is what we already have. But uh, they're opening it up a bit more so you can just fly around everywhere instead of the big no fly zone, which is nice. I like it. Okay, exciting. Now show us the good stuff. Well, that was pretty good. So you've taken the one that had the most egregious no fly zone and you're making it so we can just race through the canyons and under the bridges and everything. Is, 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 I, I want to ask you the same question I asked John Crew. Is this BS or is this really what we're doing? Uh, no, this is what we're doing and hopefully you can see in the B-roll that you can actually see. <laughs> no, it's uh, BS. We, we lied to uh, you. It was a trick. <laughs> you know, no fly zones. You know, they were there for a reason at the time. But as we grow, as we learn, we find ways to... Yeah, Declan's got it there. There's interiors for some missions. So you'll land on some rooftop. There'll be an elevator. You're going down the same way that bunkers work, I guess. Will there be certain instances? Maybe. I, I see a point where there'll be an instance for you and a group maybe to do some kind of mission. Uh, not a stretch. So, yeah, Declan's right there. We want to keep the player experience in, you know, the maximum level. So it's there. But for Louisville, as you've seen, you know... Um, we, we want that experience to be as low as possible, to get that feeling where you can yeah. weave in between the structures, weave in, in between the buildings. And it was always something like, as we progressed through the land zones, it was always like, one day, one day we'll get back to Louisville. So I'm super happy That's that we're seeing this now. And uh, you know, we've discussed the art pipeline for, for years, we've been doing, you know, like I said, we're here for our, celebrating our 10th anniversary this year. We've been talking about how game, games are developed, and we've, cut, we've gone through the pipeline a number of times, from white box to gray box to stuff like that. Where would you say Lorville is? So let me well, just taper some expectations for what finished. you're going to see in a Citizen Con. Look, they've so definitely been working hard uh, in Squadron 42 for a while. Uh, so so we've got to wait for an update uh, on that. It's probably going to be towards the middle. Ways. Or towards three like quarters way off, through. You know, so we're, we're uh, pyro, we've already seen first, teasers of it, but we've seen a whole missions, vertical slice mission of what's happened in pyro. So I don't think that's too much of a stretch that to, to think that that's a lot more on that. But teasers are always good. Uh, new ships, there's at least four ships unannounced that are complete. Um, one of them is probably that vehicle which has been leaked out already. It's a small little buggy. Nothing special, so, which leaves three more so unannounced really ships. Uh, probably related to Squadron 42, maybe. So I see if they do a Squadron 42 tease and then have a ship sale after that. Uh, that could be the money generator for this month, but we'll wait and see. But uh, overall, don't expect anything groundbreaking. Don't expect anything to blow you away. I think it's just an update in the way they are. Uh, we know what to expect, mostly. Some of the misconceptions that we're seeing in the chat here. Uh, our journey to 4.0 is more akin to a journey. No, they haven't teased any new ships, but uh, uh, there's at least three 
unannounced ships which are actually complete at this point. So they're either going to do it season con or Christmas or both. Christmas sales. We'll be in 4.1, 4.2, 4.3, and we'll know which as we get closer to development. Anybody that's followed have followed the, pro, the, 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 the project long enough knows that that's how this works. But everything you're seeing on, on today's show here is everything that's going to that's in the process, in the pipeline, being developed now for 4, 4, 1, 4, 2, 4, 3, and so forth. Um, and before we jump to the next one, I want to shout out a couple of the, uh, the other promotions that are going on. The, digital's good, the digital goodies pack uh, is going out there. You get a, 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 a Finley plushie. It's not called Finley anymore. It's called Francis. I should look at that beforehand. Uh, there's a new jumpsuit that's being given to everybody and grenade launchers with a cool new skin. That's free to all backers. Uh, just register your account. Yeah, the grenade launcher is the most useful thing. So when you spawn someplace and you don't have any uh, weapons, at least the default weapon is the grenade launcher. is decent. Uh, yeah, this is five hours long. Uh, send us your in -game and the 600i rework, yeah, I'm not holding point. my breath for that. You know, uh, the man himself asking about the 600i. Right uh, who knows? In San Diego, who I saw on, on Twitter earlier. Uh, the JRDF contest, our, our, our partners at uh, JR Design and Fabrication, uh, create a ship model using only ordinary and random household objects for a chance to win. Uh, they make they make these these models that you see here. Uh, the, yeah, the Declan, uh, that's a, part a of the problem of, of the endless production cycle they're in, or they have the ability to yeah. continue Let's update on, things, on. On. which is good, as opposed to a game which is just, it looks it visually bad and that's doesn't get updated. Star Citizen can continually upgrade things as they go along, right? So, good and bad, good, it's always going to be on the, the cutting edge. Bad, it's just going to take long, right? And the longer it takes, the more they keep updating things. So, Lorval now, ship interiors, new ships, redo old ships, update old ships. And then don't forget the Halloween promotion is going on right now with... Scary helmets and 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 uh, a pumpkin, pumpkin carving contest. Uh, that's always my favorite. Uh, I think every single winner we've probably one of the most important things, Gene, is, is I want the ability to uh, reclaim my lost uh, right, stuff. So, so if I'm wearing subscriber up, gear and I get killed, where is that already? It's been too long. Now. I want to reclaim my cool armor and my cool weapons and my gold sniper rifle, which I never use because I don't want to lose it. Resource management. What did I want to say about this? Okay. When I backed the project back in 2013, 2014, before I got, came here, the thing that excited me most about Star Citizen yeah. was the potential for multi crew gameplay. Uh, Edward, that, I, I don't know what my that, settings are there for the spam, but uh, I'll check on that uh, once a we're captain done. Captain and a navigator and an engineer and a comms person and and run down to the run down and put out a fire and the, something's exploding in the cargo hold. You got to go and you know, fix the fuses and stuff like this. Uh, that multi crew experience has been the has been what drew me to the project uh, first as a backer and, until I came in uh, to do this on a spaceship. Did I mention I have a spaceship? I have a spaceship. Uh, and if you're like me, on our 10-year journey, I've been, I've been wondering, when's going to be the day? Where are we at with this stuff? Uh, well, Dan Truffin and Thorsten Lyman are here to talk about the actual working prototypes of the resource management system, the thing that will make true multi-crew gameplay possible, and the last big hurdle to getting those capital ships into the game. So buckle up, eyes forward, and take it away, Dan and Thorsten. Okay, resource management. Did I miss something earlier? Have they shown any ships yet? I'm uh, assistant director for PU Content, and with uh, Thorsten Lyman here today, we will be talking to you about something we think uh, it will change the way Star Citizen functions and works, and how the players will play the game uh, in the future, and that is resource management. No, there's no new ships, Eduardo. Let's <laughs> show resource management. Resource management is the underlying system that allows uh, items to produce, consume, and store uh, resources in the game. It is the digital representation of real-life cables, pipes, uh, tanks, batteries, or anything like this that you can imagine. It's the I'll foundation go, we of the some ships water. where you have certain resources like fuel and energy powering certain items on the ship, but it's also uh, the system that will lie below 
any station or any vehicle, anything that you can imagine in our universe that actually requires a certain type of resource. Resource management is not just a system that helps the ships function. It is a thing that's integral to the functionality of the entire universe. It will be the way uh, surface outposts function, underground facilities, space stations, landing zones, everything in Star Citizen will function using resource management. So we will start with the smaller vehicles and it will the gameplay for those smaller vehicles way more interesting than what we have right now. And from that we can move on to like bigger ships and finally the capital ships will have a real purpose in the world and where it will have a real meaning that uh, you have the multiple roles inside those ships. It will drastically increase the time to kill for all vehicles in Star Citizen, and it will encourage people to disable ships rather than destroy them. Missions like Siege of Horizon will uh, increase in scope and uh, scale up a lot more with the use of resource management as players will be able to uh, cripple resources, change the way resources are distributed, cut power, cut certain fuel and critical parts, in order to progress further in those missions. We can suddenly scale a lot bigger than what we have right now. And the reasons are that we have more control over the powers of certain platforms there and we can introduce some interesting gameplay that facilitates these functionalities. Resource management is going to open up uh, the possibility of player structures, player-owned uh, outposts on planet uh, or uh, stations in space where the player will have to manage resources, bring in fuel, do repairs. And this will not be something that only caters towards the engineer. This will be something that is valuable for everyone in the world of Star Citizen. Resource management will finally allow players to build their own bases and their own homesteads and actually keep that, that loop engaging and fun. And really, this is the main thing that makes multi-crew gameplay possible. We envision the players taking on roles like engineer, mechanic, uh, tactical officer, and while you have your engineer trying to maintain all the resources functioning and flowing perfectly and all the items in good operation, you will have mechanics running throughout the ship trying to change fuses, repair various things that are broken down. You will have tactical officers moving shields from one side of the ship to another in order to counter whatever incoming damage you have. Obviously, the pilot is going to be doing his job trying to move the ship out of harm's way. The gunners are going to be taking out enemy incoming fighters or other ships. This is how we envision this entire ecosystem just coming together and providing what we hope is true multi-crew gameplay. Multi-crew gameplay. And for all of you out there that are waiting for the Idrises and Javelins and want to use these ships, this is the system that is going to make using those ships possible. So all that said, this is a really important system for Star Citizen, but let's dig into the details and see what exactly this is. Resource management can be broken down into several uh, key elements. Power energy resources, life support, item maintenance, relay handling, access control, and gravity. So let's start with power energy and resources. The players can choose to overload items in order to get more efficiency out of them at the risk of burning them out. They can also underload items to save some, uh, some resources if they don't need the full uh, efficiency of an item. The players will have to pay attention to the balance of resources, power, fuel, coolant, uh, heat generated, in order to maintain a well-oiled and balanced ship. And overall, prioritizing certain items and their resource consumption. Life support is the most important thing you have to pay attention to in your ships now, since atmosphere is finite in all the spaces that you might uh, discover. And here, the life support system is a key factor. Here, the life support, you have to maintain it, meaning you have to make sure that the consumables inside the life support generator are always there to make sure that it can generate breathable atmosphere for you, or the temperature is actually increased to a human livable factor, so you don't freeze to death or you don't, yeah, you are not cooked. As part of item maintenance, what the player uh, will be able to uh, control uh, items throughout the ship, turn them on, turn them off. 
they will be able to remove broken items and replace them with uh, new items or sometimes dodgy items. Okay. Depends on, depending on their... Did I miss the best part? What was it? Be able to control which sub items are uh, installed in those Breakfast. items, either as Oatmeal. fuses or sub components that Breakfast give them various bonuses to uh, to that specific item. They will be able to run um, repair gameplay and replace broken fuses when the item stops working or takes enough uh, in, enough damage. Relay handling is the the actual management part that you as the engineer on the ship have has to do you have to do there it's um basically defining these circuits in the most effective way especially for bigger ships so a relay is something that defines which items are connected to each other and what we want to achieve here is allowing you to so manuel the what you're saying there is um, actually pretty close to what we might be seeing. So hang around. Assign certain roles to each of his crewmates, and for example, say one of the player becomes the engineers. The engineer yeah, I'm not going to say too much, Manuel, but uh, what you're saying is actually spot on. Controls while the, the we're going to see something like that. Pilot will not have access to those controls. At the same time, uh, a gunner will only have access to a specific gun or all the guns on the ship. And finally, gravity. So gravity is a concept that you experienced already in every ship. So there is always a ground, there is always there is always a down, there is always an up. And we would like to give you some more control over that. So because it requires some, some energy, and if you want to run your ship more energy efficient, we want you to allow to switch off gravity. Or there might be other use cases where a zero gravity environment is more useful than... Not to give too much so away, but what uh, right now, Manuel is saying with proper pirate ships, like not a brand new Mercury Star right now, or not a, a brand new Gladius with a fancy paint job. There will be ships, possibly, that are kind of currently we have working in, in line with what he's saying of the following uh, systems power gravity life support and the relay network with a power system we can overpower and underpower items we can set the priorities of uh, item producers and consumers inside the ship and we can set the path uh, of resources uh, inside the ship through the resource uh, relay network and with a power system we already can distribute the base energy. Goddamn Mercury Star on them. I love the Mercury Star on them. I love that black and gold trim on it. But the doors, man. If I just had an entrance. Okay, first of all, the entire uh, tunnels under the ship, useless. I don't know why they wanted those in there. But give me a way to get directly into the cockpit through an elevator or stairs. Would have made the ship a thousand percent better. We can also demonstrate many aspects of the life support system, including making new players suffocate. We've seen this stuff before. This is not new. They've shown concept of atmosphere and room, like they're venting out um, the atmosphere to put a fire out. We've seen all this years, well, over a year ago. Yeah, man. Those tunnels under the ship, useless. Give me an elevator into the area behind the cockpit, that little hallway behind the cockpit. And ele stairs even, I don't care. Yeah. It'll just make the ship so much better. I hate having to go through the back, have to climb up the ladder. The design of it, look, Sarah is the artist that designed the Mercury Star. And she's very talented. She did a wonderful job in the ship design. The only thing is the transversal into the actual cockpit area where you're going to be most of the time. Problem. Oh, stream stopped. Is it me? Hmm. Hope so. My internet. No, still running.
Uh oh, <laughs> they just lost their stream. Let me double check. It's not me, right? Oh, there we go. Making new players suffocate. For those of you with asphy asphyxiation fetishes, finally there's a game for you. Venting and filling rooms with atmosphere. I think this is I mean so a thing like this is something they've worked so hard on but it just becomes kind of second nature when you're playing the game and you know your room is pressurized but the room behind it isn't so you open the door and the room equalizes it's just something which is normal that you'd expect to happen and yet they've taken so long to get the point to actually make that happen in the game Makes you appreciate the work, basically. Okay. It's a big deal here. GTA 5. From like eight years ago. I said super jump in the game for years, alright? <laughs> we get super jump in the game now? Why is it taking so long? I like it. Picasso. Different ways to complete a mission, right? So if your target is a big hammerhead, but you're in a small ship that can't actually take it out, sneak on board, sabotage a ship, take out its shields. I like it. I like it a lot. I like it a lot. Stealth gameplay, sabotage, yeah. But with a system that is this big and complex, we do not want to rush it. We want to just get it right and get it right from the beginning. So let's talk about what's next for the resource management system. As you can tell, resource management is, is a huge endeavor for us. So like everything else, we'll probably not get everything in the initial release. But this is what we're aiming for. Interactable and accessible items on ships, relay gameplay, uh, changing fuses on the relays, resource balancing, defining control groups that will be accessible uh, through the NFDs, allowing people to create presets for your uh, resource network for each ship, an engineering UI with at least uh, a list or schematic view of your ships, external engineering screen for ships, allowing engineers to define the tuning parameters that can be accessed by the pilot with the press of a button like loading presets and creating presets. And after the initial release, everything else will fall into place with subsequent patches. Yeah, nothing new in there. We, we've seen we a lot of that before in Inside Star about Citizen. Resource management, uh, about two years ago, it is pretty much the evolution of what used to be the old pipe system. And uh, this has been a, an interesting journey and finally we're starting to see the, the fruits of our labor and we're starting to see all the possibilities of gameplay that we can open up to the players in the future. It's exciting to work on something that's so central to the world of Star Citizen and that can impact the gameplay in, of so many people irrelevant of what they choose to do in the world of Star Citizen. Resource management is the most exciting feature that I've ever worked with. It's such a groundbreaking 
feature. You know, one uh, ship which uh, will definitely benefit from all this? Game. The Mercury Star Runner, because every single compartment and room has a thousand doors in it. <laughs> change the game into this direction where we, where we are heading right now. Oh, yeah. Where we will finally have all the tools in place to actually allow meaningful uh, multi-crew gameplay and meaningful mm, decisions Gib Idris. for all the players. Where every decision counts. How this many of you have an Idris? Stuff that, that and you'll be flying it solo, me, really which is the intended use. We are working on right now. Thank you for letting us share our progress with you. And I, we hope you're happy with all this progress and have a nice season gone. All right. Give us the good stuff now. This Fire Citizen Singapore card is really cool. I'm just, they've just been staring at me playing with it for the last 18 minutes. That was, uh, that, that, that was Dan Treffen and Torsten Lyman talking about the resource ma uh, management system. And joining us to follow up on it is Todd Pappy, John Crew. Guys, this has been a long time coming. I know we still got a ways to go. I'm not, I don't want to make it sound like it's, you know, yeah, it's done. But, yeah. but, I mean, how exciting is this? This is very like it, d this to me brings the interaction that we want in environments but also in ships you know so like like you said with with the the multi crew uh, stuff but the kraken again, it's, it's not you know like they're trying to push all these big ships and go yeah. you need crew because one guy's got to you know be an engineering and put out fires and then you need guy in comms no you don't come on admit it's, it's, we all have those of you who have uh, krakens and idrises and, and capital and ship you'll be flying so it solo you're going to jump in the ship just to uh you know, fly somewhere by yourself. <laughs> totally. Solo Kraken, slow, solo Idris is all over the place, all the time. That's, that's what we're looking for. Being, being able to make, you know, imagine Siege of Orison, but being able to actually assault the platforms. Yeah. Hey Carl, welcome. Uh, so they uh, released Squadron 42. Uh, it's out right now, you can download it. Also, everyone who was watching uh, 10 minutes ago got a free Idris. Yeah. All you gotta do is just claim the code, but I think they just ran out. So you missed the free Idris part, but I think Squadron 42 is downloadable. And playable right now. <laughs> what, what's, the, what, what's the first version of this look like? Uh, so, first version is going to be uh, a lot of what you saw in that video. Um, so, we're working through some of the ships now: um, Hammerhead, uh, Hull A, Star Runner, just to prove out uh, a few things. Because naturally, uh, some ships were built a long time ago. Um, ones in recent times were built with this sort of level of detail in mind. Um, but yeah, you, you'll have all these components accessible. You'll be able to get to the relays, do all this management. Um, something really cool in that uh, video was all the, the fire and gravity and atmosphere stuff. And like you say, it, it goes from just being a ship, you're on board. Yeah, good thing you can't clip stuff on YouTube. <laughs> Declan, where's the <laughs> nuclear crisis? Something happened today that I missed? Gonna, that's about it. Now engineers and support roles are gonna have a, a, a huge part to play on ships because things will go wrong and if you don't get on top of it quickly did i miss something about squadron 42 yet because i was pretty sure there's going to be a lot yeah, it hasn't been discussed right and some missed it earlier this is, the, this is the aspect of star citizen that first drew me you know in so it has been a i feel like i've been very patient and, and, and waiting and really wanting to see this go and, and as i see uh everybody on eupu and everybody that's, that's contributing to this thing it's just super exciting to, to see it uh, uh really beginning to evolve and really beginning to, 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 to be used tangibly in our prototypes and stuff like that. And I, it's, it's just, I think people know I don't generally hype very often. Usually the guy is sitting here, it's like, don't hype, you know, manage your expectations and stuff. And you should, you should still do that. I'm not changing my tune. I'm just, this is the part of the thing that I've been waiting for personally. Yeah. So I'm excited. All right. So we've ping pong from, 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 from the visuals to the gameplay, to the visuals to the gameplay, to the visuals to the gameplay. Uh, we've only got one more uh, scheduled presentation left. Uh, ship, uh, ship Talk, Talking Ship, the, our annual uh, celebration of vehicles. New coming to the, to the, to the pipeline. Vehicles Here we go, new ships. Things, Get your wallets ready, boys. Uh, that's going to start uh, John Crew. And Going to star uh, John Crew and Ben Curtis and Paul Jones, and I'll let them uh, take it away. <laughs> Hype. New ships. Let's go.
Hi everyone, my name is Jean Crew. I'm the Vehicle Director here at Cloud Imperium Games. Uh, this year I'm once again joined by Ben Curtis, Vehicle Art Director, and Paul Jones, Concept Art Director, and this is our yearly Ship Talk panel. Like previous years, we'll be talking about something coming soon, something being announced today, something coming a bit later, and then the fan favourite, the Pick a Ship or Vehicle concept series. To kick things off this year, we're going to be talking about... Yeah, I heard that call. Is going to be a bit of a Crusader real estate Spirit disaster in the UK in the coming months, right? Ships from Crusader Industries that is designed to I would invest in ships now. A of other Ooh, ships what? At the two-person uh, crew level and does a wide what? variety of tasks depending on which variant you uh, pick. The two stand-up competitors to this ship are what did we just see? the Cutlass and the, obviously the Cutlass Blue, Red, Steel and the Freelancer series. Um, those are all similar sized uh, ships to this and they also cover similar sort of roles. Compared to the Cutlass and Freelancer series, the, the Spirit benefits from uh, not only Crusade Industries sort of stylish uh, physical appearance, but also their renowned speed and agility. Uh, what is it? We have three variants of the Crusader Spirit. We Spirit. have the C1, which is the cargo hauler version. We have the A1, which is the light to sort of medium bomber version. And then we have the E1, which is the executive VIP transport version. One of the really nice features- This sounds the expensive, boys. <laughs> um, is the, the front half of the ship is kind of like this, this shared area, and it's the rear section that swaps out. So the C1 is the cargo hauler version. Uh, this comes with 48 SEU of cargo capacity in the central area. Okay. Uh, accessible like the other versions via the rear. Oh, that's hot. It's wide enough to allow a variety of ground. It's a sleek Mercury board. Star on it. It's what we wanted. Cyclone. Um, you won't be fitting larger things in it. Like this is the Mercury Star. In what, look, the size of the cargo quick bay. access to the cockpit. You can put a vehicle and still have some cargo capacity left over. The A1 is the bomber version of the Spirit, which sort of splits the difference between the Hercules A2's bomb uh, bomber version, which has both size 10 and size 3 bomb options. This comes with size 5 uh, bombs. Uh, oh, they are ranged so two <laughs> yes. Uh, gravity drops uh, formations down each side. Of yeah, the I'm, I'm getting gravity. the so bomber. Nice to walk right down the middle. And then you have I, the two I, don't, I don't know if I need it. It just looks cool. It's black, has bombs. Drop out of the, the bottom of the ship. Awesome. It delivers a different role to what the Starlifter does in terms of the bomber. I think it's a, a much kind of smaller, faster. Okay, grid. let's so talk price. Agile, you're going to be kind of Chat, and what do you say? Um, and, and, you know, doing your 350? Getting back out of the danger a pop, quite quickly. The whole so pack for 700? Like in that sense, uh, but it does deliver Show me numbers, guys. Give me guesses. Style, um, that smells like 300 so to 350 a ship for better. me. Uh, and it really depends on what you want to wipe off the face of the planet that you're bombing. Obviously, the A2 has both heavy hitters and what could be described as carpet bombing, whereas this is sort of for when you don't want to completely annihilate everything on the ground. And lastly, we have the E1 variant, which uh, solely exists to give Jared Hartman. Alcatraz saying 300, line. Manuel so coming in at 350. What the Starliner will, will get Wounds in the Skull coming in at 600. We've got a high. Yeah, Metaverse coming in low at 150. Really Eduardo at 450. Alcatraz 400. Bye-bye, Hammerhead. Um, <laughs> Art and now saying so, 400. You know, we really wanted to sort All right, should we that, say uh, that VIP experience? Uh, okay, maybe this one is 400 bucks. Sort of multi role ship. But when you get into the module, uh, you've got lockers, space, you know, space to put any sort of personal belongings. If essentially, you go into two elevators, left or right, and take you up to the top deck. Okay, well, we knew we were getting a, so a single seat bomber, but this is a dual seat bomber, so they went above feeling. and I that would be beyond really what they were kind of promising or looking for. Mike Barron coming in with 550. The, the kind of the large 550 to 600. Um, so when you're in this, this looks like the chip area, from um, great views and be able to kind of like ah. explore the verse um, in, in something that I think is Commander Shepard's ship. What's it called? And we also have uh, the Mixmaster, which is at the front of the um, front of the module, which is basically where players can go and Normandy. Thank you, Gene. Yes, it's, you know, total like sleek, long movie. Normandy vibes. And absolutely. Also have super comfy seats. They'll have the. Uh, widescreen TV in the in Okay, the so I'm really excited to see when we start getting our players and our AI right off the bat ships and being able to kind the of the executive the burst, um, 
transport yeah. thing, no, I'm not interested experience, in that. I mean, you already not, have the 890 Jump or 600i. Uh, I don't see how this competes. Uh, as far as a small bomber, yes. This is the only ship that can drop those bombers. Size 3, size 5, what do you say? variant, but there are some aspects which don't need to change. And starting from the front of the ship, you naturally have the, the cockpit or the bridge. So like other Crusader ships, you have the side-by-side -side pilot to co-pilot arrangement. Then you have behind them their living quarters slash bunk area and component access. And then you have the variant section which does change the sort of internal floor plan of the ships between them then at the rear of the ship you'd naturally have the the ramp access area so that's the crusader Very spirit a2 uh, kind of mercury strana engine design to back obviously seeing what it can do in the game in the future from something at the very start of our vehicle black and gold to something nearing the end of yeah you know i'm a sucker for that Let's all right the drake corsair next i'm up for the i'm up for the bomber and Corsair is one I already is have. important ship in their lineup because it fills that multi-crew uh, exploration gap in their lineup. We've seen a lot of Drake ships of various usage and roles, uh, such as the Buccaneer and Cutlass. In this size class, uh, you naturally have the, the Constellation, the 600i, as the competitors. And what Drake brings is its usual All the guns uh, on this thing. rugged, overwhelming amount of firepower yeah. uh, for its size, sort of classification to that entry. It's Drake's uh, dedicated exploration ship. Um, it's a... <laughs> kind of a, a Email a just went out. You can pick up your uh, Crusader Spirit. Got crew for Go get it! For Limited time! For crew. Well, what's it uh, selling for? It's got a sizable cargo hold um, and it's kind of got everything that you need to really spend a, a decent amount of time away from civilization, away from stations um, and just kind of being able to chart out uh, those, those deep areas of space. It brings that sort of no nonsense, no frills approach to, to the ship. And you know, you know if something's gonna go wrong, it's gonna be something that you more than likely can fix. And it's not gonna be something that, you know, you have to cut back to a main dealer to get serviced and fixed. It's something that you know, hopefully you and your crew will be able to kind of repair and, and get back up and running or just fix some cut. Crusader Spirit so coming in see, at... Um the ship will oh we were all, all wrong 100 dollars dna that's running through crusader uh, spirit. spirit oh wait is so this the paint can, no you can kind of almost imagine how the ship 100 bucks guys that military, easy <laughs> low end it's, it's 370 guns, for the whole pack um, that is 370 dollars really for the spirit executive uh, collection oh that's if you concierge i think what's quite unique to the, the Corsair is Spirit the Collection Warbond, 370 uh, you know, for all three. 370. Yeah, that okay. Drake for 100 bucks, I'm do it. You can't go it wrong. 100 bucks a pop. Out of the hangers, uh, much easier. Uh, we put quite a lot of oh, yeah. into 100 bucks, guys. that really iconic uh, Doing that. exterior kind of silhouette and, and, and vision that we, we set, um, but still making it functional and, and making sure it, it works. At the moment, we're just kind of finishing up on final art. Um, most of the exterior has had, you know, the majority of it, its um, core art time spent on it. We've still got lighting to do. We've still got kind of like final finishing to do, tweak some of the materials till we're kind of properly happy. Um, but it's in a, a good place. So I'm really, really excited to be able to show you. So let's take a look inside the ship. And once again, we'll go front to back. On the inside of the ship, we start right at the front on the cockpit. Um, the, the Corsair has quite a unique feel to its cockpit. In the pilot is kind of <laughs> Guys, uh, CIG is in trouble, all right? They've they gone cheap. The, the <laughs> they could have they sold it for 300 management. bucks. Of, oh, cool, that look at that. Transition from awesome. the main cockpit area into that kind of co-pilot um, kind of section. Uh, it's, it's, you know, you move right forward. And <laughs> we much we don't need more money, so we're it giving you the ship for 100 bucks. We're being nice. The pilot and the co-pilot. <laughs> the other nice thing about this cockpit is, again, you've got these massive guns. Yeah, Warbond, 370, 403. Of you, um, so it should be, should be a nice place to be. Oh, in, in the rear of the cockpit, we've got the captain's quarters. So the captain's quarters is actually pretty much identical to the rest of the quarters in the ship in terms of its what, kind of why size. Why is it 370 it's, for it's, three? Uh, what? Amenities. As, as you move back through the ship, there's a, um, I guess, a small kind of crossroads directly behind the bridge. From here, you can either progress backwards straight into habitation, or to either side, you've got the turret access. So it's right really at the kind of like the neck of the ship, effectively. The side turrets have changed a little since the concept phase. They now have a greater range of motion uh, in sort of the yaw axis. We're quite limited at concept stage to about 45 degrees. 
uh, each way you're, you're now looking at 90 degrees pretty much each way so it's a lot more effective especially forward firing which again the Corsair has so many guns pointing forward yeah 400 uh, bucks it's a good looking ship 400 bucks very, very drake in habitation we've got you know you've got the remaining three what's the catch <laughs> is there a really catch i've been ignoring what's happening on this in the corsair you've hell let me somewhere to store your gear pay attention here pretty much it the main habitation area though is um if anything quite luxurious for a drake ship in that there's a decent sized space uh you've got your, your, your bathroom which is no frills it's got a shower it's got a toilet whatever you've got the um the kind of chow line yeah the, rip your gladius yeah you rip any 100 dollar ship been melted the, down the, to get the bomber now uh, habitation area there's a, a large also a rip ball, jump town uh, seating area you know That's how many of these ships are going to be to, you know, just meals, peppering jump town with bombs now plan your next move um, and really you know decide where you're taking your your adventure as we move back from habitation we start to get into like the rear half of the ship i think if if the habitation area is like the, oh, that course is looking of awesome in, in the ship then love it the love it area is the real big fan of, of the, uh, the drake itself. design it's sort of this octagonal hexagonal space uh with a few little rooms coming off it to cram components in and off one of those you have <laughs> subscription chips yeah don't before, give them ideas uh, before you go into eva or docking or coming back out of when we'll be in the game we'll be in the game in the, in five years the lift and the lift not only goes down to ground level but it also takes you um, up to the, the roof of the yeah. ship. Oh, look at so those handles. That's cool. A, you know, That's new. Quick space walk, or you need to go and repair something on the exterior. Then you've got kind of easy access straight nice. up the lift and, and out you go. Then finally at the rear, you have the main cargo hold, which has space for a Nursa Rover or similar size vehicles and down, along with a yeah, that course is awesome. cargo capacity. And, you know, I think so much nicer than the, the Constellation the or equivalent. The mechanics are exposed. You, know, you can really see the workings of, of how the ship actually operates. If you're a fan of Drake, it, it certainly ticks all those boxes. So I think the Corsair is a particularly cool ship. Um, I love Eduardo, the styling that's not how it works. Uh, wing arrangement of you got to buy the ship now to get the LTI on it. On it. addition to the game, giving those sort of players who enjoy that Drake experience their slice of the pie. And you'll be able to... Yeah, I'm going to buy the bomber one and, and name it Morphologist. <laughs> today, a vehicle that's at the end of the pipeline, we have the Grey Cat STV. Racing is a cool and fun aspect of Star Wars. Okay, so that's the Spirit and this This is two of the at least four completed concepts. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if they're going to save a concept for Christmas time. But it's possible we see one more concept ship now. So the STB is the Grey Cat sports terrain vehicle. Um, it builds on what they learned from the, the PTV, but it brings it... Um, out of the, the hangars, off of the tarmac, and onto you know much more rugged terrain. It's a four-wheeler, two-person, open-topped, sport styling, everything you need to razz around on the planet. So the STV is actually part of a wider family of vehicles. You may recognize a resemblance in the name to the Grey Cat PTV, which is also part of that family. And we also have a third vehicle lined up that we want to do in the future called the UTV, which is the utility terrain vehicle. And we've actually reconcepted the PTV and we have the concept for the UTV. And when you see all three side by side, you'll see that family resemblance. The interior again is similar design language, simple layout, easy to clean. That was a big thing for us, even though we don't have like a cleaning mechanic. Uh, all this sort of builds into the sort of visuals of the vehicle. So, you know, the floors have got drill holes in them so it can easily let water through. The, the seats are easily removable so you can let you see the bolts where you can just quickly whip them out and so all of this thinking goes into um, those kind of vehicles the wheels are a big feature large sort of rubber um, mud guards um, you know just there's lots of subtleties um, in terms of the, the roll cage you know the sort of cross section of all these things maybe you know people wouldn't notice but for us you know these are all um, part of making a manufacturer consistent. So the STV um, delivers that gameplay that is you, know, you and a buddy out exploring over our planets. We've, we've got you know, these, these vast ships that you can explore deep space and, and you know, go off with, with your big multi crews. But what this really allows you to do is get down on, on you know, one of our many, many planets and go exploring on the ground. 
it's not just a, a vehicle for you and a friend. It's also got kind of some cargo space in the back. So if you are out there doing missions, um, rather than having to fly your ships directly to where the mission is, it allows you to land you know, slightly out there, slightly in a safer area. You've still got space to, to load up with weapons, load up with your um, whatever mission items you need and get in and out nice and quick. Compared to the Cyclone RC, which is a sort of racing variant of a non-racing vehicle, the STV was built from the ground up to be a good uh, racing vehicle. It has a good chassis, it has better handling, it has better top speed, and that what makes it a, a compelling racing choice. The, the best things about Star Citizen as a whole is it kind of brings uh, a lot of gameplay, and it's you know it's not all about combat. It's not all about um, you know, flying these massive ships. And I think one of the things that a lot of us are excited internally about is, is racing within our game. A lot of us come from a, a racing background in terms of the games we've developed before. Um, a lot of us are you know, petrol heads at heart. Um, so I think being able to build on that kind of gameplay um, in Star Citizen is, is super exciting for us. And if you stick around to the end of the broadcast, you'll get your first chance at seeing the uh, STV in action in a race organized by Atmo Esports, creators of the Daymar Rally, where you'll see it taking on the terrain for the first time. You'll be able to pick one of these vehicles up today at the end of the broadcast. Okay. So I and guess finally, this was the reveal. Uh, the most important aspect of these inaugural shows, the pick a ship concept challenge thing. For those of you that have seen previous years, uh, you will have seen that we've thrown up some silhouettes of potential ship and vehicle options and asked for your feedback on which one we should actually make. And the wise among you have probably realized that we end up making pretty much all of them anyway. Yes. Uh, so instead of just doing that again and pretending that we're not gonna do that, we thought we'd do something slightly different this year and just have a single ship option. Uh, and the choice is actually the manufacturer and the styling of that ship. So we want to do a nice large civilian mining ship that bridges the gap between the Argo Mole and the RSI Orion because if you know those two ships, there is quite a gulf of space in between them. We wanted to fill that gap mining with ship. Uh, an intermediary well, stepping stone before you A lot of people like mining. Big, uh, RSI I think it's going to be a good money maker in the game. The scale of its mining is nothing like any other mining ship in the game. The Mole is the current mining system, just lots of it. So with this larger ship, we want to increase that and also provide onboard space for our ground mining vehicles, such as the Rock and the Rock DS which allows you the flexibility Okay, I see where they're going. They want uh, any mining situation that you can something bigger than the mole so that will carry vehicles in it. We have three choices, which are basically the manufacturers. We have RSI as the first choice. Uh, so obviously RSI do the Orion. So this would be a smaller uh, vehicle in that family. We have Argo, again, we have the mole. So naturally it could be a larger step up from that. And then we have MISC, the third option. Obviously, MISC do the Prospector. So again, keeping it all within the same family. As you can see from these images, they each have their sort of own unique styling take on that uh, pitch that I've just given you. At the end of this Ship Talk panel, Jared will come on and explain how you get to vote on these three options. And that's the end of Talking Ship. So over to you, Jared. All right, so the Crusader Spirit is available now as a concept promotion on the robertspaceindustries.com website. The STV is coming to the PT, uh, the, coming to the, the, the universe uh, at the end of the broadcast, uh, just in time for the Atmo Esports uh, racing event that's happening after this. And uh, the Corsair will be making its way to you at this year's. Okay, so where's the Squadron 42 stuff? And to vote <clears throat> on this year's. Take care, Winston. John, John Cruz, pick a ship. Test squadron, best squadron. Thanks for dropping by. Website where you can go and vote on the manufacturer for the next big mining ship. So, John, recently you went through and just nuked all the speeds of all the ground vehicles, and obviously you did that so that the STV could be the fastest. That's that's certainly one take on, <laughs> <laughs> on what happened. Um, to talk about it a bit more in depth, uh, it was actually planned for quite some time. Um, as we know, game development timelines go all over the place. So we'd actually done this for 318 Ivacati, which sadly did not come out before 317.3 went live. Um, so we did that because, quite frankly, a lot of those vehicles were ludicrous speeds, like 
uh, 55 meters a second is like over 120 miles an hour off road. Okay, back on talking about speeds again, but uh, yeah, uh, unless they're saving something for the end, I thought there'd be a lot more squaring 42 stuff. So this is, I don't want to go jump the gun and say disappointing, but uh, I was expecting squaring 42. I was expecting more discussion about it. Unless they are saving that for its own special thing outside of CizenCon. Again, this isn't really a big fancy CizenCon. This is just something they needed to do uh, to save time and money because they're moving to the offices. But um, it's possible they're saving Squadron 42 for its own unique big re kind of reveal. Maybe a Christmas special because we're close to, close to Christmas. I don't know. But if they finish off the CizenCon with nothing on Squadron 42, uh, that's a huge disappointment. For me, anyway. When you say a little taste, what does that mean? I'm asking for me, not not for these people. I'm asking for me. What does that mean? Um, so obviously, the, the Starline is quite a, an old concept. Um, we didn't really do a huge amount of interior look to it. So the time we spent on the Spirit E1, the E1 Spirit, is really what we're going to build on for that. So you're going to have um, like that VIP first class pod enclosure. Mm -hmm. Mixmaster, the most important feature of the Starliner. I just have uh, no idea how that's going to work. Second Fast email Tony, from CIG fun. telling me I have to go buy the Spirit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that, that sort of feel, that, that, that luxury transport feel, is something we haven't really shown in Star Citizen. Um, so here's the thing on the pricing. Yeah, so the, the low end one is 100 bucks, the, the bomber is 155, and then the transport is 135. Um, if you look do, at like the a, a curve of what people are willing to spend versus how many ships they can sell, right? If you do like the X, Y axes and see where you're on the curve, they can make a ship a thousand dollars and they know they'll sell X amount of it. Or if they make a ship a hundred dollars, will they sell the same amount as if they were selling a more expensive? Get what I'm saying? You can draw a chart, but um, it's it's very likely that their uh, economics department, if they have one, priced it this way because they know that for a hundred bucks. And for the amount of new players in the game right now, keep in mind there's a ton of new players. Not everyone coming in is going to be spending thousands of dollars. Like spending a hundred bucks on a game which isn't out is still ridiculous, right? But it's not impossible. So I think they definitely went on the cheaper price for these ships. They could have easily gone with 5,200 in my opinion. But with the amount of new players uh, in the game right now, uh, the idea of spending a hundred bucks on a game which isn't out is ludicrous. It's insane. Uh, but it kind of makes it more tangible if it's, it has a cool ship, it's 150, it's a bomber. They priced it low because I think they'll sell more of them. That's why they did that. PTV still looks how, how everyone recognizes it, but it sort of works with the modern mechanics. Let's do a sporty version, let's do a utility version. And so we've got those three together now. That you can really see like the, the family lineup. And they each do slightly different things, which is cool. But yeah, the, the STV is that beach buggy, dune buggy, thing to just razz around. No, it's, it's, it's really cool. I really like the styling of it. So if you, uh, we've got one small thing left and then one rather large surprise left. So we'll do the small thing first. Oh, here we go. Uh, Squadron 42, here we go. Well, I'm not going to tell you. I'm not going to tell you. I'll tell you, in, I'll tell you in like five minutes. Uh, but before we get there, uh, last year, during last year's CitizenCon uh, presentation, we we explored a lot of the outlaw lifestyle, their, their, their outposts, the space stations and stuff. Uh, we thought we'd do a little sizzle to follow up on how those things have evolved in the year since. So get ready, we're gonna show you a quick sizzle, sizzle and when we get back, uh, there'll be something, there'll be a neat surprise. So stay tuned. Ben Emergement now. Robot, I think it's a Squadron 42 T's. Better be.
when are we gonna see those uh, cryopods? Okay, Javelin, Pisces. Okay, this is Pyro, right? This, I mean, we, we've seen the kind of artwork that's gone into this. This is nothing overly new. Uh, it's been teased enough that I say, just put it in. Let us just get in there already. We've seen it so many times in Inside Star Citizens. It's a whole uh, grim hex. Can I use the word radial motif in something already? <laughs> what is my radial motif? This isn't Squadron 42, no. This is Pyro. He said there's the two surprises. There's a small one and a big one. So this is the small one. I don't know if this is a surprise. I mean, yes, we've seen the architecture. We've seen the design themes of it. Uh, hanging wires, flashing lights, old, decrepit things falling apart. It's Pyro. We get it. Uh, I think we're all just itching to get in there already. I mean, yeah, it's new visuals, but... Not new as in, we've seen enough of the design language for Pyro that uh, it's... You can show me different angles. It's the same thing. broken down old space stations. Yeah. All right, well, now the big reveal. A glimpse at how the outposts and the space stations have evolved since we saw them at last year's CitizenCon 2951. Uh, now, if you've been following our program uh, today, you might think this is it. We're near the end. Yes. We've got one more special surprise in store. Joining us Let's on the go. show today are two people who probably need no introduction, but we're going to do it anyway. Founder and CEO, Mr. Chris Roberts. Who? Hello, everyone. How you doing? How you doing? Oh, is that what Chris Doing Roberts looks like? Oh. Welcome to the spaceship. Welcome back to the spaceship. You, you opened the ship. What a surprise. <laughs> and, uh, this, this better not be the surprise. Director, uh, Mr. Richard Tyra. Hello. How's it going? Good. This is your first time on the spaceship. It is. It, it is. What do you think? Oh, I think it's very nice. Very I'm, really happy. I'm just going to ask everybody okay. how it thinks all day. Um, so, yeah, so Chris, Rich, you're here. Are we, are we going to talk a little bit about Squadron 42? Is that what we're doing right now? Uh, no. Well, yes and no. So uh, both me and Rich. Psych, uh, guys, there is no Squadron 42. It's been a trick. On, uh, squadron as, as well as helping out on the PU. And uh, one thing that we've thought um, that would maybe better to reiterate is there's a huge amount of work that we're doing on Squadron that is going to make a massive difference to Star Citizen, the PU. And uh, we wanted maybe to talk about some of the things that we're doing because I know a lot of people say, well, everyone's working on Squadron, no one's working on the PU. And that's not really true because a huge amount of the core gameplay that we're working on on Squadron is specifically <laughs> being built, not just for Squadron, but to benefit the PU. And we're just doing it's it- It's $500 million, right yeah. Of squadron to allow us to really uh, you know polish and make sure the features work well without having to be caught up in the sort of quarterly release cycle that you have on the PU uh, because we were finding it was it was hard for us to really finish the features out you know we'd get a tier zero out and then it would just sort of sit around for a while because everyone was rushing on to the next set of features they wanted to do and and for squadron obviously we're you know it's shipping as a final polished AAA title, so everything needs to be really put together, working really well, and playing great. And so we're trying in the setup that we're doing now to do that for the features that we've identified that we need to make sure it works really well for Squadron, but also okay. will play across into the PC. Yeah, yeah. So, so now it'll show be really us. Useful to come by and show us a video. Tell you all about some of the subtle things and the gameplay aspects that we're working on that maybe you haven't heard from. Todd or Tony or everyone else that like in you know 
today and uh, you know during the ISCs because we sort of try to keep the squadron stuff close to our chest to, to really sort of surprise and uh, impress people when we do it. Uh, and so yeah, we thought, why don't we just come by and maybe just talk about little things, maybe show you a sneak peek of something. Here, here we go. There. And not everything, because yeah, we squadron four two sneak peek. Let's do it. Close to our chest uh, until it's really ready to let the baby out of the carriage and it's you know beautifully dressed <laughs> and all the rest of it. Uh, but um, you know, hopefully uh, it'll give you guys some. Yeah, look, it's all very exciting to get a sneak peek, but honestly, this game, Squadron 42 just needs to get out the gate already. And I don't know if he's going to give any dates, but they, they do need to move on this. Let's talk a little bit more about that before we jump into the actual features. The, this this co-development has been part of the process since the since the project was first. Introduced. Absolutely right. Like it's all secrecy, but no, we can't show too much. Dude, just get it, um, get so it out really there. Like, give a give it like a level or two for people to play already because... How long can it take? I mean, ten years? Yeah, twelve. It's it's pushing it. Environments. You know the the struggle of T zero uh, features and the quarterly releases for the PU, and now you're getting to kind of your experience is different on Squadron. Talk to me about how that's changed and how it still work for one still benefits the other, or will ultimately. Well, when I worked on the PU, it wasn't really the PU or Squadron. It was always. Yeah, if they show us the leaked stuff, that's kind of expected. But they also said the leaked stuff wasn't supposed to be for shown. It's more internal. We'll see in a minute, I guess, anyway. Uh, Joe, thank you very much. Uh, I, I don't think you know me from EVE because I'm not who you probably think I was in EVE. I played EVE for like just less than a year. So I'm not from EVE. But thank you. <laughs> you know, if you've seen me doing talks on SC Live over the years or even in some of our retrospectives, is that we'd get features and the way that our you know, CIG is set up is we have feature teams and we have content teams. So what would happen is we'd develop a feature. Upgrading a ship to the Spirit A1 bomber costs 175. What, well, I mean, it depends what you're upgrading, but the Spirit itself <coughs> is 155. How are you upgrading something that costs 175? That doesn't make sense. Scam. Feature, so. I think this kind of pulled it back a bit, allowed us to really focus on both the content and the feature uh, at the same time, because it allowed us to bring it as under one umbrella, which is Squadron 42. So we were able to get that feature in the, in the game, not as a T0, but as a, a fully whole, capable gameplay experience that you know myself, Chris, we can play and enjoy it and go, is this right? Do we need to make it better? How does it feel? And also prove that out with the content that we want. So, I think he went to the, the school of Chris Roberts hand gesturing. That's why Chris Roberts likes him so much because he's mirroring him. He's going, I like what this guy's saying. Move it into the PU. Ultimately, it's not that they're going to get features later because they would have had them probably earlier, but just not, not ready. Or, you know, you can, I can pick a few features right now where you think, well, there's not really a huge purpose for them. Mounted guns is a good example. It's not really a huge purpose for them in the PU right now. But we're making sure that any feature that we work on has that purpose. So when it does go into the PU, you know, into the game, people can use it and experience it how we wanted it to be designed and how we wanted it to be, you know, because we, we struggle a few times, say, for example, actor status is a good example. We have this vision of how it, it sits across this broad spectrum of the game, but we're having to piecemeal it in. And that never really gives you the true intentions of where we want to go. And I think this allows us to do that in Squadron, really hone it down and then give it to the PU audience. And I think, they'll be, you know, fundamentally, it's better for the development of the features. I don't know. No, no, no update tomorrow to it. If they're going to show the leaked footage, yeah, then it's really basically it's going to be nine minutes yeah, of uh, before we were developing the sort of features things and happening. And it's cool. I think it's hype-worthy. Um, there's a couple of interesting ships you may be seeing. That's if they show what I think they're going to show. Uh, once they finish their hand gesturing and tell you how well everything's coming, they'll probably show it. Which is what Rich is talking about, to make sure it feels well and right with the time to to bake it in without having to feel like, oh, okay, we've got a quarterly release out. And because, you know, there's a lot that goes on with the quarterly release in terms of not, it's not just that one feature. There's all these other things that go into it. And there's a whole process of publishing and splitting off the streams. And so there's a huge amount of effort and work every time you do one of these releases that sort of eats into your development time in terms of doing the, 
the feature. Base price in the UK so upgrade list. Oh, okay, out, I guess. Out, yeah. Out With, that, you guys have VAT so included in the text. Well. Yeah. The squadron to really make it. Well, yeah, nine minutes, but not everyone's seeing that leak clip, right? Really so this is going to be new for a lot of people. We like playing it. This is fun. This is challenging. Um, it it feels it feels good. Uh, is is the benefit I think that's happening with us on Squadron? Well, we're seeing it on our side. I, I know it can be a bit frustrating for everyone on the other side because we're sort of telling you, oh yeah, it's going to be much better uh, than you've got right now. But we are very aware of a lot of say usability issues, um, uh, you know, user experience issues. Uh, that uh, we are addressing right now in Squadron, specifically for both Squadron and the PU that's going to... And we'll show you a couple of little things that will yeah. help with that today. But essentially, if you think of core gameplay in terms of, you know, we have some core areas, what we call the, you know, the sort of the actor system, which is would be the FPS, the, uh, you know, players moving around on foot, uh, you know, interacting with things, uh, the vehicle stuff, which you know, like John Crew heads up, but the you know the whole vehicle systems, and and you know you've already seen uh, some presentations mm -hmm. today on things that are very specific to vehicles, uh, you know, like the sort of need for multiple speeds, and uh, also the resource network, which is going to first roll out in vehicles, but it's going to be universal. Um, uh, you know, all those are sort of core gameplay systems that we have, and so what yeah, look, it's. It's now difficult to sit and, and really he's going to sit and explain. He's obviously very passionate about it, well. but there's many things that they've done wrong. One of them, I feel, is just the, the whole secrecy of Squadron 42 is that we can't show you too much because we know we're still working on it. They could have shown more. Uh, there's just way too many people who have just lost patience with it and going, you know what, it's taking so long. They're not showing anything and the whole thing, we don't want to spoil it. Um, but look, if... They show this clip at the end now. Let's see what the reaction to that. I, I think it's pretty good. I think it will please a lot of people what they see there. Um, but they do need to come up with a date. That would, you know, say we're aiming for this time next year. Like there's got to be something. We're ten years in. He's got to give us a bit more than that. And we're building this system to work well in all the ships used in, in Squadron, and then it will get rolled out to the PU, which has obviously much wider range ships. But as we're designing it, we're building it with both Squadron and the PU in mind. And so these, there's a lot of things, you know, people have talked about the star map forever. There's nothing wrong with what he's saying. You know, what he's saying is right. The thing is, we've heard it before. There's nothing he can say at this point we haven't heard at previous CISCONs, at previous Inside Star Citizens, at previous whatever live streams. He said this a thousand times before. We know it, he knows it. Uh, but you know, people want to hear it. Also, consider there's a lot of new people who've arrived in Star Citizen this past year who have never heard Chris Roberts speak before. This is new to them. So, you older backers, uh, the original backers, veteran backers, this is nothing new. He's going to sit there and he's going to explain how it all ties into the PU and what happens in the PU will seamlessly transition into Squadron 42. You know, uh, but consider there's a lot of new people in the game that have never heard any of this before. It's new for them. Yeah, we're pretty excited, so we wanted to yeah, visit you and talk a little bit about it. I think there is two common themes that I think you'll see throughout the entirety of this talk as well. One is the fact that it's, it's how we develop the features, that everybody looks at individual features and has got the microscope of that specific feature, but it's how they all interact together to create the game. Mm. So it's, it's about bringing them all together to create that gameplay experience. And number two is that none of these are like, oh, we're going to get to this in, in however time and you know, we're going to work on it there. All of the stuff that we'll talk about today is stuff that we're actively working on and not in the inception, but you know, we have in our hands. We can play it. We can see it. We're feedbacking on it. So it's something that you know, we're fairly advanced along and so you know, hopefully we'll be able to... That, that's the thing, Eduardo. The, the new little bloods little coming in now are not going to have to wait 10 years. You know? Maybe they just wait five years. <laughs> Some of the things we'll have aspects to show. Some What's up, Chrome Ninja? Aspects to show, uh, like the star map, like Chris just said and whatnot. Uh, some of the things uh, will be presented in test maps because we don't want to give away any star squadron for you. What, did you say test? Locations and stuff like that. That said, I think we can maybe show some stuff in Asiato because people have, have, have We already, have we already showed that at one yeah, location. Yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so yeah, you, you guys ready to, to this enough preamble? Let's go. Let, let's start with, uh, let, 
Rich, you're the, you're the, you, you, were, you were the AFT guy, now you're the whole squadron game guy. But let's start with something uh, that affects everybody. This is a first person universe, after all. Uh, let's talk about the F FPS radar and uh, the player interaction system stuff. What can, you, what can you tell us about how this has evolved? Well, it's interesting because we, we obviously, I think I've given a talk on FPS radar and scanning in the past. And I think the biggest thing that when we look at what, what Star Citizen is now, what's the first thing that you do? You know, you're in your bed. How do you interact with the game? How do you interact with the environment that's around you? Doors, getting into your ship, how do you interact with the Yeah, VR so, system? Manuel, well, you're right there. Squadron 42 and Star Citizen are the same thing. It's the same platform. And one reason why Squadron 42 is delayed and why Star Citizen is delayed because one thing changes the other. So right now, they've been speaking about before this about the flight speeds, right? So flight combat speed changes what happens in Squadron 42. In Squadron 42, if there was a mission to go shoot down someone, but now they've changed the speed of combat in Star Citizen, PU, Squadron 42 needs to be adjusted. Say, if this is how the speed ships work, how will this fit into our story narrative? And it's the problem. Having the single player game and the online game being developed simultaneously means each one is dependent on the other one and every, every small change happens on one affects the other one and I feel there's a constant back and forth with balancing, ship balancing, weapon balancing, shield, speeds, all this in the PU affects what happens in Squadron 42 as a single player game delays, right? Right and immersed, that you're immersed in it. Well, you can interact with things like the props uh, so yeah, Robot Boy, you are supposed to get the F-8 Lightning, which is the heavy fighter. Once you complete Squadron 42, you'll be this ace, highly decorated military person, and you get an F-8 that you can then use in the game. So that is what's been said. Whether it happens or not, well, it should happen. I mean, I think it's been said enough. If you say things enough, it's true. Streaming and and later on the server meshing is to have this fully persistent universe that, yeah, you can push the chairs around or that, that cup I could take off your desk and take to my, my spaceship instead of your spaceship, Jared. <laughs> and and it, would, it will be there and it will persist. So, so obviously interacting with things is a huge deal. Um, in Squadron, we have a huge amount of physical puzzles, mm. interactions um, in a level that you... I haven't seen in a lot of FPS games, so it's it's almost like a sort of story game and a puzzle game and a traversal game and a combat game and a stealth game. Yeah, so and Night Spies, Squadron 42 is a single player game. Uh, you arrive in this universe, there's Van Duel attacking an outpost, you join the military, uh, you learn how to fly a fighter, uh, you go on missions and you become a decorated war hero and you defeat the Van Duel or you fight them back and then the game ends and then you go into the PU where you continue uh, the story so that's well I don't know the exact plot of Squadron 42 I don't want to know it until the game comes out but uh, that's generally it those are by the way have been number of large complaints on the PU just getting in new person getting into the game like how do I get out of bed how do I do some basic yeah no lies Garrick Duval people are really retired waiting for this I think you know there's a lot of people it's almost like you know I don't know whether it's a from software thing where it's like oh I managed to beat the challenge of Star Citizen and I actually got to my ship. Um, but um, yeah, we need to make that better. And so that is actually one of, one of the big things we've been focusing on and the, the player interaction system. And by the way, these have been plans that have been around for quite a while. Absolutely. And uh, you know, Rich, back when he was in charge of sort of the core gameplay group, which was the AFT and the, the weapon um, teams and the actor tech team and stuff, um, that was on the list of things to do. It just you know, because of what we talked about, the release cadence in, in Star Citizen um, on the Alpha, it just, you know, didn't get to it yet. Well, we're getting to it now, and, and uh, you know, we're working on it. So, I, I mean... I mean, p part of it is basically removing the barrier. Yeah. So, removing the, the clunkiness, as Chris said, to, to how to you interact with the, in, you know, with the environment. So, what we've kind of gone to, we've gone to kind of this weighted system. <laughs> so, it's... Well, no, you, you joke, uh, or I'm a little... Like but look, people have left their assets in Star Citizen in wills that if something happens to me, my ships go to specific people, and it's it's happened. It it's already happened. Yeah, they want to interrupt the trolling. So if I'm looking at your desk, for example, you've got quite a lot of things that I could pick up and take and do whatever I want. But you want to be able to just walk over there and not have to go into a mouse cursor mode to be able to then select it. You should just be able to go. I want to look at the green ship. I'm going to pick up the green ship. I want to look at you know your little mini mini ship over there or the book or your coffee yeah yeah whatever. show us the video come on you just want to be able to go and look at those things 
press F and, and, and you, you need confidence that when you're looking mm. at something and you know we have the, the user interface to tell you that yes, this is the thing that you're gonna pick up. And you don't wanna have to go into this separate mode to be able to do that. So I think that's one of the fundamental things on the player interaction experience and that that's such a pervasive system across the entirety because it's the same when you're in a cockpit. In a cockpit or you're walking around or you're in EVA or you're crouched or you're prone or all the different environments that you're in. You need to be able to just effortlessly interact with the game world and you want it to just be, feel natural and immerse because you want to get involved in what you're doing in the gameplay, not have to fight the controls. And then on the other side of things, which is FPS radar and scanning, it's actually kind of being split into kind of a, a twofold. The first area is kind of what we're calling uh, kind of like a quick scan. This is something that, again, if you think of the Star Citizen universe, it's very detailed. You know, that's one of our strengths, that we, we're, we're detail at scale. And so you want to be able to go in and, and understand all the individual pieces that you can go in and go, I want to move that thing, or I want to go and get in a giant ship. But sometimes it's quite difficult to realize, OK, what is, what is environment, or what is interactive, or which bits are relevant to me. You know, for example, if you look at Uncharted, they have, you know, painted areas to show you where you need to go and where you, na you need to navigate. But you know, that's not Star Citizen. Star Citizen's built on realism and the reality of the world. So what we want to do is have kind of like the radar and scanning system where you can do this kind of like quick ping or quick scan wave, single button. And that is kind of just for your local environment. And everything will then be tagged as you look at it. So kind of think, you know, I look at the camera, it'll come out and it'll have a little box into a box. Hey, Dwyer, no, it's not this boring. Is the camera, this is the information. Remember, there's a lot of it's new like people who haven't seen this mini, before. Mini scan on the camera, but it's happening for everything around you. And you can just quickly look around and be like, oh, there's a cuttable surface there because I want to be able well, to I miss, they say they want to move the oh, uh, inner thought there, thing. They want to remove the press F. There's a terminal there that I can hack. And I'm getting that information. It's almost I was distracted. I was writing something. Did he say that? I can go. Okay, what are the ingredients that I have to play with as a player? Because I don't disagree with that. The thing to click two buttons to make one thing open, like clicking a door, should make the door open. You shouldn't have to go F, open, close door, uh, polish the door. Pinging out across wider areas. And that's where you're looking at, you know, individuals. You're getting, you know, you're getting, okay, there's two guys. No, Eduardo, I'm not disagreeing with you. I mean, for those of us who been around long enough, we've heard also before, there's nothing new here. And that's a bit more, because that's, so, that's more gameplay pervasive, that's something that's going to be more of a risk reward. So that's like, okay, I'm giving my location away, but they're also, so they may or may not you know, know that they've been <laughs> scanned. If it's a player, they absolutely will be. And that's all underpinned. <laughs> Ghost citizen, nice. We do for radio and scanning of the ships, as is FPS. So it's all systemic. It's not, we have to go in and they go, oh, it, it's this custom setup. So we have this kind of usability aspect for radar and scanning for people to be able to go in and understand. Well, on the topic of the inner thought thing, the, 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 in some motions, like if you walk towards a door, the expected reaction when you mouse over the area is open. There's no other thing you want the door to do. So there's no reason, I think, to push F and to select something. Like go up the door, mouse click, door opens. It's just one of the things. Uh, I think they can, I mean, it's just a mouse click, but when it comes to user interface, if anything is more than what's expected by the end user, it is a bit tedious. Uh, what's this first one we're going to look at? So the first one is more kind of um, showing what I described with radar scanning, that first aspect. So you're going into a space, you're doing a quick scan wave. Okay, I missed that. So yeah, I'm totally for that. Like inner thought doesn't have to pop up for everything. There's some things which do not need inner thought. Like if there's an object on the ground and you click over it, the expected reaction is pick it up so you not you know in a thought like hmm, what is this uh, this is obviously going in and utilizing some of our new building blocks UI for the doors and then here's a scan wave and you can see that, that I'm looking at that data pad and then it, you can move around and it's giving me that information so right now it's just giving you the basic high level information in terms of the names and things uh, but you will also have more detailed information depending on you know contextually what I like it is. And what you see here is part of the player interaction system. So you can just, even though that's kind of, of a complex area, oh, yes. you can interact with. Way better. But you're okay, it's taking them 10 years oh, cool, to get I to can, this. I can grab that or I can use the data Yeah, pad. mouse over, press and F. You, you're not having yes. to go into interact mode. You're not having to be driven by the cursor. You can go Beautiful. in and just yes. press F or interact with it. And you know, you've probably seen this in plenty of AAA games, but they don't have the detail. And Placing the down, okay. Review. So we want Perfect. to make sure that that system okay, this is robust is more exciting to me yeah. than the speed and I, and changes. I that, like, part of the idea is this as a quality of, yeah. The default action, which 
in this case is what you see. All right, so as far as quality of life goes, this is where it should be. Uh, so much better than the inner thought thing. You point an object, it says F to grab, F to close, F to place. Absolutely, perfect. I like, this is like, out of everything that's happened, <laughs> this is probably the best uh, quality of life change uh, they've announced yet. Which was basically saying that's a multi-action. So as you look at it, if, for instance, in that case, if you hit F, it does a default action. If you held F, it would bring up uh, the modular wheel yeah. that would show you the other actions so you could... Yeah, and you know, it's not a huge thing, the whole inner thought and the so wheel and everything, is, but every other game you play, it's just... You look at the object, you mouse over it, and it's F or E. Interact, pick up, throw. Uh, you know, it's one click. Uh, for Star Citizen to want to make it two clicks, I mean, that's double the clicks. It's happening here, so you can just look around and I can interact and interact without having to hold F, move your mouse around and all that. 10 years well spent. Uh, yeah, but look, you got to give them credit for the fact that they, they try. They go, how about this thing called Inner Thought? Let's try it out. And they gave it a shot. And they iterated and improved it. But also, there's so many things which they didn't have to try, iterate, and improve because it's been really tried and true. The inventory system. We've been using inventory systems like on Tarkov and everything else in MMOs for how many years now? They don't have to redesign an inventory system. It's pretty much clear what needs to be done in that already. So it's, it's curious that some very well-established and accepted practices in other games haven't automatically been adopted because they want to try iterate and improve. That's fine. But uh, at the end of the day, go back to tried and tested. You know, mouse over, one button, click to interact, done. It's the easiest thing. And I'm glad they're coming around to it at least 10 years later. We're changing the fact that we want everything to have a default action that essentially you go over, you press F, it always does that default action. But let's say you're harvesting harvest. Exactly. Keep it simple. That's it. You know, the default action is that it picks it up and puts it into your hand. But you want it to be always be to store into your backpack. You'll actually be able to go in there, you know, right click on the item, you know, when you're in interact mode, bring up the wheel, or like Chris says, hold F and just it will bring up the wheel. And that will and again this all ties into Squadron forty two. Um these are changes in the PU, and going, well, if this is the PU, then this is how it's going to be in Squadron 42. And now, if these changes are coming to Squadron 42, what has to change in that game to make this a viable... Okay, the ship speed's changed, it changes the entire levels of Squadron 42 for combat. Uh, the way you interact with objects, again, changes a whole bunch of stuff. So, uh, every change in the PU affects Squadron 42, vice versa, and uh, as much as... The idea of working on two games at the same time made sense. And it does make sense in many ways still. It does lead to a lot of delays for small issues like this. Yeah, yes. I, have to, I haven't seen this one. Uh, you want to set it up or you want to just go into playing it? We sure. Play it yeah, play it. So, I mean, I mean, the second one, essentially, what we're about to see is kind of what I talked about. This is the second half of radar scanning. So this is where they're still getting the environmental information, like whether you've got a vent or a terminal or a hacking area. Um, but you're also now getting information about the enemies and the AI and what's out there. So it's a wider and broader. Yeah, I mean, standard. this is where you basically, it's almost like whether it's X-ray vision or you can hear it. Yeah, art now the, the map, the star map is changing. On the other side um, the all, the, all the maps are changing, especially the way you interact with it. That's a big problem for a lot of people. All of us who've tried to get someplace, you can't click on anything. All that's changing. Uh, it required, um, they showed it, what they call the cards? Do they call them cards, the uh, holographic stuff that pops up? They're waiting for the new tech, which they've actually developed now, to be completed, and that's going to also replace the current star map. In Squadron, you know, we're, we're trying to have a certain amount of realism, so you're not just going to go and gun down 400 people. So we want you, when you're in situations, you're outnumbered and you have to... You know, it's it's more of a stealth game in the FPS than it is a straight out mm. run and gun shooter. Right. Right. Um, bring it to the point of realism, then bring it back to the point of fun, as you well, said. Well, you know, it's, there's a lot of fun stealth games. <laughs> All right, so I want to see this clip. I haven't seen it yet. Let's, let's roll FPS too. So what you're seeing here is that he's going to do a scan wave in a moment. Mm. Essentially, what you'll see is that it's now penetrating through the walls. Yeah, I need lots of coffee here. See uh, the slavers that are in this environment. Now, these slavers don't necessarily have a radar scanner, so they're not able to pick you up. So what will happen is when you do a scan wave or a charge scan wave, your signatures will basically um, skyrocket. So that's what will give you away to other people. So in the PvP environment, you're only getting, you know, it's, it's a big risk. You d if you want to do it, but you're giving away your location. 
So if, you know, if you're willing to do that, then so be it. But in a more of a PVE environment, what we're going to do is we're going to have tailored. Some, some enemies will have radar and scanning, and some won't. So if they do, then they'll be like, hey, I've just been pinged, and they'll get your location, and then they'll go and investigate. So what you're seeing here you know, on that video is kind Kay. of you know, a more a wider, broader area and seeing through the walls, whereas the first one is kind of a more limited. Giving vibes from the aliens where you're, you're pinging the aliens coming towards you. To the first one is really more about just, you know, we want to encourage the player to go into an environment. And go, yeah, they're totally taking uh, cyberpunk stuff here. I like it. And then the second one is more of the wide escape, like uh, said, you know, when we're playing our stealth levels, you know, you need to have kind of a good understanding of where they are. And it's only temporary. And you, you will have a cooldown on that on that charge scan wave. So you're not just going to be able to spam it there forever. It's like you get a temporary picture and you go, cool, I've got a good snapshot. Now I'm going to you know, make my move and go forward. So while we're still here on the first person experience, the player experience, let's, let's, let's stick to a couple more topics that are related sure. just to the, 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 the player before we move into ships and bigger stuff. Um, ledges and ladders. Uh, you know, everybody knows the the struggles Come of on, the show us the good stuff. The universe, but Ladders. that's not the only way to you know traverse the universe to get around and stuff. Uh, I understand that you guys have made a number of improvements to mantling over ledges and how to use ladders. I mean, ledges and ladders is kind of uh, the best game so, I ever played. Like a board game. Yeah, exactly. oh, that scan's been used uh, in a couple of games. It's kind of two features that we're focusing on. But I mean, as Chris said in terms of squadron development. I think No Man's Sky is a scan feature like that. Which are, yeah, how that's right. Yeah. Sensors. And, you know, just from general locomotion and how that feels. And then in terms of, you know, the traversal moves of so vaulting, mantling, ladders, and so on and so forth. So one of the two areas that we've identified that we wanted to push for was A for ledges, which is we wanted you to be able to, oh, I've just, I've slightly misjudged my jump because I'm in first person, you know, I can't see my feet. And, I, and it's, you know, it's kind of frustrating. You're like, oh, it's just right there. If this was real life, I, I'd just put my hands out and grab it, right? That's right. So that's the Creed. first part that we can actually no Man's grab Sky. onto ledges now that you're falling past so that you can actually then pull yourself up, uh, which adds just... It's, it's almost as if the scan thing is good in other games, yeah. Levels now, and it's, it's, the difference is night and day because when you're in a first person, it's very difficult to judge like right on the edge. So we can add a bit more challenge to the traversal so that you're actually moving around with ledges and grabbing and pulling yourself up. And then the other side of things, which doesn't necessarily sound that interesting in terms of, oh, it's improved ladders. But again, is if you play the star system right now, you get onto a ladder, you're, you're looking bolt straight forward at the wall, you're locked, you can't look around, you have no spatial awareness. It's just, that's it, you're locked in. You can't get off halfway, you can't jump off. It's, you're kind of very locked. So you what can't we've done? Jump on halfway too. No, no, exactly. So what we did is we kind of leveraged how we w did body dragging, and that you know, even though you're attached to this thing, you want to be able to look around. So you can attach to the ladder. You can jump onto a ladder directly. You can attach. You can run uh, and jump onto a ladder. You can look around full 360 degrees. You can look around 90 degrees as you're going up. Okay, so they've put you know, a lot of thought into how you're going to climb ladders, all right? A lot more. You know, it doesn't feel like oh, I've just now I'm locked in. It just feels like you're more of a human being on the ladder and you can look around. And then, obviously, if you can look behind you on a ladder, that opens up environment, you know, opens up scope to jumping yeah. from that onto something else. So it's yeah, because you can jump off the ladder halfway up it or wherever. Exactly. So there's a, there's a huge amount of, I mean, with, in Squadron, we're putting a lot of traversal gameplay in, uh, which will uh, make its way into the PU when all these sort of systems settle. And well, sounds like, yeah, ladder's a lot more uh, flexible now. Yeah, jumping off a ladder mid midway. I wouldn't be opposed to them slipping you into third person for ladders. Because first person's a bit uh, close, visually. Even that, the derelicts was really inspired by some of the early work we were doing in Squadron. It's like um, Fallout 76 does this when you pull out power armor in Fallout 76 and you get into your power armor. It goes into third person view for you to jump in. Um, so I'm not opposed to that kind of mechanic where you grab a ladder, it puts you into third person and then slides you back into first person once you get off the ladder, just to give you an idea of your surroundings. In most of the areas that you go through, there's more than one way yep. to get to the end to solve the problem to, you know, do you, you know, stealth around, you just take it on head on and start shooting or, um, is a way that you can, you know, do it without seeing anyone because you've just you know, taking this difficult traversal path. So those are all things that are important. And, and so it's little 
little things like this, and, and I would say, I mean, we've got a video to show, but we're still, you know, like some of the finesse of the the animation detail is still to come. So this a lot of it is yeah, this is uh, a lot of is the block, block out. out. But yeah, you know, we you know, we we have this beautiful motion capture stage here that we will show you guys at uh, some point when M the Manchester Good Yards and this stage are fully finished. And then Jared will do a wonderful, we'll do a, a updated version of the 2013 tour that I did with Erin, uh, but it will be in a much uh, bigger environment. <laughs> um, anyway, uh, so, uh, but I, I, I would say definitely that um, I mean, we could show up, but the, the, we got details to come. Like, for instance, if you jump and you just make it, you know, you're going to, uh, you know, catch your balance and do that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. So that's not in here, but that's sort of the details, the finesse that we're adding to really have that sense of you in first person okay. feeling. Okay, and squared and 42, and let's go. Up and, 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 and down on it. I mean, if you cut out to the third person when you see some of the stuff, you sort of see some of it even in the block out animations, but there'll be much more in the, the final version. But we probably should yeah, let's, run the let's video yeah. if we can. All right, uh, ladders. So obviously this, as you can see, this is final art. It's absolutely. So this is great. taken directly from Squadron Foot to know. It's obviously a test map. But you can see here that, as Chris said, it, it, the, the, you know, the level of inertia is, is still block out phase, but you can see that we're actually starting to get that you can grab on, you can go straight into a mantle or a vault, you can go straight into the pull-ups. And the thing is that what you're seeing here is, you know, while this is just an in test map, a lot of these are providing design ethos to then feed into the PU. So if we've got derelicts and we've got environments that we want the player to go and do missions in, we don't just necessarily just have to rely on you've only got jump. Or you only can do vault and mantle. And right okay. there we did a we did a Yeah, so parkour definitely improving. Uh, again, there's games which have been doing this, but keep in mind that to do this from scratch themselves. So it's it's quite an accomplishment. Um, it's a long journey that, to get to this point. I can appreciate the effort, uh, but it's like not groundbreaking compared to what other games have already done. Assassin's Creed being one, right? I think the climbing, jumping mechanics, Assassin's Creed are pretty good. But also keep in mind this is a uh, it's the PU. This is not a um, solo game, so there are more complications. Uh, that looks pretty good. Yeah, I mean, the other thing yeah. to say about, uh, about the traversal is while we're highlighting uh, ladders and the ledge grabs, the, edge, here, yeah. the other thing is that we're also, you know, we've taken deep dive on things like the control input. So, for example, we've got action queuing coming up. So, you know, for example, if you're sprinting, and you were, you were shooting just before you're sprinting, you might be holding down shift and left mouse button. And then now, what happens now, if you then release shift, you've stopped shooting. But sometimes you want, to, you want it to continue shooting because I'm still holding the, the input that I want to do, and what we're kind of terminology in terms of this action queuing. And that's something that we've, we've got a whole matrix of all the different controls, all the different methods from Chrome to Prouch, mm -hmm. the transitions, you know, weapon swapping, and so that just you mm, again using the controls is a lot more fluid. Just to saying this makes a difference in the caves, absolutely. Uh, the, the next iteration of the caves they've shown us a bit of already, uh, much bigger. I, I'm not a fan of the current cave system. I hate it actually. Uh, even like the prison system, I hate because of the claustrophobic caves. Uh, I just don't like them. I don't think there's anything interesting about it, but the new iteration of the caves, the big wide open ones with more spaces, uh, definitely a lot more interesting. And the system does slot right in with that uh, ability to jump off rocks and crevices and yeah. So I think uh, new caves plus this, more interesting game loops. I avoid every single mission there are in caves because of it, but uh, this could change that. Clunkier than it should be. Uh, and so we've really taken a deep dive on all of it, yeah. and uh, to make everything a lot more fluid. The, you know, looking around on the ladder is a good example. Um, but also, you know, like on a bigger level, right? We've done a complete rework on, um, like, you know, EVA, what we call sort of push and pull. Uh, there's, you know, physical interaction. Uh, I mean, we should probably talk a little bit about that. We have a video to show of that, but it's a complete redo of the current EVA system, uh, and it's has a lot more of the, what you would expect when you're in 
in space, in vacuum, pushing yourself off. You don't, for instance, you have momentum now. So if you push off in a direction, you will just mm -hmm. keep moving in a direction. Uh, the use of it's far more easy. Yeah. Handling weapons and looking around. And some of the tech that we've developed for the push pull is the same stuff that will be that we're going to be using for prone and a bunch of other stuff. And and really, the looking around on the ladders is kind of based on some. Of the yeah, I mean, stuff. to be honest, a lot of those systems are. I and mean, when say Chris says push pull, he means zero g push pull, yeah, not yeah. trolley push pull. Um, but we'll talk uh, about that too. Yes, we will. But when we talk about uh, EVAT2 and zero G. Yeah, okay, so they, they can't do that. They can't tease and say something good's coming and then spend an hour talking about trolley push pull and clatters. I mean, yes, this is important gameplay <laughs> mechanics, but you can't tease something good is coming up and then spend the next hour talking about uh, parkour in space. Come on. Understand the perspective of where you were in. It's like, oh, I'm now upside down. So, so as far as VR goes, there, uh, who is the name? It's not dropped off. There is one. There are one or two devs there which are very excited about the VR possibilities of it. And you see, in everything they do, it is, I don't say VR friendly, but in the way that your character reacts with uh, items in the game that everything can be touched it's not a stretch for them to take that and make that into vr eventually but to make things or to focus on vr right now i don't feel it's right i mean i'm a huge vr fan uh you know always have the latest oculus or meta device with me all the time but um it'll come around when it's ready but i, I don't think vr is enough of a uh demographic to make it worth their while right now it's not actually it's not the vr demographic itself is very small so for them to spend uh focus on vr right now it's not worth their while and it's something which may come across in the future maybe do the curve but it just made traversing more intricate spaces which is what we want to do you know eventually we want to be able to turn gravity off in ships and that you can take those down and well, and it, it's definitely, I mean, that's part of the plan. I mean, we Absolutely. even, you know, in the resource network um, uh, so segment, that's one of the things. So all, all of those tight, intricate areas that we've built over the last seven, eight, well, ten years now, I suppose, um, you know, that you can go into those tight areas, you need it to be stable. You need it to be in a position where you can turn on a dime, that you can look upside down, that you, you get a good sense of, what, you know, your orientation. And I think that's something that we've really pushed ahead on EVAT2, and, and to be honest, the engineering team have done a really fantastic job. I, I find it a lot of fun. Yeah, but on the topic of VR, I mean, it does... Nothing comes close to the VR experience in Elite Dangerous as far as space sims go. If you guys haven't tried it and you do have the ability to, try Elite Dangerous in VR. It's spectacular. Just the, the, the size of the... Sh when you're in the ship and look around the cockpit, or when you're coming down to land, the sense of uh, size of proximity of things around you it makes so much difference uh so the hope is yeah one day they do add vr to star citizen i mean no one hold your breath for it but uh the way the game's been designed with the physicalized assets and physicalized buttons that uh, you know if you do reach out and touch something in the game you are touching and it should do something uh, and that ties in with what they showed us with the new uh, instead of the inner thought you know just mouse over and press f that is vr friendly much friendlier than inner thought so yeah, it's still it's in the back burner, but again, yeah, soon. Um, so if you you know if you do I don't know a boarding action or something, maybe you need a, a you know a space suit that has the EVA. Now look, Braben, they've done Elite Dangerous did well. Braben did very well with Elite Dangerous. They got it out quick. The game I feel was good, uh, but obviously limited by its engine and what it can do. Uh, but as far as games go, Elite Dangerous was a success. Can it be a success going forward? I think it's very challenging just because of what Star Citizen and new games are offering now. But Elite Dangerous, I think, uh, did very well as a released game. They've made good money from it, I think. I haven't checked the financials. And uh, I think David Braben can uh, put that behind him and go, yeah, I did what I went out to do and it was good. On, or uh, you know, you come into a city, you shouldn't be wandering around in heavy armor because that's antisocial. Maybe they don't let you go in there. So we want people to have reasons to 
uh, wear different things, uh, have storage. That's the whole point of the physical uh, inventory system. And as we're starting to roll out, more of it's coming in in Squadron. And then in the PU, that's definitely coming online. Uh, and you know things that we're doing like that with the you know the physicalized cargo and everything else. And if you look at all the new ships, there's always locker and storage. There's, there's you know we have a whole system for um, outfits now mm. that we was first yep. going to be in. Okay, that's good. There's an outfit system, so you can uh, click a button and it puts on your favorite jeans and shoes. Uh, but that was also a question I had. Uh, what's the point of having all these lockers and stuff in your ship when, if you just run around in heavy armor all the time? And he said there's some places you might not be able to go in heavy armor. There's some stores, there'll be some landing zones where heavy armor is not permitted and you have to change to casual wear. So I like it. I like it. And, you know, EVA is one of the minor parts of that where, like I said, you, you either have an EVA suit with a pack or not, but you still will be able to yeah, Star Citizen is perfect for VR. I mean, it is VR ready in a sense that uh, what you see in front of you is actually your eyes, right? And that it, it's sized correctly. Oh, look at this. Look at the EVA here. Cool. You'll probably see some of it in the third person. The thrusters are not firing because yeah, it's the old VFX. It's also the old VFX code. So we haven't part of the proper. This is the a current PU suit versus what we'll have is a new one with the proper like pack that has the thrusters in the right position and when you go forward the thrusters going from the back. So what you're actually seeing here is you've, you've actually connected to this surface. So now it's almost like you're in a prone situation but this is going to be what more, what more our new prone will be. Again you've got full 360 degrees, you can just move your mouse and you look all the way behind and, you or all the way in front. And right now we're moving along here not because we're thrusting, because we're using our hands exactly to move ourselves along, and we're looking around as we're doing that. If we went out to the third person here, you would sort of see us moving our hands around. I think we'll see it a little later on. There we go. Here we go. So we're just sort of pulling ourselves along, and if we wanted to at this point, we could stop and we could push off against it, and then we would just go floating out. So this push-pull system has been discussed for years already. There was a, a short clip from like a Squadron 402 teaser from two years ago, or three. Yeah, where you showed this kind of movement so on, so here, this has been in the back burner um, for I don't know how long. Kind of, you're just floating alongside the actual, um, this fin of this uh, Asiata station, and this is actually keeping you in this orbit, and then if you did, and that's just, you just push forward and go, where you can actually jump off into space, but then this becomes... Yeah, you know, if this does, well, yeah, so if frame rates on VR, definitely, you need 90 frames per eye at minimum, and uh, we, it would have been impossible, years ago but now if you look at the current uh, generation of gpus coming out not that out of the question you know the 4000 and by the time this game comes out the 5000 series uh in video cards you'll be doing 90 frames per eye easily right yeah here's here's i mean we were before in first person looking around but here's us cutting out the third person to actually show you what your your character and body's doing and so there's a lot of i mean and these are still okay so animations actually, look that that's cool i think it's like, uh they've worked hard on this and they want to show it off yeah, i get you it have, you have a lot i think more, it's something most people will uh, just control, not really think about too much uh, once we're in the game though you know, directional sense it just makes uh, sense to float through to space around, like that like superman style stuff. right uh, so i think you know in this one we're going to come up close to the glass above it yes and you're actually going to see us like if you fly into something you sort of arrest, just again, block out animation, but you're gonna, as we get down close to it, I think we're gonna come yeah, down, you'll the see. Kid, the wife's uh, taking the kids as, off for breakfast. Uh, uh, our character comes down here, our player comes down here, yep. Uh, put our hands out to brace ourselves to stop ourselves on the glass here. Uh, so all of that's like systemic, it's, that's, not, that's not marked up or anything, it's all ray casting, seeing of things, you brace yourself when you come up against, hold on, arrest your thing, you can push off against things. So we've spent a fair amount of time in engineering on all this, but it, it's not just for Squadron. It's going to be, you know, it's obviously useful in some of the environments of Squadron. This is one of it's, them. yeah, so stuff like this. I mean, I, I'm not on the software side of things, but I can appreciate this has taken them a while to get to this point, to just make it look natural, right? And also the big thing that Chris said there is it's systemic. There's no markup. If you want to go and climb all over a ship, you can do. If you want to climb over a space station, you can do. If you want to climb over a, anything that's in EVA, mm. has a surface, you can and you can put your hands on it. It's got a big enough space to put your hands on it. 
it will work. So there's, not, there's, no, there's no like, oh, it only works in this scenario, or it only works in this scenario. It's, it is what you see here. And then as what, what we've not been able to show today, which is we had, do have working or partially working, is that when you go into very tight environments, if there are handholds, you will be able to grab onto that handhold, or whether it's a terminal, or whether it's you know a hatch to get into a ship, you'll grab onto the handhold, and then you know instead of putting your hands out and landing, you'll grab on, and then you go, cool, I can use the terminal, or I can look around, and again, you're not locked in, you can look all 360 degrees, you'll switch hands as you look around, and you can get a sense of, okay, where do I wanna go next? I wanna go over there, cool, or I wanna go through this door, and it, and it works in tight environments, wide-scale environments, and fundamentally, it's a lot, lot nicer to play than our current version, which is just, is no. It's, I mean, it's it's massive for the game. So I'm, you know, I think there'll be a lot more sort of EVA external action. Yeah. Uh, the combat's better. It's more, much more stable. Uh, I think you know we'll see a lot of puzzles and traversal in the PU that can be built from that because we don't okay. really we have a lot of stuff down on planets, but it would also be nice to have more like exploring a you know more the, the sort of derelict asteroid bases yeah. kind of things and EVA, uh, I think, you know, we all love science fiction. So you're making these kind of games um, that, you know, that's, Show that's us the of good a lot stuff. of classic sci-fi that you see. So we, we spent, you know, that's, that, that is a, that's an example of <laughs> us being able to spend the time mm. to really think about how we want yeah, to the, how best it's going to work. For uh, fidelity uh, reasons, you do want a space giant in there. They were talking about that, well, jokingly, that everyone drops the stuff around them. Maybe there should be a mission to clean up around space stations. And every time you put stuff into the trash can, you get money. All the discarded hospital robes. Every time you put one in a trash can, you get like 100 UECs. This unlocks content for the people. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I purposely... Look, these two guys can talk for 10 hours on... Uh, Crawling on your hands and knees systematically or whatever. Yeah. Bender on a Friday night at the Oust House. Like, that looks just like. Come on, Jared. Wrap it up. Let's go. Crawling around. Sorry. Sorry, Steve. But no, it looks great. And I think everybody who saw that now is going to see the potential, the, the absolute gameplay potential for all kinds of zero, zero G gameplay possibilities. That yeah. is really, yeah. really no, that, cool. That's great. I mean, there's, 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 some other, I mean, there's some smaller things like we have. Zero G gameplay. Where's Sata Ball? <laughs> Who remembers you know, Sata Ball? As big as a system as, like, say, the EVA replacement, but, like, the hover trolley mm. that we've got. Uh, I know that I saw it. I really Reddit. like the hover trolley. Yeah, no, I, li I like <laughs> I really it a lot. Like I saw it. the Reddit thread saying, why didn't someone do a hover trolley? Well, actually, that was something we've been working on for quite a while. Uh, but... The thing I will, we, we, can sh we can show you here in, in, in a few minutes, but the thing that's really good about this, because you know, obviously the physical trolleys, the wheels get caught, I mean, just like in the real yeah. world, right? Uh, and you've got problems of going upstairs and all the rest of the stuff, just like you would in the real world. Yeah, I, I agree. I think this game has good potential, you know. Uh, once they iron out all the small issues, it sounds like it might be fun to play in about 10 years. <laughs> Santa Ball was another one of those, uh, you know, you know it was an idea and uh, basically didn't pan out. We originally had this design where there was sort of a grav lab system where, yeah, you, you stuck in this thing and the grav lab, it would come up and then, you know, now you can push around, you know, a huge container. And we're moving for physicalized cargo. Uh, it's going to be in 318. Um, I think Tony's trying to squeeze a few things in. We'll see if he manages to get everything in. But um, this isn't necessarily going to be in 318, but it will come in probably in, you know, not too far in the, in the near future. But this allows you to not you know, just have your little tractor beam and pick up something and move it around, but you know, okay, let's have a bigger container. And what happens if you, okay, turn it on, up it goes, come and then you just push it into your cargo so hole, the turn it off, locks into the cargo grid. And now that cargo container, imagine a bigger one. Well, you know, what happens, you know, like right now in the inventory system, you can put things in your, you know, local inventory of your ship or, um, you know, other various inventories. Well, imagine come your I'm container, gonna, say I'm one of take these a bigger, bio like break. maybe a 16 SC you and want come or back whatever, still be on the topic. sitting there and now I can place, I don't know, large vehicle um, items in it. I can place all sorts of stuff in it. So I could load up this container, I could push it into my ship, then I could fly it off to some remote planet and put it next to, you know, 
where I'm camping out or longer term where you say maybe a player base or some group of players with persistent decide to take over a derelict or something. And I can like basically load up a bunch of supplies in a, in a container, like bigger supplies or weapons or armor suits or whatever and put it in there just by doing this. So, so it, I think you know, the underlying sort of hover tech for the trolley stuff is really good because it, it will really play into the, the cargo and the logistics that are going to come with that because longer term with persistence of what we're doing, I think there's going to be a whole bunch of gameplay that will be re revolved around the logistics of, of living, right? Mm -hmm. Like how do, I, how do I have my food? How do I have my drinks? How do I have my raw materials? How do I have my weapons? Uh, you know, if two orgs are fighting a war over a patch of land, someone's got to show up with extra you know, <laughs> ammo and missiles and you know, all that kind of stuff and or weapon replacement, especially as we get repairing and the salvaging and stuff, you know, okay, well, rather than have to fly it to a place that can do your repair, maybe there's an on field repair that's happening right there and someone's changing out a broken weapon for another weapon because you've loaded it up and stored it in. in what I missed, the show it? Container. So I, there, there's the possibilities in the PU is huge and this is an example of just little bits of tech that we're <laughs> putting into Squadron that we're planning on bringing it across. Into the, the UK. Okay, so the persistent uh, entity uh, stream is always talking about. Yeah. I, I pick up the comb for my ship and I drop it on a rock on a moon on some random moon in Pyro and I come back in five years' time and it's still there, right? Which is, you know, I can move things around and that allows me to create, you know, traverse opportunities for me if I'm blocked. I can move a box over here and oh, I can get up higher yeah. now, which is kind of what the more physical trolleys are kind of better suited for. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is another example where we kind of put trolleys into the <laughs> PU, but there wasn't really a... <laughs> you log cats right. Chris Roberts had a dream about 15 years ago, and the dream was that he could have a coffee cup on his ship and then he could go to a random moon in some far star system and put the coffee cup down on a rock. And from that day, he worked to achieve this goal. Maybe there'll be a game around it. Maybe there'll be some shooting, some fighting, some mining, maybe bounty hunting. But the most important thing <laughs> is that that cup persists. All right. Physical trolley, which is taken into account. Hover trolleys, you don't have to worry about that because, you know, let's play the video. Let's see the video. Let's the video. Let's the video. We've hyped this up now. Hover trolleys are the most amazing thing in the world. Here we go. Oh, hover trolley. Yes, let's do it. So you can see here, this is actually a slaver pod. So it closes down. It's on the floor. Oh, Star Wars. Levitates up now. This is total Star Wars, yes. Get hold of it. Bam. Knowing the thought. Awesome. The new interaction system is not working in this demo here. Nice. So yeah, this is bounty hunter stuff. I like it. Bulkheads. Bulkheads. But this is essentially a, a really big improvement for us because we want, you know, we want physical cargo, and we, we, we want physical cargo to be a really a big deal in the PU that you have to move that cargo, you have to make decisions on how long it's going to take you to load it up, not just buy it from a kiosk. So this is cool. Not because it's hovering, because uh, I'm, I'm excited for the bounty hunter type game loop where I get to use my um, hawk. And, uh, well, the hawk doesn't have a place for a pod. I guess it's the Cutlass Blue that does, but uh, capturing, apprehending your target, you know, transporting them to where they need to be, getting paid. That, that's the kind of game loop I like, like very Mandalorian type feel. I like that. He's going to drop in the Cutlass. Yeah, so this I like. I mean, this isn't impressive much, but I like this idea of this game loop. This excites me. Whatever we do eventually. And I've actually, we've actually had this working on a planet. So you can just push this over planet terrain. You don't let go. You stay stable. Because uh, it, it doesn't actually undulate uh, unless, there's, unless there's something actually physically touching it. So it allows it to be much more stable. And what we want to do for your uh, cargo loading is that will use a system similar to the cargo grid that you'll be able to snap things on top of it. So when you, if you have a flat platform, you'll be able to snap cargo boxes onto it so they won't fall off. And then you'll be able to you know, reliably move them I like it. without frustration. And again, you can see some of our design ethos coming through is that we're trying to... So what we can tell from this is basically a game loop. Will, so the mission will be transport cargo. The cargo is this. Uh, from point A to point B, you get attacked along the way from this person's friends who want to try to rescue him. Uh, you have to deliver him to a place. So that's a, a game loop we can expect. 
related to the player, to the first person and stuff like this. And we've got a couple more we're going to come back to later. But let's move up into spaceships. Yep. Because spaceships are, 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 are a big part of the experience. Our heroes. Um, we, we just had a, uh, earlier in the day, we had our flight experience uh, a segment where they talked about master modes and quantum boosts and stuff like this. Um, but at a higher level and stuff, let's talk about how the flight experience is changing a bit through the work in Squadron 42 and anything you want to share with us on that. I think the biggest thing for me, and I think it's what we've, Chris and I have talked about, is the difficulty of developing a game over a period of time when it's a live product is that you're developing things in isolation and you're putting them out. So you're going, okay, this is our T0, you know, this is MFDs. And okay, well now we want to do the flight HUD. And we put the flight HUD. And now we want to do this section. And what happens is maybe it's a different designer over the years, or maybe it's someone else, or maybe they've, they've learned from what's happened or gone out previously. And lots of things come together, but they don't necessarily feel right. Because they've not been approached. None of the small vehicles, Garrick Duval, I guess the Ursa rover, the rovers can probably fit something in, but uh, maybe the mule, you can stick on the roof of the mule. <laughs> right. And everything together and go, well, actually, we don't need all that information on the HUD if we've got it on the NFDs. Or we don't need all the information here if we've got physical switches. And it's allowed us to approach the design of the cockpit experience holistically so that we can go, OK, let's pull all this noise away that, because we've tried to fit everything onto the HUD. We've tried to put everything on there. You know, you need to know your G-forces and your heading direction. And, and you know, I need to know my ammo. And, and you know, master modes is a good way of going down that road. It's kind of going, OK, we want to have traversal and we want to have combat. So if you've got SCN, combat. If you're in QCM, you're in quantum mode. So that's traversal and flight. And then we've taken that approach and gone, OK, well, do you always need an altimeter? Well, no, maybe not if you're, if you're in space. Maybe you only need an altimeter when you go down to, to atmosphere. You know, your MFDs, if you're in SCN, what do you really care about? Well, you care about your health, your weapons, your target's health how they're doing, but as a default experience, we're only giving you the information that is needed to you at that <laughs> point board. in time. And what we actually saw is that you're well, no, around. Uh, We've got gorgeous It's always good to get them talking, right? I want to be able to look at yeah, them. I don't want, want to... You want to, want to see the ship that you're, yeah. you're fighting. You want to see the environment you're flying around in. Mean, yeah, I, I, mean, I mean, one of the big things that were the big initiative on the, the vehicle side for Squadron is the sort of complete redo of uh, the HUD and the MFD systems and basically the display where we're, we're first of all, we, we have to refactor it to move away from some of the old flash that's been around right. forever, which is what the MFD displays. Um, and uh, on the HUD, we sort of took a look at where we were going and felt like, like Rich said, it's just too much stuff's there all the time. Well, what we want to, we want to be more contextual. So yeah, and we're doing this in a overall holistic way that would be probably almost impossible if you were trying to fit it mm. into quarterly releases in in the PU. So, you know, most of the vehicle team is working on this as as a sort of group. Uh, you know, in the need for s multiple speeds that we saw earlier, you sort of saw some aspects of it, which is the, the different modes you can be in depending on what yeah. you're trying to do. Uh, but, uh, you know, a lot of that's also reflected on the HUD and the information of what you're targeting and whether you can, you know, whether you want to be able to cast up, say, your target uh, status or your ship status to your visor. Now, that won't be the case for everything. Uh, every suit, like, for instance, if you have a more combat-oriented ship or suit that you would wear, you know, like a, you know, I don't know, a Gladius or a, a Hornet, uh, and you've got the appropriate equipment, then you should be able to cast if you're just flying a, a, an old rust bucket, like an Aurora. Well, what was the Drake ship we saw the other day? When we were looking at it, saying it, all the HUD was on there, we were like, well, it's kind of the equivalent of a lorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, you know, it was a caterpillar. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, the, you wouldn't have the caterpillar, you know, you wouldn't cast it up to your visor like you would as a fighter pilot. It would be sitting down on the, right. on the MFDs. But in the cases that you have the ability to cast it and do stuff, in all the ships are also building in the ability, like there's a not just a game config screen in your ship. Mm. You go in, you have your like settings screen, and the settings will be remembered on a per ship basis. And you can set up what, you know, okay, I want this display to be this, or this display this, I want this to cast here. And so um, so it's all been built about building blocks and being um, in a very sort of top-down, one-system, clean. clean approach. 
Uh, so we're pretty excited by that. We're not mm. ready to show it uh, yet because we're still in the, the sort of early, you know, we foundational stage. Yeah, we, there's, it's a little further before it's all fully polished or ready to show, but it, it's going to be, I think, a pretty sea change in terms of how it feels as you're flying around besides the different uh, modes of, 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 you know, combat and traversal and all the rest of stuff. It's, it's how you get the information and, and how it's relayed to you is, is going to be much more contextual, much better. Uh, and I, I and think it's huge in combat. It's, big, yeah. it's huge in combat because in combat right now, you're either, you know, we're obviously trying to bring the combat closer, which mm -hmm. is obviously what the Yogi and the guys and Dave talked about in their talk. Um, but you don't want to be, you don't want to have a little clutter on there and you want to have that spatial awareness of, okay, who, who's my target? And the other aspect is that on that level of, you know, again, a holistic approach is your player uh, information is only on there if it's relevant. And also the targeting we've talked about redoing in terms of right now, if you go into the PU or yeah. you play squadron level. With 100 players in yeah, there. You just the get hundred player battle, billions yeah, yeah. of markers and it's like, a, it's just a massive information overload. You know, and some and it players- was It was definitely a problem in squadron. Yeah, we have absolutely. Quite a few areas of the game where there's massive amounts of ships yeah and, and you know some players can deal with it but you know it's just so much information it's just it's it's, it's unnecessary so what we've done is that we've again we want to strip back the targeting so that again <laughs> so anything happened yet <laughs> that are important to well you. look so, what they're talking you know, about is good but again on all these markers and we want to put more of a focus on your your radar in the cockpit i think we've heard most of this before it's uh, this is mostly for the new backers they need to hear this kind of stuff in world ar markers oh, 20 guys coming over there you know we, we want to make sure that you've got the information that you need, but also we want to basically make sure that you're using the tools that we provide. Because what's, what's happening right now is that everybody's just reliant on the HUD. Because yeah. the HUD has everything on there. But you've got MFDs, you've got a cockpit radar. You know, we want to, they're there for a reason. So what's happened over the years is that we've tried to put, we've redone them at separate times. And then, you know, the MFDs are still in flash and we've done the building block. So we've kind of got into this cycle of trying to, oh no, this is it, this is where the player should be. And what we want to do is we go go back to kind of what Chris's original vision in terms of well, there's an in-cockpit radar, you should use that. There's in-cockpit MFDs, you should use those. Okay, now I'm in this specific combat mode. Okay, they're, they're, they're cast, so I can see that information. But the radar doesn't become redundant. That should be the that should be what the noise is on. That's where the, all the information should be. Okay, I should be able to go in there and select targets. Get that information should be clean and delivered to me. But out in the world. I want to look what's there. I want to look at my target. I want to look what I'm saying. Oh, there's a space station. Oh, there's another guy coming in. So we want to have less reliance on just AR markers for everything and only reliance on marking the things that are important to you or you directly marked yourself. Yeah. And I think when you, when you fight combat experiences where you're fighting 20 shit. I haven't been on Spectrum in a while. It's still bad. I mean, it's a tough job on the, the forums. Uh, I, I like that. <laughs> what I think is hilarious is that uh, they say how Squadron uh, Star Citizen fans, like you're all fanboys, everyone's a white knight. The people who say that have never been on Spectrum. Spectrum is nothing but salt. Spectrum is nothing but complaining all day, every day about every small thing in the game. Uh, so every time some journalists write, you know, how Star Citizen fans are white knights and, you know, the Chris Robert Simps like, dude. Go into Spectrum for 10 minutes and see what the community is saying there. Uh, look, there's a lot of negativity, but also on Spectrum. I mean, it is the first stop for a lot of people. And uh, when new patches drop and things are good, there's nothing but celebrations in there also. Uh, but it's also, when, anytime there's something to complain about, you go to Spectrum to complain because that's the official forums. And in a game this buggy, yeah, there's tons of stuff to complain about. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to bash Spectrum. And I know Knight Rider, who works very hard to keep the place clean, works hard there to, to make it what it should be. And it should be like, you know, a friendly uh, and positive experience for the new arrivals. But at the same time, in a game that is in alpha this long, it's going to be a salty place. There's no way around it. The Whales Channel, I have never visited. There's also a concierge channel that I've never actually gone to or hardly visited. Uh, I can imagine what are they saying. Things like select their targets easily from the radar, they may not be wanting to see 400 marker AR markers when they're flying around. And 
so those are all that's that's an example on the, the the vehicle side where we're sort of really trying to bring that all in as well as you know there's other things that we're doing that will come across the to you I don't have access to the uh, Legatus section, but uh, I've heard Legatus is the absolutely worst also. Uh, not that everyone in there has achieved Legatus from their own spending, but they've uh, a lot of the, the ship sellers, the gray market guys who've achieved the status are in there and uh, a lot of complaints. Modes and ease of use of the information's presenting to you well and you can, uh, you know, have fun being lost in the world, yeah. which is the most important thing. And a certain level of customization, as we talked about, because you know, some ships have better MFDs and more usable places than others and stuff like that. So, Well, um, the other aspect as well in terms of just the radar and scanning, which is it's a really good example of a feature that we've put onto the PU in Star Citizen that isn't hit the what we envisaged it to be. Well, they've got a time slot to fill, right? I mean, you get these three guys in the room, uh, I mean, there could be 10 hours of just talking about uh, a, a trolley. <laughs> Chris Roberts would be having meetings. Well, I mean, Chris Roberts is a creative, right? And uh, the artsy, I guess he's kind of artsy creative. He'll, he'll go for hours on any topic. Let's see if Jared wraps us up. It's that we want a smaller one that it's fairly instantaneous, and that's kind of giving you information about the people you're fighting or you know, your, your local environment. And when I say small, I'm talking, say, sub 100 kilometers. You know, that's just giving me information around this area. But then we've got the charge scan wave, and that should be giving me information about things that are 10, 15, 20,000 kilometers away. And then that's where, where Q-Boost comes in, in the fact that yeah. you're Q-Boosting to these locations, you're not having to go, okay, there's a quantum travel marker there that's a million kilometers away. That's like, okay, I'm making a conscious decision to go there. But for Q-Boost, it's like, okay, I am there. I want to boost around the environment, but I want to have things spread around so that you know, we're not just cramped in. Because radar and scanning is fundamentally, it has two purposes. One purpose is to give you information about the things in your environment. And the second purpose is to help you explore. It's to help you find things that are not necessarily apparent because space is a big, dark place. So we need that. We want to be able to take advantage of that. So when you have this ability to f detect things that are much further away, all of a sudden you start to feel like yeah, you, you are that you, pilot. You, you've got to fly to them to, yeah. to investigate them. And so I mean, I think that's like that's a good example of something on Squadron that you know we were also looking at, like how do we solve the problem of you're you know, patrolling an area, right? And it's not very much fun if you patrol an area and then it's like, I, you know, space is big. I go to this area and then I look around and I, my radar covers 10 kilometers yeah. in front of me and that's it. That doesn't feel like I was right. patrolling you know, a large area of space. And so we, we sort of were thinking about, well, how, you know, really if we think about it, there's like short range, which is you know, what you would call the standard control mode, like, uh, slower exploration, I come up to a, you know, a derelict or there's a cluster of asteroids that I'm going to fly around to see what's happening. And then there's the medium range, which hasn't really existed in both the PU uh, and is something that we really wanted to have in Squadron and we really should be in the PU, which is, well, you know, what's that over there that's 10,000 kilometers mm. away? The, the equivalent of being on a planet and going, there's a mountain over there, I can see it. I don't know what's on it, but I'm going to drive over there. I'll walk over to that mountain. Uh, and so the idea with sort of the, the scanning is like the wave goes out, and yeah, you'll pick up things 10, 20, 30,000 kilometers away. So you definitely won't be able to understand what what's there. But you'll say, there's something there's a point there. of interest. I'll get, there's a point of interest. And so you'll be able to map things, and then we need to get there. But you know, the quantum travel, spooling up, spooling down. Or, right. and, we, and so this is the whole quantum. What? This is the worst star citizen? I mean, worst citizen con? Yeah, look. Not every citizen con is going to be amazingly mind blowing. I, I think. With the. What we can work with this year, it's fine. I mean, we know there's Pyro, we know he has one or two new ships, it's fine. Uh, but the, the big reveal citizen cons, I mean, they're going to save those for the Squadron 42 release. Uh, I don't think anything mind-blowing besides new ship concepts, uh, new landing zones. Once the game mechanics are in, and I know this is still being developed, but once we've got the game loops, which we do, once we have the game mechanics, which we do, 
uh, how much new stuff can they show? There was a time where, you know, Area 18 would be mind-blowing. Like, oh my God, look at this. And he has a new landing zone. But we've seen the different biomes. We've seen what they can do with cityscapes and uh, forests and rivers and snow biomes. Once we've seen all the different biomes, once we've got the different game loops, once we've got Pyro and one or two more systems, how much new stuff is that they can show us? There isn't. So it's not that CisenCon sucks. It's just that we've... As the game's developed and we've seen more and more of what's in the game, there's less surprising stuff to come in the game. Um, remember how amazing it was when they showed from uh, from pupil to planet, uh, showing how you can seamlessly trunk go from the surface to uh, space and vice versa. That was mind blowing. And how mind blowing is it now when you're in the game? I mean, it's not. It's just part of the game loop. So they're a victim of their own, I don't want to say it's success yet, but as the game evolves, less and less is impressive because we've seen it. Uh, so you can't expect every season con to be mind-blowingly impressive. But what will be impressive is, I guess, new systems. Uh, if there's a new game loop, if there's um, a new ship, obviously. And uh, that's about it. So, yeah, don't expect mind-blowing Star Citizens indefinitely going in the future. Uh, nothing will beat the old season cons where they go, here is... A seamless transition from space to the planet. That mind blowing. Here is an entire planet made of a city. Mind blowing. Here is a snow biome. Never seen before. Mind blowing. Here is a river. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> but again, as we get closer and closer to an actual game one of these years, it's less and less impressive. And season cons will be more about, I guess, just the devs chatting uh, about the status of the game and those kind of things. And pets. Yes, we need pets. The quantum boost clip that we have, uh, so we can see it one more time here. All right, new HUD. Like, so I just like it. Call out. That's going to be the old HUD. Yeah, that, yeah, that is the old HUD. That's too busy. Right, that's so. the <laughs> next old HUD. Yeah. Oh, Earlier we were showing the old, old old HUD. So we've done a scan here. Those are that's also the old yeah. point of interest because the point of interest will be just points. Yeah. But basically, we've done a scan. We've got some points of interest that are. Uh, you know, multiple <laughs> fully functional you caterpillar. See the distance there, yeah. so it's 13,000 kilometers on the right hand side. So, this is obviously just placeholder yeah. UI for the quantum boost. Uh, again, you can try to understand the quantum there. boost system here. What's the green part? Interactive gameplay, which obviously went into. Uh, yeah, and this, by the way, is that, that's all programmer work in progress from Yogi uh, on uh, the quantum boost um, vectors because you're just going to have to stay in the zone. To keep in boost, otherwise you'll fall out of boost. Oh, uh, to the, that's to the totally elite dangerous. So yeah. What it's allowing you to do is sort of have that mid-level Thank you, Braben. Reversal and investigate things uh, without having to, uh, you know, spend forever at 1,200 meters per second or so wait. quantum traveling over it. It's over too quickly. Did the spooling yeah. mechanic? If you watch the flight there was no spooling there. In the day, that's the old old UI, which is probably closer to what you're familiar with in the PU today. What we just showed now is the new old UI, the one that was intermediate now, but we're now moving away from. And the well, ba basically, it's the same as it, it's the styled uh, squadron UI that was from the UI you have in the PU. Right. So what you have in the PU is the these generic version that Zane did. This was the one that we had the style that we did for the Aegeus style, mm -hmm. but it was still based on the idea of all this information right. being present. And we've decided that we wanted to really scale that back to be more contextual to switch between modes. So that's one of the reasons why we're not really showing all the HUD and the MFD stuff now is because we're in the process of the change. So it's you know a lot of programmer art, and you even you even saw it in the the Need for right. Speed segment, whereas a lot of that like the mode stuff and everything they've just sort of hacked in the modes to the current um, uh, HUD stuff. But when the new one comes online, it should be much cleaner and, and easier to go. And I, I don't know if it was too clear on the video that we were seeing, but on the video we say we were in originally in SCM mode, yep. standard control mode, and then um, we switched to quantum mode. So the spool up wasn't really the spool up for the quantum boost. The spool up was just, there's a spool up as you go into quantum mode, your shields power down. So you, so you, you know, there is some risk when you're in the fast traversal mode yeah. uh, and the quantum drive powers up. But once you're, once it's spooled up and you look at a place, you can, boost towards it. And it's just, you press shift and it's instant. Yeah. And and so so for people that want to, you know, go, oh, what's that over there? You know, people will be wanting to, I just want to like free quantum, right? You know, there's people who want to do that for quite a while. It's that like getting on your horse. Yeah. Yeah. 
you know, second start of the Free right. Free quantum. That's uh, yeah. Um, that works. So yeah, so we're, we've been talking about these 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 flight experience stuff, the ship related stuff, the uh, the new UI stuff, the contextual changes and everything. Uh, we'll obviously show those as we get closer to being ready to show those. Uh, we talked a little bit about the the, the star map. Um, again, not quite ready to show uh, today stuff. Uh, as far as those mapping things and getting around stuff, uh, there's also the mini map. There's also the mini map, which has always been this promise of being able to find your way through either a really large ship or a space station or stuff like that. Uh, what can you tell us about the work on the mini map? So, radar, as, as we call it, is essentially it encapsulates the star map, it encapsulates what's in your cockpit, and it also encapsulates when you're in FPS, you have an FPS radar and scanner. Uh, and the minimap is essentially a way for you to be able to, and you can access it both from your mobile or it'll be on your HUD, uh, a way for you to get the spatial awareness in, you know, when you're in a, a 3D environment in FPS. So I think the, what we have in terms of the minimap, it gives you that 3D isometric view that you can move around, and it, all the information in there is underpinned by uh, the FPS radar and scanner. So the information that you, you're, you're scanning ramming. in the environment <laughs> is the information well, that you'll see it's possible. on the minimap. So if you go into, say, a known location, so let's say you go uh, to Microtech, uh, you know, that landing zone, essentially, that, that will be pushed to your mobile glass. So you'll be able to then load up the minimap and go, OK, how do, I, how do I get out of here? I mean, I've seen so many different new players play Star Citizen. They're like, where do I go? So you, in, in, you know, it'd be nice for us to be able to go, here's, here's the spaceport. Here's where you go and buy food and drink. Here's where you go and buy weapons. And you can just go, cool, I open up my map, and it's like, oh, that's where I am. Oh, that's where I can go. And it, it gives you a map at your fingertips. But then when you're at an environment that is not, say, let's say you go to a derelict outpost, you'll be mapping that environment as you go. Or you may be able to find a terminal that has uh, the map on there that you can download, and then you have it to you. So it, it really allows us, again, Star Citizen, one of its strengths is that it's scale. But that's a challenge for us as developers to be able to give it to players and for them to be able to understand and navigate where they need to go. Because the first thing is, how do I play the game? Where do I need to go? What do I need to do? So you know, how do you play the game is about making the barrier to entry, the controls smooth and intuitive, what you understand. So that's an interesting point is right now on, on the barriers of entry. And I've been concerned about that because if you've been playing this game for years, it's second nature, how to fly a ship. You get in, you know what to do, how to take off, how to land, how to have combat. But Star Citizen is not going to be a, a game about combat. There's going to be people playing the game that just want to find a planet and have a, a hab and uh, collect crops or whatever. There's more to the game than just combat. How do you cater to that demographic that are here for the building part and exploration part that don't have combat when combat is an essential part of Squadron 42 or going to exist in the game? So barriers of entry and making it as simple as possible to engage in combat, I think, uh, is going to be an ongoing issue and also a reason why uh, speeds have slowed down. Terminal auto connects to your, your, your Mobi or whatever and you get the map downloaded and some of them you may have to explore something and then as you explore it you map it um, just like a sort of more traditional uh, mapping technique and there'll be some cases like uh, you know we have some stuff in squadron which i think would play perfect well in pu where like you don't have the map initially but if you hack in or you can download it into a yep. system like asiado is an example of we've been showing it because we showed it um, yeah. a while back as a location it's just one of the very it's, it's, you know, it's a minor location in terms of squadron, but you know, since we showed it, we thought, okay, that's a good. It's just a good backdrop. It's a good backdrop, use. rather than just you know, uh, gray really boxes. <laughs> um, but you know, that would be an example. Is you don't know the layout of that place, but you would have to go and hook into their mm. system, download the map, and then now you would have it in your mini map. So what we have is we have some footage here, which is showing how the visuals, the mini map, in terms of sort of an isometric render in, engine. in the engine in the UI that uh, will essentially become your minimap but you'll have a, a more sort of you know reduced version with you in the middle as you're moving around but yep. if we run it uh, you'll 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 see kind of what the the tech is so first this is in the editor um, uh, but it's essentially what it does is it's taking our existing um, layouts levels ships 
So we don't have to build this custom, but it's a way of applying certain shaders and marking up certain objects to be displayed, like the floor gets displayed, but the walls don't. Uh, so we can just take the existing geometry you already have streamed in that you're walking around already, uh, and then use it to be rendered for our minimap. So this is, this is essentially in the engine using the Idris uh, ship itself and the various parts of, it, of its interior to create the minimap without any special. Did he just system. say you know, minimap of a ship? Because <laughs> I need that. UI art for it other than some of the like level things that say, you know, uh, okay, so you know, ground level or whatever. It's, it's one of the advantages of having minimap is one of the first things that on new players when they land in the first landing zone with this Lorval or whatever it is they're like where's the map they ask and the new player experience is horrendous in the landing zones they go I want to go to a terminal I want to get my ship where did I get my ship they don't know if you watch YouTube playthroughs blind playthroughs uh, there's so much difficulty of a new player finding where they need to go so minimap goes a long way to solving this issue it's something which is sorely needed and uh, I guess this is what they're discussing you, it's just it's just not viable. So we wanted to come up with a solution that we can use, you know, with minimal effort on the side of uh, content creation, but gives us all of the information that we want. And this mini map, it's not just uh, oh, that's where I am. It can show you objectives. It can show you other people. It can show you information about those things. And again, it's all underpinned by. So the again, mini map, not groundbreaking technology, but uh, it's something which I guess they didn't consider initially. They thought we don't need a map because. The idea was in Laurel and landing zones is you follow the signs. Look at the sign. The sign over there says space terminal. Go there. But a lot of people don't look at signs. Just run through the level. They're going, where am I supposed to be? Uh, it's painful to watch, but uh, a generally accepted method of transversing anything in any game is usually a minimap. So uh, minimaps, welcome to Star Citizen. I like it go and help him before he bleeds out because I can see his health and, and you'll be able to see that via this information yeah it, it allows you to detect you know, uh, saboteurs or intruders Absolutely. but then you know using like the relay network in where the saboteurs and intruders can start pulling fuses and start hiding themselves from yeah. the well, this will also underpin resource network yeah so, so the, exactly that the the same visuals and tech is planned to drop into the, the so the resource so if you're looking at like your schematic for the ship to where your relays are going to be or security reasons or which, heads, which so. doors are open or closed um, basically it will pull up your you know your holographic view of your ship like that using the same tech so that the idea is those two things um, you know work well together all right so we've been talking about uh, the FPS stuff the stuff Here that affects go. the player specifically and we're going to touch a few more of those things uh, before we leave today uh, we've moved up into space and talked about our flight experience and the scanning and the minimap and stuff um, now from ourselves and our ships let's talk about our enemies our opponents the pe the, the the entities we're going to encounter okay, talk, some, uh, talk about some of the AI improvements uh, that have been coming because of work on squadron what can you tell us so the AI systems that we have, we basically threw them away. <laughs> so we, we, we found out that we wanted to, we wanted to understand where we wanted to go, what we wanted to achieve, and, and you know, over the years as I've worked in games, and I think probably Chris would attest to as well, is that the best AI are kind of some of the simpler AI that you have a really good solid foundation, then you build on top of it. And I think our AI over the period of time that has been there. Uh, I think it's kind of had lots of different iterations and it kind of lost its way a little Kythera bit. Kythera and then, you know, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's kind of lost. So what we've, we've done and... Well, they've, we say they've, also, they've also, no one's, the, the AI that's in the PU has never really had tuning time. No, exactly, the focus. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it was a basic implementation at the beginning and then it's been rolled out and there's so many other things going on that they really haven't had time to focus on it because, you know, you're playing and with the servers running at six frames a second, there's a whole bunch of problems that come with this yeah. that doesn't help the AI out at all. Uh, so this is one, this is actually a really good example of where Squadron really helps because we're saying, okay, don't worry about that. I mean, yeah, I'm sorry that the AI is kind of brain dead a lot of the times in the, the PU. It's a combination of the, you know, it's older logic and behaviors haven't been well developed, but also it's because of poor performance of the servers and 
what's going to happen with server meshing is going to make a big difference for that. And we're, there's other things that are happening in the background that will will also make it better. Uh, but the advantage of taking it to in, onto the squadron side is that we can really just focus on the AI, the behaviors, iterating on it, um, adding sort of interest and complexity and making them feel like real humans uh, fighting you, uh, or in the case of Vandal, real aliens fighting you. And not... Or creatures. Be, or creatures, yeah, yeah. Well, hey, let's, let's be quiet about that. Um, <laughs> but not get tied up in some other problems that come with multiplayer, come with online servers, and make that work really good as a single player, having fun, feeling challenged, feeling like it's, it, you know, I'm not just shooting dummies that jump up and I can easily blast. And when that all works, then comes across into the PU, uh, especially when some of the latest stuff's going to trigger in the PU, I think it will be a whole different experience. And, and it's, I'm, I won't argue it's been like a long, hard slog mm. on the AI side. Uh, it's partly because we want it to become really systemic and we have a massive, especially in the PU, a massive world that can have all these different situations. So it's not, you know, like if you're doing a standard sh FPS game, a Call of Duty, um, like the narrative parts of it, you know exactly where everyone's going to be and you can sort of script actions for the AI to make them seem intelligent, but really they're kind of following scripts. Whereas with us, you know, all the different planets, all the different can you be, you know, locations on the planets or up in a spaceship or all these different situations the AI could be in. There's no way you could script it all. So you need to make it systemic. It needs to understand the environment. It needs to, to have perception of what's happening around it and uh, be able to communicate with the other AI it's fighting alongside to seem like they're working as a team. And so that takes time to work. Uh, you know, the AI team has uh, been working on it for a long time, led by friend Cesco Ricucci, who's been doing a great job. Mm. And, I, you know, we absolutely have turned a corner yeah, this 100%. year. Uh, because I, you know, you know, both me and Rich actually, we, we, we were playing. Some of the last Chris Roberts has been holding us in since last CitizenCon. Let him speak. <laughs> challenging, to say the least. He's got a lot to say. Uh, fact that we were like okay we want to we want to clear everyone out like we were running Asiato as a test level okay let's see if we can just run and gun and take all the slavers out no. and uh, I mean Rich is a much better FPS player than me uh, I think I'm kind of okay but Rich is much better but no we weren't all no. managed to get it but I was like I was like I'm going home I downloaded the build and, and home I'm like damn it I'm gonna finish this level I'm like I almost managed to do it I mean it, it, it was you know it was getting it was like Elden Ring from software, like oh, I want to do it one more time. And it was and it wasn't just that you were getting like a headshot or anything where it was like, okay, the AI is just supernatural and they can instantly shoot you. It was like they were moving around, they were anticipating where you were doing, they're trying to flank your areas, and they were behaving intelligently. And those are all uh behaviors and systems that we've been working on in terms of like realistic perception, like they can, you know, they can hear a sound around a corner, mm. but if you were three four doors away or whatever maybe they wouldn't hear you if you drop something uh, it's supposed to be five hours yeah, right so uh, the, see you in the peripheral vision or that no been, uh, I, I think they're just trying to fill in the next um 20 minutes and then they'll end off with the the squadron 42 goodies or at least uh, and they're talking about vandul and stuff so let's see but uh China, what's up? Good to see Chris plays the builds. Uh, well, Chris that builds that the builds, doesn't he? <laughs> Tony <laughs> Zing, the whole thing. He is. But, you know, when's the last time Chris Roberts sat down and just spoke? So he's like, he's been bottling this in. Let's let, let the man get it all out. When you say we've thrown everything away. Well, actually, I was about to come back to that. Because so <laughs> that's going to be the title yeah. of the Kotaku article. Well, it's interesting because what we, what we talked about is we, we, we identified everything that was there. So when I came on, I wanted to understand where, we're, you know, we're talking years now. So we, okay, what, what is there? How do we want to change it? And how do we want to manipulate it? So we're not throwing away the, the more technical underpinnings of the, of the AI. Subsumption's so still there. No, 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 no. Oh, like, so, yeah, Subsumption so, so. or like how the, um, you know, how they, they navigate and find around the world. It's more about the bits that you go and you t tune and the bits you t tweak. And we, we call them behaviors, like AI behaviors. 
So what we did is we pulled the, all the AI back and stripped it back to essentially three base behaviors. Essentially, defender, so I want to stay back and cover and defend a location. A strafer who kind of wants to get, you know, siege you and wants to go behind you, and then pushes that kind of want to put pressure onto you. So we wanted to create these three core behaviors that the AI can choose to go, you know, they combat can choose to be, behaviors. yeah, combat behaviors this okay. is. So once you've engaged in combat, they can then select one of these behaviors to engage you so that you get a, a mixture of combat when you're fighting them. And obviously you might get three defenders or you might get one strafer and two pushers. And we've got a video to show some of the uh, some of the behaviors. But then what we have is we have a trait system that sits on top of that. And that's where designers can go in and go, okay, I want this defender to be, um, to always defend, he can never re-roll as another uh, behavior, or I want him to be um, like a turret, so he never moves from cover to cover, or I want pushers to be, you know, I want always to be a pusher, I want them to, you know, be aggressive, I want them to be reckless, I want them to have friendly fire. So we can go in and say, actually, we've got three base behaviors that just by themselves play well. You can play that and go, okay, do these three, is that a fun experience? Then you can start adding in all the other things on top, go, okay, I want this, this trait and this trait. So you're, you're crafting combat experiences. So in a PU mission, if you've got a ship coming in, bringing AI reinforcements, we can say, okay, we can weight the behavior. So you're not getting the same thing every time, but you can go, okay, you, uh, you get these guys who push, they're quite aggressive because that's their faction, whether it's nine tails, or these guys are quite defensive, they're, you know, they're more military. And what we have is these traits that m multiply the behavior. So now we've got multiple different things. And then you add different, um, weapons in there, so you've got sniper rifles, so the different engagement ranges, and all of a sudden you have this matrix of individual behaviors that is multiplied into the hundreds that allows us to have a really strong combat experience that is not the same. It's not, you know, Star Citizen game that you're going to be playing for hundreds, thousands of hours. Um, you, you know, you don't want to just be having the same combat experience over and over again, and vice versa in Squadron. We want you to be able to ramp up the combat. We want to have factions play differently. We want you to have different experiences you play throughout the game. And wh when we looked at the AI combat behavior, that's something we identified. But then we also looked at perception and, and basically um, tweak that and, and Why that in not a way that allows us that, you know, you come around the corner, it's not just instant headshot. Why not just show us? <laughs> yes, we know. What the AI can do, you know, give us the video. They know exactly, what, they don't have to mouse aim, it's just instant headshot. It's very easy to make them too hard. What, what it, what but is, it's not human. No, right? exactly. What we want to do is we want to make it challenging, but fair. And that is where, you know, when, when we were, Chris was talking about playing through Asiado, even though it was very challenging, it, when we died, it was because... Yeah, um, I'm going to give myself uh, some caffeine also. Let's do it, guys. Left. When I came out here, want to be awake for the final reveal, right? And we've also looked at accuracy. Be right so back. We've looked at accuracy is that you know even a human, you know even a soldier, uh, they don't immediately have a bead on a target and they pull the trigger. They take a time to adjust to it. So you know as soon as you pop out of cover, they're like, oh, someone's there. It's not instantly on you. They've got a bit of time. And then what we wanted to do is that we don't want AI to be 100% accurate. You know, but we want them, you to still feel pressure. So we have a silhouette-based accuracy model now, so that if they do miss, kind of you're getting that sense of like, pew, pew, you know, it's kind of going past your head, and you're like, okay, I'm, I'm under pressure. And we want the AI to pressure you, but pressure you in a way that you feel like, oh, what? How did he, he shot me through a box? Like, oh, you know, oh, he's, he's pushing that way, and you're hearing him, and you're like, okay, I need to, oh, they're coming this way, and I'm being pincered. And I think that's where we want to, we put our real focus on terms of how they perceive you in the environment when they're socially active, how do they perceive you in, in combat? And then we, we have pretty much 90% of what I've talked about there is in the game. We've had balanced passes. We've played it. It's a lot of fun. Um, and then what we have on top of that is future things that we're going to be adding even more. So, you know, we've, we've got versions of them going doing medic behavior and reviving allies and ammo management and all the other advanced combat behaviors that we can put on top, which we're already working on. But they, they're underpinned by an absolute solid foundation. So if you strip all of it back just to those three base behaviors, the defender pushes strafer, is it fun? Because if it's not fun there, it's not going to be fun here. You can't just keep relying on putting stuff on top and going, oh, it's going to get fun when we do this. It's going to get fun when we do this. So we, we, we pulled it back so that, A, you have a challenge, that you feel like you're being pushed, that you feel like you're under pressure. Because especially in squadron, you know, you're not a commando. You're a fighter pilot. You know, fighter pilots don't go in and, you know, they're not John Rambo. And again, in the PU, 
you could be a you could be a haulage uh, trucker, or you could be you you might want to do something else. You might want to be doing just a homestead, or so you want to do trading. And so when you get into FPS, we need to have the the um, the AI reflect the level of difficulty that we want to push in it into a persistent yeah, universe. I, yeah, and, I, and I, I mean, I would say, I mean, yeah, throwing away is was mm. yeah, yeah it's, it's disingenuous. But basically, but, yeah. that, but it's but you know, game developer is iteration, right? So you have V one, and you have V two, and then yeah. V three. Well, you know, V one was the very first basic combat behavior, and it was it wasn't you know, it's it was the beginning, and there's a lot yeah. more systems now. You guys out there drinking coffee like it's 1920. NO Explode. All right, this is a, a pre-workout drink. This is four cups of coffee, and it tastes awesome. Much more efficient than normal caffeine. Typically of the FPS combat behaviors. Correct. Like, like the seven segments I did about the bartenders, those are all still accurate. No, no, so, so I mean, social AI and combat behaviors, there's, there yeah, is social. We've redone the yeah. chow line yet <laughs> <Yeah>. again. <laughs> Uh, Socially, I stay in the same. More mess hall? More mess hall? Yeah, mess hall will never end. Uh, 90% of the AI is in? Well, I guess the remaining 10% better be the good stuff. But, uh, I mean, they've spoken about the AI at length and why it's operating the way it is. ...earlier talk in terms of the jousting and how we want to have more close combat. Things like accuracy and the behaviors and how they can roll different... Um, yeah, my thinking is after I drink this, I'll want to uh, work out. I'll have no choice, so we'll do it. Good for you, Night Spies. I didn't drink coffee for 30 years. I started drinking coffee like at 32, 33. Once you start, it's difficult to get off. Yeah, so I, what I'd suggest, I think, we'd probably show the investigation first before we go into combat. Yeah, because the other thing is outside of... You just talked about combat. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of other behavior in terms of, get? because, you know, like I said, stealth game plays a lot. Yes. What'd you so, get? You know, squadron is the test bed for that. So mm. investigation. So like someone hears a noise, what's that? Let's go check it out. They okay. radio their, you know, <laughs> back to base or their buddy. Hey, I heard something oh, here. Yep. They get in a gunfight. They could actually call back. Hey, I need reinforcements Ooh. and they'll come in. That's all I got free food. In, working right now in squadron. Yep. And then on top of that, you know, you're Where's making the joke about the, the bartender and all the rest of it. But really, uh, the yep. main uh, cooking bed for what we call social AI, i.e. non-combat AI, is the kids not eating squadron. It? There's a lot more stuff happening in, in, Wasn't hit? in squadron that will come into the PU. So it's not just mm, I'll, the bartender I'll take a look. or you know, even people eating at the chow line. It's, you know, it's mm. you know, engineers going about their daily business oh. or uh, a janitor, you know. This looks amazing. Messes that people leave systemically or, for instance. Flight attendants or hangar mm. personnel. Yeah, the hangar people that, you know, are basically mm. operating on the hangar and then when they're not fixing something, they're having a conversation. Delicious. Inside. For instance, there's a whole dynamic conversation system uh, that Francesco has been working on that allows our AI, say, our board, the staff. Well, it's lunch. That you're based in, uh, good and it's huge. The conversation, mm -hmm. it, when yeah. you're playing through it at a level and you can hear them talking to each yeah. other and reacting to what's happening, it all of a sudden brings that space mm. to life. So, yeah, but the dynamic conversation system allows it. So we have some that are sort of more story scripted conversations. Yeah. Like if you eavesdrop on some people patrolling and it, we've got some stuff we want to let Not you hear so you right. know where to go and stuff like that but also I should probably get a fork. there's dynamic conversation mm. so people can just mm. sort of you know whether it's in a mess hall they sit down and they just start up a conversation talking about the most recent vid show they saw or uh, you know talking about what they think the best I don't know ship thruster is uh, and there's a system in for that and we're creating a recording but that's also a system that's going to come into the PU that's going to create a huge amount of life. So when you go into a bar in the PU or you're wandering around the, you know, the big point of interest, the cities, people will be having conversations, gossiping, talking about, oh, well, there, I heard there was something went on the mm. Nine Tails attack. So on our eyes and on our, and right, it will second be wind, we're caffeine, we've got food, and dynamic, it's good to go. It's really cool. And it because, just adds so yeah, much. It, will, it just adds so much. So let's look at some of this in action. Uh, 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 we don't have the conversation system stuff to show today, but no. the, uh, let's look at some of the investigation stuff, and then we'll talk, look at some of the uh, combat stuff you're talking about afterwards. So we've actually got it as two videos. So okay. there's the investigation in the test map. And what you're seeing here, in some respects, it, you, you might think that this is scripted, that this is something that we just put on a track. This is purely systemic. So if we, we captured this, 
20 different times, it would be 20, it would, be, it would yeah. play out 20 different ways. So the one, those individual there is, gonna, is going away to hide behind that orangey boxy, whatever we want to call that yeah. color. So that's the player, He's gonna essentially. Go. This is essentially a standard for the player. The other two AI are searching for him at the moment. Uh, the white spheres you see are basically cover hiding points. or cover spots. And so as AI, this is a sort of debug mode, as the AI goes around and they search, the, the spheres go away, indicating that, okay, they've checked that place, so no oh, one's pretty there hiding out on cover. So, and they, they're both That's interesting behavior from the AI so on top their there. Their logic is they need to clear these rooms first, and then once the rooms are cleared, they can sort of go so on. So they share there. this information. So as they're clearing the cover points, and the cover points are basically all the nooks and crannies in the room, they're clearing the cover points and they're sharing together. So you'd see here that they're going, okay, this guy's coming in and go, okay, there's an open vent. Again, this is systemic. He's just coming to investigate this vent, but he's not cleared this entire room yet, so he's not going to progress. And he's just going to go and check the rest of the room alongside his buddy. And once they've then cleared it, they'll then progress. Right. But again, here would be, you know, you'd hear them talking to each other. I've not found him yet. Where is he? And again, if that, we've got vents In terms of what AI moment, do in yeah, games, I mean, I don't think this is groundbreaking. So it might be a, you know, but again, it's, um, it's new for Star Citizen and definitely new for this engine. So you can see there's only a few balls left now. The ones at the bottom right and then the ones at the back that he's clearing. And then the, one of these enemies will then go, OK, we've checked everything in here. I'm now going to progress to the next space because mm. that's where you know they're not in here. I'm, I think yeah. they're going to go this way. So you've come back. There's only one set of uh, ones left. I'm going to check it. He's going to come through here. Cleared those, so now he's going around here. And fire away! away. And what you're seeing here with the bar, which starts <laughs> off, is something with the that that scared me. <laughs> so they start off in green, and then it goes to yellow, then amber, then red. So once it goes to red, that's into full combat. Yeah. But the previous states are kind of levels of, um, they go up based on levels of different perception. So a green might, they just might have seen you. They, that's the equivalent of going, huh? You know. Do I see yeah. something? No. And by the way, in the game, you don't see that. That's our no, debug. no, that's yeah. our debug. That, that's just indicating yeah. uh, the level, and the level in the game would be. But like we'll have it. audio and visual yeah, exactly. representation for those levels. So the yeah, the initial green one would just be like like a head turn, maybe a verbal cue. Mm -hmm. Then you're right. getting into the yellow and amber. That's where they're like they're turning to face the noise and going. I think I'm going to go check it out, and, and then you know maybe they'll walk over. There Mike's saying the new Crusader ships them, are flatter in Inferno and Ions. Yeah. The only thing missing, out. do any of them have like a the bed? It's like, there's a the only thing missing is a bed. I don't think and I saw a bed in any of them. Like but I do like the bomber. I'm going to pick really up the bomber. Time, they will then de-escalate to the green. And it's like right. their minds have been, you know, it's like MIB. They flash through memory, it's gone. <laughs> in our game, what they do is they go to a threatened state. And in that threatened state, they'll still do their social activities and their functions, but they're more, they're more perceptive. So as soon as they see it, they're like, he's there again, they'll get into it. So... It makes a difference that if you've gone loud at the start and then tried to hide, you can't just go, yeah. oh, no, they'll mm. forget about me. It, it, it has memory. And that Crispy would be the chicken. case in the PU as it is in Squadron. So Didn't realize I was right. so hungry. So that was on a test map. Yes. But we do have an example of it working. Yep. So yeah, I would roll, let's, roll let's, the clip. Let's uh, mm. take a look at the, the real deal. So here's in Asiado in the decommissioned area. Okay. You can see the two that's AI in the, in the distance catch you. And then this is kind of just a representation of, of it doing the same thing in a real environment. But obviously we wanted to show you the kind of the, the thing behind the curtain. What are they actually doing? They're checking cover points. They're checking the usables that are there. And then, you know, in some, a lot of the cases when we actually captured this video, uh, if we actually failed because they pincered the player and they actually found you before we were able to show you, you know, what was happening. So it's... Uh, it, it's really good to see how this transition from social into combat so that you can actually play through the game. Better check that out. So here he's checking a, a, a usable, which we've set up. We're just kind of like looking and checking, okay, is there anything there? Nothing there. And again, he's sharing that information with his buddy. So if you've got two, three, four... So this is important for replayability of Squadron 42 as a single-player game. I know most of us here do not back this for a single player game, but there will be people who have no interest in the MMO part. There will be individuals who are just here for a single player game. 
And so having AI with these dynamic behaviors definitely goes far into the, uh, excuse me, replayability of a single player game. I think he takes a bit of revenge. And again, not scripted. The, 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 it's systemic. They understand all the hiding places. They, they this is their station. They understand the hiding places. They understand where to look, and they just go through. Some, uh, yeah. So you can drop these enemies in any environment, and it will they will play out like this. But obviously, what they the choices that they make at runtime will be different. Wow. And this is where you know we have to make sure that the AI that we're working on, even though we're working on it in Squadron it has to work for the entirety of Star Citizen in all the different environments, in all the different scenarios that you're put in. So it's, right. uh, it's, so a, it's a major improvement. So that's hiding from the AI, but let's look at some of the combat tactics sure. now. So uh, let's do combat tactics one. So again, what you're seeing here is in a test map. We wanted to just kind of show you a bird's eye view. So we've just turned God mode on so you can see it. And you can see the labels here. So we've got the defenders that kind of push to cover points. Then we've got the, the pusher who's kind of pushing towards you. And then we've got the strafer who is kind of like taking more of a wider angle. Now, there are some similarities between all the behaviors, it, but it depends on what happens. So whether they go to cover, you know, a pusher, for example, can still go from cover to cover. A defender can still go to cover to cover. Damn. So it's not like you've got these binary choices. It's Pancakes. about weighting the different choices throughout the behavior so that the AI provides something different but also applies pressure to you. A lot of pancakes. So that you're having to react to the AI. You know, right now, our current AI, you basically get the jump on them, and you can just take them all out. But in reality, what we want is we want you to, to react to the AI because they're pushing you and challenging you. And we want, you know, we want that challenge to be fair so that you feel like you've made the mistake when you eventually, or if you do, uh, get taken out. I want to get some of that God mode. <laughs> yeah. uh, and then we have one more video showing the tactics yes. situation. Let's take a look at that. So this is just a short version where we, but again, it's the same uh, AI uh, that have been dropped in. And, and they, they roll the dice for, they don't always become defenders or always become pushers or strafers. Uh, it can be random every time, so the combat experience is different. Oh. So you, and you might all be pushers and they might all be defenders, but the way it works is if one of them rolls a defender, then the weight for them to roll another defender is lower. So essentially here, you can see here that uh, he's getting tagged a lot just because we want to show you the behaviors themselves right. rather than you know, get taken out. So he's being a bit more aggressive than you probably would be able to. That's going to make uh, uh, the eventual, sp eventual speed runs a lot harder because they're not just Goombas that do the same thing every time. You can't no. memorize the patterns. And the other thing you might have noticed as well is that we're starting to have traversal opportunities for the AI. So they're not always just on, yeah. on the base they map. They can mantle over, you know, you, in fact, I'm not sure we've Crouch, seen this mantle, one. climb yeah, ladders. They can, they can jump over railings and, and, and push you, or they can climb up onto things and shoot down on you. Uh, they can use ladders, they can do all sorts of stuff. Um, so uh, we, we're putting a fair amount. I can see this making the AI bunker missions a bit more challenging. Sort of but they kind of have this in the game already. There's some AI just sit behind uh, cover, right? Um, Am I wrong about that? Because. Course, it, when you do the bunker missions, some of the AI just stand behind a box and shoot, and others are running around, or are teleporting around you. Because, you know, it's, it, it, like Rich says, it's very easy to make you know, AI aim perfectly all the time because they know exactly where you are. Yeah. Uh, they've got all the numbers, um, but that's not any fun. So the fun is making them feel real, like that's, you're playing against another real uh, player or a human. All right, well, we are just about out of time. I think we've got two more talking points we want to cover before we let you go. Um, Here we go. Let's start with one that might be surprising to some. Most people, maybe not, they won't know about it. We haven't done a lot of talking about it in the past. Skills. There, there, there's, uh, what can you tell us about skills in, in Squadron 42? So skills, it's not just Squadron 42. Okay. It will be Star okay. Citizen as well. So we've split them up into kind of two... Um, one is physical attributes. So we have four physical attributes, such as strength, uh, agility, endurance, and fitness. And then we have four out four. techniques, which is kind Specials. of like, uh, whether it's takedowns or traversal. So if you look at the physical attributes, what we have, essentially we're going to have a skill system that you can go, and th the way that you play the game will dictate how you level up these particular skills. So if you're constantly carrying boxes, you, know, you may get stronger, so you can actually lift stronger things. But 
getting stronger doesn't just allow you dude to totally it, but it also means the special skills from fallout 4 fallout 76 is, is strength that that weight doesn't affect your perception so you're not luck <laughs> because it's not affecting your stamina as much you know your force reactions you're more resistant to that because you're stronger in yourself agility in terms of like weapon swapping or um going to ads uh, we have endurance, so that's, for example... Like Strength, endurance, agility, time. perception, so come on. Yeah, I like it. SES I'm a big fan of the, the special skills in the, the Fallout series. Awesome. Uh, they have, you know, you, you can in survive in harsher climates. You can go longer without uh, sustenance. Uh, and th then that's what essentially endurance gives you. And, and also, for example, like G-Force and Redout, so that, you, you know... Come on, we're all going to go stealth sniper, right? Everyone's going to go stealth sniper. <laughs> it's OP. ...than a normal person would be. And then you have fitness. So fitness, for example, you can have a higher stamina. So when we have swimming, you can swim longer. You can, you can hold your breath longer. You can sprint longer. So we have these physical attributes. Totally. They, they took it from Fallout. I'm glad. Um, yeah, agility, perception, endurance. Luck. Is there going to be luck? obviously for flying as well as um, um, in FPS. But we're not going to be removing any of the skill elements, so there's nothing that we're going in there going, oh, you've got 10% more damage, or you know, we're going to make you fly the plane better. It's like, no, that, that's always relying on your skill. This is the things that you, you can't necessarily improve. So, you know, like I said, how far you have Mining would be uh, perception. You'd be better at scanners. You can have skills where you will just be better, or luck. Absolutely. If, well, I don't. Well, I don't mention luck, but uh, something like perception will allow you to identify or scan further. Yeah. Okay, I can do whatever. I can like bench press 100 pounds. Now I can do 120. Now I can do 140. Now I can do 160. Now I can do 180. Right? Well, you couldn't do 180 right from the beginning. You yeah. had to. You had to work the same if you're like running. You know, you work your way up to a marathon, and so that's kind of the idea. <laughs> do you even lift, bro? <laughs> I see that happening a lot, yes. Your gameplay can add to it, but if you want to take some time and go to the gym and do some squats, you you know, you, you can get some yeah. strength up. And uh, I, I, again, that's part of like making that, that the, the, the living world. So if you want to invest in your character that way. Now we know why there's a gym in the Siege of Arison. They want you to go work out. See, it's going to take five years to build up your strength 10%. <laughs> um, then you can do that if that's something you know, that makes sense. The level of fidelity in this game, I mean, there's going to be treadmills. Uh, you have to watch your intake because if you eat too much food, you'll get fat. <laughs> you don't really need to be all buff and everything because exactly. I'm sitting there in the cab of my caterpillar hauling a bunch of cargo. So <laughs> patient you know, skill. <laughs> I think we've maxed out a patient skill. Every, every original and veteran backer gets automatically uh, full yeah, patience. If you're wearing the same, if you're wearing heavy armor and they're wearing heavy armor, and, and you've put effort into, you know, skilling up your character because you're saying, you know, you, that's the dedicated area of focus that you want. You know, you can run further than them. You can carry a, carry things, you know, that are heavier than than uh, they can. You can equip things onto you, and it doesn't affect you as much. So all of those different physical attributes, it allows you to progress your character in those ways. I think every original back in this game will have intelligence set to zero and patience maxed out. <laughs> and fitness to zero because we're sitting around so long waiting. It's almost like the 10,000 hours, you know, if you do 10,000 hours kind of thing, you're better at something. So takedowns is a good example. So the first time you do a takedown, you know, that's going to be quite sloppy. It's, it's going to take quite a long time. You know, you might struggle and, uh, okay, eventually you, you take them down and it's like, oh, okay, the guy over there heard me. It's not very good. Mm. And after a certain amount of time that you, you know, you practice at them. Yeah, more takedowns you do, the better you You'll get, get better. So then they'll change different animations. So yeah. now you'll unlock a different animation where it's, it's smoother. Steve it's, Bender yeah, is it's very <laughs> looking forward to getting <laughs> exactly. all the versions of Takedown yeah. from sloppy to super killer pro. Yeah, and at the end ones, it'd be like, you know, straight in, straight out. You lower him down onto the yeah. floor. It takes, you know, it's much faster. But you've put in the effort to level that skill to a level that you want to achieve. Okay, this is pretty standard MMO stuff. stuff. Uh, the uh, more you do uh, one thing, the better you become oh, at it. Uh, think Skyrim, where you're using uh, two-handed, you become better at being two-handed. 
Uh, so the more takedowns you do, the more skill you get in takedowns, the more lifting of objects I do. I mean, I guess you don't get to select your skills like Fallout. Does it sound like it? It sounds like you're saying the more you do a specific thing, the better you get at it. So uh, the more you've played or the longer you've existed in the game, the more skills you'll have racked up, which is cool. I like that. That's something to work towards. Because, uh, again, it's, you know, this is going to be a really huge deep world and it's sort of up to you how you want to I mean, essentially build your character. If you look at fighter pilots nowadays or Formula One car drive races, Okay, this is pretty big. I mean, it's it's not big in terms of exciting new news, in terms of gaming. All games, a lot of games have had this. But in terms of Star Citizen, it's something to work towards. So, eventually, we'll all get to the point where we just want to max out our characters in any way possible. And uh, doing a certain task, which you have not done much in the past, will build that skill up. You know, you want the best all-round character, so it encourages you to do different loops. So if like scanning builds up your some kind of scanning skill, you'll do scanning a lot to do it. I guess encouraging you to explore different game loops. I'm not going to black out because I'm going to be able to do it. And it's those slight 1% differences that allow you to put some effort in to do. And, and that you should be, you will be able to level them as you just play the game organically. So you're not going to have to go out and level them, um, you know, you know, like Chris said, squats. If you, if you do squats, like that's the equivalent of us going from crouch to stand, essentially. Yeah. It's like, we will allow you to do things like that. And if you want to go and kind of like level them yourself, but you'll also just be able to level them yeah. by naturally playing what you like to in the game. That Pilates area and microtech. Yeah, Jared's falling asleep. <laughs> So look, it's uh, essential in Test Squadron to build up alcohol tolerance. <laughs> sort of track this is the yes. same way as, you know, I've got an Apple Watch on it. Or well, maybe there'll be a perk to, uh, your charisma rises the more you drink. <laughs> Plus five to charisma. Uh, but, uh, you know, that will be essentially one of the apps in the movie glass. And then one of the last, uh, you know, things that we we're going to talk about as far as some of the stuff we're doing in Squadron uh, is, you know, there's a complete redo of the Moby glass. Uh, and the first iteration is in Squadron. Mm -hmm. There's a sort of cut down set of apps in Squadron because it's the military Moby class and you, you know, don't need all the cargo trading and all that kind of stuff that you would want in the PU. Uh, but it's a framework that we're building almost like a, you know, our own Operating Moby OS. System, yeah. uh, and it's all in building blocks, so all the all flash stuff's gone away. It's been built to be extensible. Um, there's been uh, some tech and thought into how it looks and rendered which is much nicer and transitions much better before uh between uh the modes and uh you know in squadron it's where you'll sort of be able to see oh you know this is who i am this is how i'm doing in terms of like my health and stats but also like okay here's my personal uh, log of what's been going on in the life in my life which is basically sort of what i've been playing the game, you know, here's my mission assignments, uh, you know, here's the, the ship chat channel. Uh, and yeah, the ship uh, WhatsApp. Yeah, the ship WhatsApp, basically. Uh, and, um, you yeah, know, obviously the, the, your nav map, star map, and all that will be in and there. And Galactopedia. The Galactopedia, so you can look up, and then in the PU, it's going to just get expanded and maybe uh, potentially have a slight uh, UI difference to be not the military version, but be the civilian version. But it's it will all go in the same framework using the same base work. So one of the things that we've been really trying, you know, not just on the Moby but on the HUDs and the MFDs is they're all using a, like a common building block framework, and we're trying to share the same mm. base code stuff so it's easier to support and maintain. Because one of the problems right now in the PU is because there's a hodgepodge of the old system, which is the old sort of flash scale. So I know you guys are kind of joking with the um, shiner board up about making like an edge runners for Star Citizen. Um, if you haven't kept up with the story, uh, Cyberpunk, which had uh, kind of a, a rough launch and uh, player base has dropped off a lot over the year, had a massive spike in new players after Cyberpunk Edge Runners came out on Netflix. A lot of people maybe being exposed the first time, but a lot of people who possibly tried the game and then just left it have come back and so they've got a peak the the highest number of new players and over uh, oh, I've got the recent numbers but a massive influx of new players came to the game because of that uh there's actually a fallout series also being made i think is it amazon or disney or netflix it's making the fallout 
series. Uh, and I predict that's going to be a boon for the Fallout genre. Um, so, not another question. I think it's a way to go to kind of tie in gameplay with the, an actual movie or series release. This is nice. AI, which, again, it's kind of just making it believe that you're in this, you know, believable environment or a real life environment rather than just you alone. Uh, so responsive compared to the old one. Yeah, and it's just a lot, it's a lot cleaner and, uh, you know, the information, it's something that we've tried to be consistent across the HUD and the Mobi is that we want to make sure that we're giving you clean information. And you can see, here. like, the alerts. So the alerts now cleared from the, the messaging app because we've see, read the messages, so it's gone, but there was an alert down on our mission side here, but now we've gone and looked at it, it's cleared. So that's the system, it's a framework. So like inside the, you know, you'll get you know, notifications or alerts. Oh, look, I got a new message over here. I'll click over to it. Now we're back. Uh, oh, uh, and yeah, on the topic of um, shows, Arcane, another series made from a game. So it's definitely the trend, I think, into the future where you tie in the gaming area with uh, a movie or a series release on uh, one of the streaming services. It definitely works well in uh, complementing each other. Have a level of familiarity that people understand. It's like, okay, this is intuitive to use. And it comes back to really the original message that we started this talk with. We want to make sure that the game that you're playing, we're removing the barrier to the entry, we're removing the complexity so that you can enjoy the stuff that w you want to do, enjoy, that you want to go and do. You want to go and do missions. You want to go and you know, get equipment or find rare loot or join up with your friends. And I think a lot of the things when we look at this, where you go from player interaction experience to improve traversal, to improve HUD, uh, star map, Moby is a combination of that with where we want to... That's right, The Last of Us. Um, also, what's his face? Uh, the guy from Spider-Man, wasn't there some show or movie he's in? And you want to have the information at your on your Moby, like, okay, tell me what am I about to? Is my environment outside? Is it breathable? Yeah. Do I need a helmet? Is it hot? Is it cold? You know, you need you, you know, if you look at an Apple Watch, or my wife has an Apple Watch, so she's got a Fitbit, and it's like, okay, this is your heart rate. And yeah, Eduardo, technically the game is released because we're playing it, right? It's not that the game is pre-release, uh, that no one's playing it. We're in there right now. Assassin's Creed, yeah. So, no other question. I think that they've definitely discussed the topic. And uh, like you said, there's mocap studios. They have everything they need to develop an actual series or show. Witcher, yeah, true. Uncharted, yes, thank you, Uncharted. That's it. So, um, look, if Squadron 42 does turn out to be a hit... I don't think it's out of the question. In fact, it would be a smart move for them to do. Injuries or readouts and, you know, inventory and hover trolleys and the physicalized nature of the world. And when you put it all, start putting it all together, which is kind of, we're seeing that glimpse in Squadron 42 because we're able to focus on that experience, not just individual features. You know, we're starting to not just see it, we're, we're playing it. And I think that's what's really exciting to, to look at to show you the, the progress that we're showing here today is that nothing we've talked about is like, oh, we're going to start this in six months. Oh, we're going to do this in two years. Oh, we're going to do this. It's, we, a lot of it we've already done. And we're just we're, we're, we're in the position where we can go in there and play it and understand it and go, OK, let's tweak this, let's tweak this. And let's start building on top of it of systems that we're really you know, confident in technically and from a design point of view so that we can build on top and we've got a very clear idea how they can scale in Star Citizen because we've got the mini environment of Squadron like the test bed of proving it out and I think it's, it's going to be a real benefit to the PU for when we push these features over because also for the developers who are just specifically PU content They've got an example of how to use these how systems, use it, yeah. and I mean, they understand how how you know they other developers have already gone through the mix of putting it into the game, and now they go, cool. There's documentation. Well, I know how to go to. Yeah, it. I mean, I think that's a look. Most of the game is done. They just got to stick it all together, right? Just need to glue it all and make one final piece, and it's good to go. You talked about well. Here's where you're using it in Squadron, and here's how we use these different physical elements to make an interesting uh, game experience. And that means that the PU team that's now going, oh, well, we want to do 10 of those or 100 of those has good examples of how to use it rather than here's a feature, you figure it out. Because, again, that was a lot of things that went in mm. were that. You know, it's like trolleys, as we use yep. an example, or 
um, the mounted guns. mounted guns are just features that didn't really have uh, gameplay or, or use associated with them. So, uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot more going on uh, in, in Squadron than just this, but we thought... Yeah, yeah this be, is just a snapshot. It would be very good to talk about... Yeah, we know they can pull these kind of things together. I mean, remember the, the, the sale promo for the Mercury Star Runner? Oh, what's it, the belligerent duck? What was that, whatever they called it, where you know she's dropping off a prison? Like there's there's enough writers and mocap and skills they have to create a five minute ad for a ship. They can stretch it out to a thirty minute uh, episode of something and just do those. Not impossible. I think it's a great idea. Of a short conversation about Squadron Forty Two and the benefits to the Persistent Universe. Uh, before we let you go and get on to wrapping up our full day of activities. Uh, Chris, any final words you want to share with the Star Citizen community? Final words, going to be three hours. Watch, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Give more coffee. How it'll affect Star Citizen. What do you got? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, I'd, I'd say that uh, it's incredibly challenging trying to have uh, develop two games side by side, also while you're building the tech as well. Um, and it's also incredibly rewarding. I have to say that the feedback, especially on the PU side that we see all the time, really helps uh, inform as developers what we're doing all the time. And so, and it involve, informs what we do on the Squadron 42 side too, in terms of some of the base mechanics, some of the areas that we go, okay, well, you know, we want to work on this thing and improve it. It's all the stuff we've really talked about uh, this time. But, you know, for me, it's an incredible privilege to be building something of the level of ambition that we're doing on both Squadron but also Star Citizen. Because you know, ultimately, I think that Star Citizen itself, in terms of an experience, in terms of how you can seamlessly go from sitting inside your ship, look at your interior here, look at this constellation Phoenix, uh, and walking outside uh, onto a planet and looking at the foliage and the trees and seeing a mountain in the distance and walking over and being able to actually go there rather than it just be a background um, that you can never reach. Uh, the, the, you know, the scope and scale, the sense of being able to go anywhere, do anything, uh, that is something that most game engines and games generally just can't do and, and, and don't do. You know, they're limited to more limited spaces and you know, we utilize, we're utilizing in Squadron to give you a sort of single player experience that sort of feels like you're you know, in a huge play environment and system that you traverse around. I mean, we talked about you know, the various types of quantum travel you're using and all the different, you know, down to the detail mechanics of picking up something off a desk and moving it over and, 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 and being able to build a system that can do that for the detail and fidelity that we're telling a really rich story in Squadron, but also a huge universe that you can exist in as a sandbox for everyone on the player is a complete, I mean, from a developer's standpoint, uh, it's a dream. I mean, it's a dream I've had you know, my whole life. Uh, being able to do it because we're supported by the community out there is a, you know, something I'm always eternally grateful for. And, you know, it's the best job in the Thanks world. for your so money, guys. As much as it can be difficult sometimes, as much as it can be frustrating when you see everyone bitching about something or something's not working or, you know, what kind of idiot did this or which, you know, doesn't this person know how to run a project and all the rest of the stuff. Um, it's still the best job in the world. So um, you've read the feedback. <laughs> well, of course, so we all read the feedback. Oh, everyone, every developer reads everything. But, you know, you need a, you need a thick skin. I mean, at the end of the day, you have a a vision in your in your mind and we're lucky enough to be able to really fulfill that i mean it you know it's a bit of a pandora's box that got opened when we realized we had the level of support to really go all the way because it's a completely different scope of game now than 10 years ago when i got on stage and i was pitching a much more limited you know sort of privateer freelancer online and a you know next generation wing commander uh, what we're building now is a, a completely different experience in terms of a lot more um, just fidelity and scope and possibility and the idea that you can do and be anything in it. And if you can think it or imagine it or see it, you can you can go there, do it, do all those things. That is 
you know, like I said, I, I think there's almost nobody else. Yeah, I know he's talking a lot, but remember, yeah, guys, so many new people have joined over the past year, the past two years. They have not heard a Chris Roberts ramble, so uh, this is new and exciting for them. Uh, let them enjoy it. He only does it once a year, right? we end up doing it but it's it's not because we're just sitting here you know eating bonbons that we are working really hard uh, uh and it's exciting i mean for me i you know i look at things we have in development and how far we've come uh you know how far the game itself even star citizen i mean you know this year there's more people playing it there's more uh you know spending more time in the game than there was last year than the year before i mean we're accelerating i think that's partly a testimony to the game itself over the last few years has become more stable, it's become more performant, there's been more features and content added. So even though we still have a lot of things to go and we talked about a lot of things we want to improve, um, it's more of a, you know, yes, it's rough around the edges, but there is something there that keeps people coming back uh, despite the frustrations, right? And I think it's that sense of you being able to go and do anything and be anything in, in the universe and we're really committed to making that finishing that off and making that a really great experience that's, that's frictionless so you know while it is challenging doing these two games together um, it's also a hell of a lot of fun and I'm you know looking forward uh, you know over the next few years because we got a whole bunch of really cool stuff coming down the, the pike uh, uh, beyond what we already have here uh, that yeah, you know, it's, it's it's a good time to be making games. It is, it is a lot of fun. And now it, it's it's I think I think video games. Ladies and gentlemen, the moment you've been waiting for. Because Chris Roberts with another talk. It's, it's like it's job, it's like pain and whatever. But but no, video games are, are are fun. They're creative. They're they're expansive. They they they're collaborative. Uh, they're definitely iterative. Um, uh, it's and there's nothing else like it. No, no, no other industry in the world would would have a weekly behind the scenes, a documentary series that I now get to do from a spaceship landed on yeah. one of Pyro's planets. <laughs> uh, Rich, you want to try to follow that? So the only one thing I would say is that even though we are focused on Squadron Forty Two, we still read all of the feedback in you know in Spectrum online, the comments or Reddit. So a lot of that. They read the comments on Reddit. <laughs> Everyone knows, don't read the comments, man. We're starting to execute on that feedback with some of the systems that are not as forefront in people's minds, such as like the interaction system and how you interface with the game and controls and the action queuing and traversal. And I think the biggest takeaway for me when, I, when we start to look at all these features is that it's, don't think of it as feature, feature, feature. It's, we're making the game. The biggest thing is that we're starting to put that game together and we can sit down and play it. And while Star Citizen, you know, there already is a game there, uh, this is about, you know, making what's there even better and, and making sure that all the things that new players and existing players have had frustrations with, that we're smoothing, those, uh, smoothing them over and removing the friction. And so, and then about injecting that new features on top that's going to just enhance it even further. So. I think it's, you know, in the next few years, it's going to be a really exciting times. As Chris said, there's lots of things in the pipe. And I think some of the things that come online will be real game changers to not necessarily what you do, because that's going to be delivered by the content and the features and ships, but how you do it and how you interface with the game. And I think that's going to be a huge improvement. And I think that will, you know, I think if you're a developer, it's something that's really important because you've got to make sure that your game is... If they're not talking about that aspect of the game, then you've done it right. And I think that's where we are. We're getting close, on, on at least on Squadron 42, so that we can then map that over to the And then, of course, the only thing I want to add is that everything you've seen here today is work in progress. Uh, we've here we go. moved some of the locations and, and aspects where you would see. Here we go, guys. The big Squadron 42 reveal. Uh, but all this stuff is coming to the Persistent Universe at one point. Uh, the stuff we've been able to show you, the stuff we haven't been able to show you, 
uh, today. And if you were surprised by the skills part in particular, like we just kind of snuck that in there before the Moby Glass, rest assured we will be following up on the skills conversation uh, with visuals and a more in-depth discussion of how that'll work and how you'll interact with that and stuff as we get closer to being able to do so. So uh, if you've already gone to Spectrum or Reddit or your YouTube thumbnail and added little red laser eyes to Richard Tyrer, oh, that last part's OK, but everything else, we just ask that you hang tight and, and, and give us the benefit of the doubt. It's a, it, uh, it'll be fine. So yeah, so thank you, Chris. Thank you, Rich, for taking the time to uh, talk a little bit of Squadron 42 with us and how it'll affect the PU. Uh, we are just about to wrap up our entire Citizen Con day here. Uh, but before we do, I want to throw it back to a video that we opened today's show with. Uh, it was a bunch of our developers and staff at our five studios around the world uh, talking about their favorite things of the Star Citizen community. So we'd like to play that for you one more time. And when we come back, We'll uh, put this whole baby to bed. So take a look. Tell you what my favorite thing about the community is. What am I gonna say? <laughs> it's gonna sound cliche, but they believe as much as we do. I love them because they continue to support us. You're all awesome. Everyone who's watching this is amazing. Uh, you guys are what make this possible. The support we get from you and your ongoing comments. I love that everyone loves what we do and uh, you're all the best. You're the greatest. It's the best community I've ever been a part of. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity I've received you, the most wonderful, and yeah. <laughs> when I first did the uh, Citizen Con where I got to fly the Carrick, everyone was so supportive. And the cheers I got when we were flying through that wormhole was unbelievable. Their effort they put into, like their creativity. Such as building a simulator inside of an entire RV or... Machinimas. I love watching them on my lunch break. I enjoy watching the videos and the content. There was one recently on Twitter where it was like the 100 players entering the atmosphere that just looked really grand. I love all the memes. Some of the incredible fan art and passionate drive that you see come out of them is fantastic. How they come up with crazy ideas each and every day and surprise me. I really like all the crazy shenanigans they get up to in the PU. I can't cuss, can I? The new and exciting ways they find to break shit. <laughs> Just the random stuff that you do, it's not like like the gameplay we intend. People doing crazy stunts in, in their ships. I'm from the character team. That's why I think it's cool when they show off all the ships, because that's really the only time I get to see them. They create the, the community by themselves, and that's really, really cool. My favorite thing about the community, community around events. Going to Bar Citizen. It's always fun to meet some of the backers. They've all been lovely to me in person. Even if they're like really frustrated, you can tell it's just, they have so much love for it. I really like when the community is very detail oriented yeah. about it. They'll do this for the whole company. <laughs> That's right. About our progress. How much inspiration we get from them, from their ideas. I love the genuine enthusiasm. The quick turnaround on feedback, I love that. And how they're always interested in what's coming up. I especially appreciate the people who are able to keep track of dates. They, you know, call us out. It really um, impacts uh, our decision-making process for, uh, you know, what, what did we do right? What did we do wrong? It is the most rewarding thing in, in the entire development process. We're not making the game alone. We're making it with the community. Still keep facing us. They really do make all this possible. I'm living the dream. We all are. My favorite thing about the community, it'd be impossible for me to narrow it down to one. Um, and if, if somebody said you had to, I... Yeah, this is it, guys. This was the big uh, reveal. So I hope you enjoyed that. And thank you for joining me in the... Oh, wait. And the community is at the heart of everything that Star Citizen is. So we've got one final uh, addition before we wrap Is that viewership up. correct? 21,000 viewers? That's low. When. That's very low. 2015, 2016, I, I, I thought I had it, but i realizing I don't remember. Uh, it's needed some, some love, some TLC, uh, some extra handling for some time. And finally, we're about to roll out Community Hub 2.0. Uh, so I'll throw it to Tyler and our friends at Turbulent to tell you more. Hi everyone, my name is Tyler Witkin and I'm the director of community at Cloud Imperium Games. Each and every day we're taken aback by the tremendous amount of creative community content coming from all of you. Mm -hmm. From a small 3D printed MSR that fits in the palm of your hand, 
to a full-size replica sand castle of a 300i. No joke, someone actually did that. In fact, maybe they can pop it up right here. Wow. On the community side, we've always felt that if our developers were going to push the boundaries of what's possible with technology, that we needed to match that level of ambition with the engagement and tools that we provide to help the community thrive. With the incredible amount of creative content flowing from our community, it was a no-brainer that we needed to find a better way to support that. So, we've teamed up with our good friends at Turbulent to completely rebuild the community hub, and we're very excited to show it to you today. Okay. The team has been hard at work and focused on building out a completely new platform that will make both sharing and browsing content easier than ever before. To build this community hub, we really try to keep the Star Citizen identity, see what was good for the community and what they would like. This is where um, most people will go when they, uh, when they want to uh, search for new content or uh, discover new people who play Star Citizen and make posts in the community hub. Have I been ignoring the community hub? But I don't think I've spent too much time there. Am I missing a lot? Any of you guys spend a lot of time in the community hub? To keep talking and creating hmm. about yeah, Eduardo, feel free to chat, that's fine. With each other. Now, I know I'm a little biased, but for these reasons and for many others, I believe that the Star Citizen community is the best and the Direct to Gunner, Seth. <laughs> They're always in that shot. They use that picture everywhere. Drop an 07 in chat. Go ahead. By the way, this bit is pre-recorded, so I'm going to assume that you are spamming chat like crazy right now. Thank you. Don't let me down. When creating a new post, you'll be able to choose between... So, chat, how much time do you spend in so this section? An audio, a video, I, mean, I don't an submit my stuff post. to there. Should it's I be like sending my stuff to that to section too? put a title and a description in there. But also to pick and choose from a variety of different categories your post relates to. And that comes in play into the Discover page. On the Discover page, mm. you can browse over all the content you can also I mean uh, I think reference. that's for fine example, see only video for content creators I mean if you have a TikTok or an Insta or YouTube and I can also sort them by popularity or by date when you first arrive on the community hub you arrive on the home page which features uh top but I gotta give us another look because I I've hardly used uh, this in the past from people you follow because yes you can now follow people on the new community hub you have uh, a live stream section, which you can see the top players uh, who play Star Citizen right now. You have a tutorial section also on the front page, and there's also the sidebar. And it's not just all about screenshots, videos, and crafts. It's also about the human connection we make with like-minded spacefarers that we've met along the way. Hey! <laughs> that was me! For me, I've made countless hey, now I'm famous. With so many people that I otherwise <laughs> never would have met outside of this community. And many of those connections I know I will cherish and carry with me for the rest of my life. And I'm confident that many of you have similar stories, which is exactly why it was vital to us to find better ways to keep you all connected with one another. The Community Hub is a place of uh, creativity and exchange between all the Star Citizen players. The team has put a lot of work in it. We're working on it since quite a long time. Yeah, really you know what? I, I will go check out this new Spectrum area now. The community will enjoy as much as us. So you can head over to our website, dive in, check out all the new features, break the new features. It's okay. It's part of the process. And as always, we want to hear your thoughts. So make sure to head over to our dedicated feedback thread on Spectrum and let us know what you think. And this is just the beginning. We've got so many cool things planned for the months ahead, such as site-wide notifications, a massive shared content calendar where you can sort between official CIG events and community-created and organized events, and so much more. And the best part about the new community hub, it's live right now. Woo! So I don't think most people care about that, but any kind of uh, mistaken, uh, that new version of the community content creator that is putting stuff out, I mean, you want your stuff seen, so uh, they appreciate that kind of stuff. I don't know what time my watch is saying. It says it's like 12.30 in the morning. Mm. Uh, one last thing before we let you go, because we got more endings than a Lord of the Rings movie. Uh, Atmo Esports is running our 10th anniversary racing event, uh, the, the, the new Babbage Bash, or the Babbage Bash, or something like that. Uh, that's immediately following this stream. Uh, we got a short video just telling you a little bit about who they are and what they do. So let's, let's uh, throw it to Atmo.
Atmo Esports operates a little differently. Born from emergent community events like the Demo Rally, the natural progression was to create esports events within an emergent environment and provide tournaments for esports teams in a unique way. All right, here we go. Every step you can count on me, on me. Every step you can follow me. Wow! Oh, baby, look at this race starting, guys. Let's go. Atmo volunteers create events within massive sandbox gaming environments. And we work with talented community gamers to supply supporting roles such as camera crew, shoutcasters, event organizers, and so much more. Our team is a group of passionate professionals from all over the world, all with gaming in their veins. We operate purely online, and everything we do is created collaboratively. It's gonna be, it's gonna change the way we play the game. Five, four, three, two, one. Go! And well, that's it. Another CitizenCon in the bag. Uh, the debut of our new uh, home for our evergreen recurring uh, weekly video content for the foreseeable future. Uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, there's a ton of information that I'm sure is going to feed our, 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 our content creators in the community for months and months to come. Uh, but the last word on things shouldn't come from me. Let's throw it over uh, to, to the peanut gallery, to the, our, our steam group of, 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 of guests and visitors. Uh, Chris, oh, I should, hold on, let me get in here. There we go. Get in here, get in here. Hey, uh, what do you want to say? Uh, I think I've said quite a lot already. I don't really need to see that. No, much. no, no don't ask him again. Uh, <laughs> He'll get going. <laughs> well, let me start with back in 2012. Um, <laughs> no, I, all I'm going to say is that we wouldn't be here without all of you out there that have supported us over these years and believed in the project and the world and the universe. No, we're going to talking <laughs> again. Peace, everyone from the community out here really appreciates. This all began when I had a dream. <laughs> also from our side into the project. So we really appreciate that. Uh, you know, this year's Citizen Con didn't quite have the big flashy demos that we've had in the past, but that's mostly because we've got a huge amount of people heads down uh, working on getting persistent and streaming out and 318, which hopefully we're gonna go to Evercati this coming week, right, Aaron, we think, maybe? We're absolutely working yep. on it. All right, so we'll see Guillaume over here. He's not Mike, so he can't really say much, but um, he's uh, our director of development on the Star Citizen Live. Um, and uh, so we're working hard on that for this year, and uh, there's, there's a, that's going to be a massive patch with a lot of really cool features and gameplay in it. And uh, of course, we're working very hard on Squadron 2. Uh, but uh, it's been a great time. It's been an amazing ride so far. I'm looking forward to the future. See, you did get someone to be twinsies with you. Yes. There you go. Uh, and thank you very much. Happy birthday, Star Citizen. Happy birthday, the community. Happy birthday, Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Star yeah. Citizen. Cheers. Cheers. Right. Let's throw it to Atmo. Bye, everybody. Goodbye. What? See you next year. Bye, everyone. Bye. Cheers. What? No Squadron 42? Don't tell me that was it. <laughs> okay. Well. You know, I, I guess they're saving it for some other release then. Uh, so to recap, look, I think the skills, the special skill thing is interesting. Uh, the flight combat speeds, the new quantum travel stuff, that's good. Uh, overall, nothing new, groundbreaking. Um, the ship, the spirit ship sale coming in under what we thought, 100 bucks. I think 400 bucks is one of the best looking $100 ships in the game right now. And overall... Uh, I think this was one of the lowest watched season cons they've had. I think there are 20,000 people watching on Twitch, which is low. Uh, but as I said before in my soliloquy, there's less and less they have to show until that's new. There's less and less new stuff. As the game develops, there's less new things. There's no new biomes to see, maybe the lava one. Uh, and so we can't expect every season con to be mind blowing. But uh, disappointing in that I was expecting Squadron 42. So yet again, no Squadron 42 mentioned 
Uh, makes you wonder what that leaked footage was then, unless there's some kind of Squadron 2 special reveal coming later on. Uh, other than that, uh, look, I came in with no expectations of what to see here, other than maybe some more Squadron 42 stuff. In that sense, I'm disappointed we're not seeing any more Squadron 42. Uh, but uh, I think maybe they're saving it for a special Christmas time or some other event later in the year. And uh, with that, ladies and gents, thank you very much for joining me in chat. I appreciate it. Hope you like the live stream. If you enjoy this kind of content, uh, think of uh, subscribing below. Uh, your comments appreciated. Thumbs up this video. Uh, and uh, I know I've been taking a bit of a break from the content recently. I've just, uh, you, think you pull back for a while and you come back fresh. And so I am fresh now. As far as at Noah, they've done an awesome job. I'm uh, Glad to see them succeeding there. It's basically free coverage and free marketing for Star Citizen itself. So Atmo is in a great spot. And obviously the black and yellow color scheme is perfect. <laughs> but with that, guys, thanks a lot for joining me. Uh, I'm going to head over to the Discord and discuss this with the rest of the testees and see what their thoughts are and everything. Feel free to join. And uh, signing off. Catch you later. That I'll stop.